UEP Newton Revolutionary Suicide Read by Dessaline Penguin Classics Introduction UEP Newton was born in Monroe, Louisiana, on February 17, 1942, to Walter and Armelia Newton. He is the co-founder of the revolutionary Marxist-Leninist organization, the Black Panther Party, and was the party's ranking leader and chief ideologue and strategist. In 1966, Newton enrolled in Merritt College in Oakland, where he became a member of the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity, led the effort to establish the first black history course, and met Bobby Seale. In October 1966, Newton and Seal founded what was then known as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. The party urged members to challenge the status quo with armed patrols of the impoverished streets of Black Oakland and to form coalitions with organizations representing other oppressed groups. Internationally, Newton directed the party to form coalitions with the Vietnamese, Chinese, and Cubans, as with, among others, African National Liberation Organizations like Frelimo in Mozambique, ZANU in Zimbabwe, and the ANC in South Africa. Within one year of the party's founding, in October 1967, Newton was wounded and arrested by Oakland police and charged with the murder of a police officer, spawning the worldwide protest that came to be known as the Free Huey Movement. Convicted of manslaughter, Newton was released in July 1970 for a new trial. He would be tried on this charge several times thereafter, but never convicted. Upon his release, he led the party's more than 40 chapters to build up its community service programs, called survival programs, offering under the slogan, Survival Pending Revolution. From the outset, the party was a target for elimination by the U.S. government under the FBI's famous COINTELPRO program, counterintelligence, which openly stated that its agenda was to disrupt or destroy the party. By 1981, the party had been driven into its demise. In the aftermath, Newton earned a Ph.D. from the University of California, Santa Cruz, publishing his dissertation, War Against the Panthers, a study of repression in the United States. Prior to that, Newton had authored Revolutionary Suicide and To Die for the People, in addition to numerous other treatises and articles, and was the co-author with psychoanalyst Eric Erickson of the book In Search of Common Ground. On August 22, 1989, Newton was tragically shot to death on the blighted streets of West Oakland, leaving behind his widow, Frederica Newton. Frederica Newton was raised in Berkeley, California, by her mother, Arlene Slaughter. She attended Wesleyan University, where she earned her B.A. Prior to that, in 1969, as a young teenager, Mrs. Newton joined the Black Panther Party, and in 1970, she met Huey P. Newton. In 1984, after the demise of the party, they married. In the wake of Huey P. Newton's death in 1989, Frederica Newton, along with former Black Panther leader David Hillard, established the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation, a nonprofit educational corporation. She continues to serve as the Foundation's president and oversees its archive, materials, publications, and other activities, including a number of community-based programs. End of section. Huey P. Newton, Revolutionary Suicide. Forward. For my mother and father, who have given me strength and made me unafraid of death 
and therefore unafraid of life. Huey P. Newton, Revolutionary Suicide. Dedication. For my mother and father, who have given me strength and made me unafraid of death, and therefore unafraid of life. Introduction by Frederica Newton. It has been 20 years since my late husband, Huey P. Newton, was shot and killed on the same streets of Oakland, California, that had witnessed his dramatic ascent as leader of the Black Panther Party two decades earlier. From 1966, when the party was founded, to its demise around 1980, Huey stood at the vanguard of the Black Liberation Movement. For most people then and now, his legendary role is best personified in a photograph taken at the behest of Eldridge Cleaver, who sought to make a militant public statement about the party and its leader. In the picture, Huey is suited in a tall wicker chair and looking defiantly at the camera, a rifle held in his right hand and a spear in his left. Eldritch's intended message was a symbolic bridging of the spear and the gun, or put another way, the transference of the cultural nationalism of the past to a revolutionary culture in the future. This volatile image resonated deeply in an era marked by scores of riots and rebellions in black communities across the country. Later, when the photograph photograph appeared on the cover of Revolutionary Suicide, the image of Huey as the intrepid African-American freedom fighter was further cemented in the public's consciousness. As with all controversial figures, however, there were complicated and unseen dimensions beneath the famous public persona, which his autobiography makes abundantly clear. When Revolutionary Suicide was first published in 1973, readers were offered a rare glimpse into the private life of the party's founder. Not that people hadn't been reading and hearing all about Huey for years. He started making local headlines when he and Bobby Seale launched the Black Panther Party in Oakland. Their armed self-defense patrols of the police caused an immediate stir in the press. So much so that a conservative state assemblyman introduced legislation the following year that proposed outlawing the party's constitutional right to bear arms. One can imagine the alarm felt in Sacramento when a caravan of Black Panthers with rifles appeared on the steps of the state capitol to protest the Panther Bill. As with the police patrols, this demonstration was performed in full accordance with the law. Huey was a dedicated student of the California Penal Code and made certain the party's actions were legal. People today often don't realize that walking down the street with a rifle was within the laws of the time. White racist militia groups, like the Minutemen and the John Birch Society, for example, had in fact been driving through our communities with guns displayed for some time. Although these groups were better armed than the Black Panthers, the ruling establishment did not perceive whites with guns to be a threat to their interests, and no attempt was made to curtail their activities. Once the Panther Bill was finally passed in the spring of 1967, Huey brought an end to the open display of firearms. Nevertheless, guns would continue to be closely associated with him whether he chose them to be or not. This association reached new heights that fall when Huey was charged with shooting and killing an Oakland police officer. He had been stopped in his car early one morning while looking for parking. Most local officers knew Huey by sight, making police harassment a routine procedure for him. Without asking for identification, 
the officer identified Huey by name, going so far as to ridicule him as the great, great Huey P. Newton. He then ordered Huey from the car and proceeded to knock him to the ground with an unexpected blow to the face. Shots were fired and the officer dropped over dead. Huey maintained that he was innocent, insisting that an unknown gunman had fired the shots. To the city's fathers, this was an open and shut case of murder. The most famous American black revolutionary since Malcolm X had acted out his rage against the police. For the black masses and the white new left, however, the charge became a cause celebre. The movement to free Huey coalesced overnight with hundreds of supporters taking to the streets to protest his innocence. Meanwhile, journalists from around the United States and abroad descended on Oakland to report on the sensational trial, providing the Black Panthers for the first time with not only a national, but also an international stage. Millions of people who had been fed the establishment's slander against the party since its inception were now given the opportunity to meet its well-spoken leader and listen to its platform laid out by him. This exposure led to a rapid period of growth for the Black Panthers over the next two years. So much so, that when Huey was acquitted and released from prison in 1971, he barely recognized the party or its members. What once had been a local phenomenon of a dozen comrades, now counted more than 40 chapters throughout the United States, as well as those in Australia, Polynesia, England, India, Israel, and Algeria, where our international section was headquartered. Huey left prison a major celebrity, which was an identity he did not want or welcome. He understood that leaders of social protest movements had frequently been turned into celebrities by the media, and the effectiveness of these individuals was to, to lead was destroyed in the process. Besides, genuine social change didn't come from celebrities, Huey argued, but from the people themselves. He never lost sight of the fact that only the masses had the ability to transform society. And the party's slogan, All Power to the People, was a potent testament to this belief. Still, he couldn't fully escape the trappings of his iconic status. In spite of his resistance, Huey personified the Black Liberation Movement at a time when African Americans were in desperate need of leadership. The Civil Rights Movement had wound down with some of its most prominent figureheads murdered and the movement splintered. The Black Panthers stepped into this historic gulf, and their rise marked a transition from civil rights agitation, per se, to a revolutionary cause demanding nothing less and a comprehensive restructuring of American life. Everything from its institutions and laws to its basic economic system. What's more, the party now had the numbers and influence to make demands of their country. Needless to say, the U.S. government was well aware of this turn of events and the counterintelligence efforts that had for years been aimed at monitoring and creating friction among African-American radicals intensified. Huey's celebrity served to further the scrutiny. The FBI, in its own words, sought to, quote, expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of the black nationalists. Never mind that Huey hadn't been a black nationalist since college, nor was the party a black nationalist group. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was determined to prevent the rise of a black messiah by any means necessary. The full extent of the government's surveillance of the party, to the extent that it can ever be known in the full, 
was not revealed until the 1980s, long after Revolutionary Suicide was published. Huey, therefore, does not devote a substantial attention to these activities. For a comprehensive discussion of the government's role in spying on and ultimately assisting in the destruction of the party, readers should consult his final book, War Against the Panthers, A Study of Repression in America. As for his first book, Revolutionary Suicide was published at the peak of Huey's fame. Yet for all the exposure he'd had in the media, the public still knew relatively little about his personal life, especially his childhood and his path to becoming a revolutionary. The courtroom prosecutors had strenuously sought to reduce him to a cop killer, and the press frequently cooperated in these efforts with a decidedly conservative slant in their reporting. Huey's autobiography, therefore, would serve the function Malcolm X's autobiography had a decade before. The book would humanize the icon with highly personal and candid recollections of a troubled past, along with accounts of the crucial birth of political consciousness that would redeem the author and allow him to make his mark on history. Revolutionary Suicide introduced readers to a new and perhaps surprising elements of Huey's past, including such little-known facts as his being raised in a devoutly religious household by a minister father, growing up illiterate until he taught himself to read in order to prove that he was not stupid, as his teachers claimed, and that the Black Panther Party founders were not street hoodlums, but college classmates who turned to a revolutionary platform of armed self-defense after traditional forms of nonviolent protests proved ineffective and disappointing to them. But not everything Huey recalls is admirable, and he was not afraid to confess his participation in activities he later found shameful, like prostituting women and stealing from unlocked cars parked outside hospital emergency rooms. True to Huey's spirit, he took responsibility for his mistakes, as well as his accomplishments. Revolutionary Suicide was also written during a period of important transition in the party. Most notably, Eldridge Cleaver, the Minister of Information, defected from the party in 1971. In spite of his influential leadership role, Eldritch and Huey had an, uneasy had an uneasy relationship from the start. The pair never agreed over what constituted serving the people. To Huey, that meant meeting the needs of the poor and working-class African Americans, while for Eldritch, it was leading the masses in armed rebellion. Eldritch's Revolution Now rhetoric frightened and alienated black communities, who were more concerned about jobs, housing, and a decent education for their children. After his departure from the Black Panthers, they sought to reconnect the people by launching an ambitious series of free services called survival programs. Through donations and volunteer support, the party provided groceries, medical care, and legal counsel, among other essential services, to th tens of thousands of African Americans nationwide. The photographs taken at these public gatherings speak to the excitement of those events. On the other hand, this was also a period of great sadness. A handful of the most respected Black Panther Party leaders were murdered in succession by government agents. Apprentice Bunchy Carter, Fred Hampton, John Huggins, George Jackson, and Bobby Hutton, to whom Huey dedicates revolutionary suicide. Their contributions were enormous, and I can assure you that the loss of any one of these beloved comrades was felt far more profoundly than the loss of Eldridge, 
or that of the small band of former members who followed him in this so-called split. It's fitting that Huey dedicated this book to Bobby Hutton, the first member to join the party after Huey and Bobby Seal, and the first Black Panther to be killed. Bobby was just 17 years old when, after a standoff, police gunned down the unarmed youth as he surrendered. Huey was devastated by the murder, but also clear-eyed enough to understand that a revolutionary is, quote, a doomed man. In other words, every revolutionary fighter, by definition, struggles against the power imbalance of the establishment, and the cost of this struggle is often paid with one's own life. Huey coined the term revolutionary suicide to describe this phenomenon. Not to be confused with what he calls reactionary suicide, wherein a person kills himself in despair and helplessness. Revolutionary suicide is infused with the possibility that one's death will further the revolutionary cause. As Huey explains, quote, It is better to oppose the forces that would drive me to self-murder than to endure them. Although I risk the likelihood of death, there is at least the possibility, if not the probability, of changing intolerable conditions. Revolutionary suicide does not mean that I and my comrades have a death wish. It means just the opposite. We have such a strong desire to live with hope and human dignity that existence without them is impossible. When reactionary forces crush us, we move against these forces, even at the risk of death. End quote. Bobby Hutton died a revolutionary suicide, and the publication of this new edition of Huey's autobiography will help ensure that readers for generations will remember him along with all the other fallen Black Panther Party comrades whose lives must not be forgotten. After revolutionary suicide came out, the party experienced a period of turmoil that lasted until its demise about seven years later. Intensified divisions within the organization were exacerbated by the infiltration of secret government agents who sought to bring down the party from within. False reports of comrades turning traitors led Huey to distrust and expel key party members, including Black Panther chairman and co-founder Bobby Seale. His successor, Chairman Elaine Brown, and Chief of Staff and childhood friend David Hillard, Compounding Huey's government-inspired paranoia was his drug addiction, and his actions under the influence confounded and worried his allies. Huey's personal troubles climaxed in 1974, when he was falsely charged with murdering an Oakland woman. Fearful that he would not receive a fair trial under California's Republican governor, Huey fled to Cuba where he lived in exile until a Democrat was elected governor in 1976. As with his previous murder trial, Huey was once again acquitted. Unlike the previous trial, however, he did not return to the streets a hero. Huey's behavior became more erratic as his addiction worsened, and the party slowly began to unravel. I found it endlessly heartbreaking to witness Huey's downward spiral. I urged him towards recovery repeatedly, but in spite of his valiant attempts, he never wanted a life without drugs more than he wanted the drug. His demons were too strong. In many respects, Huey came to feel that he had lived too long, that he had somehow outlived himself. I first met him at a brunch hosted by my mother in our Berkeley home in 1971. I was 19 years old and, unlike my mother, who was the party's real estate agent, not at all politically active. 
In fact, I was intimidated by the Black Panthers and used to cross the street to avoid walking past their Berkeley office. Although Huey had never met me, I was certain he'd read between the lines and write me off as a bourgeois college girl. Instead, I was surprised to discover him kind and patient with someone so obviously out of her element. He'd been acquitted of murdering the police officer and released from prison the previous summer, so I found the nerve to ask him how it felt to be incarcerated. He explained with great sensitivity that loneliness was the overwhelming emotion. I was so touched by his openness that my fears of Huey dropped away in that moment. No longer the world-famous figure in the wicker chair, here was a man with fears and emotions just like anyone. I immediately felt compassion and protectiveness towards him. He phoned later that day to invite me to his home, and we began our affair that night. I quickly joined the party, first teaching in one of its schools, then as a cadre member working on the Black Panther newspaper at the party's central headquarters. Our relationship, along with my tenure with the Panthers, was short-lived, however. Huey fled to Cuba, and I decided to return to college and complete my studies. When I returned home following graduation in 1976, I ran into Huey at a Santana concert, and we resumed an off-again, on-again relationship that culminated in our marriage in 1984. Although I'd known of or been involved with Huey for years, our decision to marry was sudden. He phoned me from out of the blue to propose, and one week later we were married in Reno. But the haste with which we wed largely characterized our relationship. There was an unspoken, ever-prevailing sense between us that our life together was fleeting. Some of Huey's closest comrades in the party had been gunned down, and the constant presence of an armed bodyguard in our lives was a daily reminder that Huey might meet the same fate. Of course, we attempted to live our lives as if we were an ordinary family, flying kites with my son from a previous marriage and taking him on picnics and to the pumpkin patch for Halloween. But there was no denying the reality that Huey was, and always would be, a threat to the establishment. The government retaliated in a variety of ways. The IRS put a lien against our assets. Our home was raided and ransacked by the police twice. And Huey was charged with, and later acquitted of, the illegal possession of a gun. In the process, we lost our home and became homeless, living with friends and relatives wherever possible. Throughout this ordeal, we nevertheless struggled to maintain some semblance of a happy family life. Much has been written about Huey's final years and the demise of the party. I would encourage anyone interested in these details to read David Hillard's this Side of Glory, and Huey, Spirit of the Panther. These books provide a candid insider's account of Huey's tragic freefall by a lifelong comrade who saved his own life by becoming a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. As it happens, much has also been written about these events by self-proclaimed authorities, primarily journalists and professors who, in order to call attention to their work, stooped portraying Huey and the party in exclusively outlandish terms. J. Edgar Hoover himself could not perform a more thorough assassination of character, and I'm left to wonder what function these politically motivated attacks serve other than to advance the careers of these authors. As president of the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation, the nonprofit organization I helped to establish to remember Huey and the party. I welcome responsible historical reassessments 
and hope that this new edition of Revolutionary Suicide assists in that purpose. Although this book was published more than 25 years ago, it remains the definitive account of Huey's life and Black Panther history. He never got around to writing a sequel, which would have included, among other highlights, the PhD he earned from the University of Santa Cruz, selections from his academic writings along with a comprehensive collection of seminal essays written during his Black Panther tenure, and be found in the Huey P. Newton Reader. Sadly, Huey did not live to see the publication of The Reader or the addition of Revolutionary Suicide into the distinguished Penguin Classics Library. He was murdered in 1989 by a drug dealer who claimed he killed the former Panther leader in order to, quote, get respect and become a shot caller for the gang he belonged to. Still, Huey would have been thrilled to see this new edition of his autobiography. He understood that whether he lived or died, the crucial point was that his work would live on, that the people would carry on the fight in his absence. As Huey tells us, I will fight until I die, however that may come, but whether I'm around or not to see it happen. I know that the transformation of society inevitably will manifest the true meaning of all power to the people. Although this transformation has yet to be realized these many years later, revolutionary suicide reminds us that one intrepid person can help promote the process that brings about revolutionary change. Frederica Newton 2009. End of introduction. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Section. Acknowledgements. For their generous support through good times and bad, which enabled me to complete this book, I am indebted to my brother Melvin Newton, my secretary Gwen V. Fontaine, my good friends and comrades Donald Freed, Bert Schneider, and Dave Horowitz, and my editors Edwin Barber and Ethel Cunningham. There are many others who have given generously of their time and efforts to make this book possible. Many friends of Herman Blake accompanied him on trips to the San California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo during the early phases of the book. Their help with driving during those arduous days made it possible for us to devote all our energies to the book. I am grateful to each one of them, even though it is not possible to list them by name. I also wish to acknowledge the contributions of Diane Martin and Sabra Slaughter for doing some of the early research, Kathy Harris, DeLois Burby, Barbara Lee, Linda Coey, Catherine Hall, and Joanne Steriker for typing manuscripts and paper. Careful proofreading of the book at various stages was done by Donna Healy, Mrs. Bessie Blake, and daughters Audrey, Willis, and Vanessa. Juanita Jackson gave continuous support and encouragement, as well as some of the best gumbo I have ever tasted. Finally, Alex Haley provided valuable advice and encouragement in the early phases of this work. Each one has made an important contribution to this book. End of section. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Section. A Tribute to Lil Bobby. Lil Bobby was the beginning, the very first member of the Black Panther Party. He gave not only his finances, he gave himself. He placed himself in the service of his people and asked nothing in return, not even a needle or a piece of thread. He asked neither security nor high office, but he demanded those things that are the birthright of all men, dignity and freedom. 
He demanded this for himself and his people. Like a bright ray of light moving across the sky, little Bobby came into our lives and showed us the beauty of our people. He was a living example of an infinite love for his people and for freedom. Now he has moved on, and the example he gave will serve as a beacon that lights our way and leads us on in the struggle for life, dignity, and freedom. We salute little Bobby and his freedom for what they have given us. He was the beginning of the party. Let us make sure that his thinking, his desires for his people become a way of life. Yours forever, Huey P. Newton, Minister of Defense, Black Panther Party, April 1968. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. A poem titled Revolutionary Suicide. By having no family, I inherited the family of humanity. By having no possessions, I possessed all. By rejecting the love of one, I received the love of all. By surrendering my life to the revolution, I found eternal life. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. End of section. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Section. A Manifesto. Introductory quote. Let a new earth rise. Let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength full of final clenching be the pulsing of in our spirits and our blood. Let the martial songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. End of quote. By Margaret Walker. For my people. Revolutionary Suicide. The Way of Liberation. For 22 months in the California men's colony at San Luis, San Luis Obispo, after my first trial for the death of patrolman John Frey, I was almost continually in solitary confinement. There, in a four by six cell, except for books and papers relating to my case, I was allowed no reading material. Despite the rigid enforcement of this rule, Inmates sometimes slipped magazines under my door when the guards were not looking. One that reached me was the May 1970 issue of Ebony Magazine. It contained an article written by Lacey Banco, summarizing the work of Dr. Herbert Hendon, who had done a comparative study on suicide among black people in the major American cities. Dr. Hendon found that the suicide rate among black men between the ages of 19 and 35 had doubled in the past 10 to 15 years, surpassing the rate for whites in the same age range. The article had, and still has, a profound effect on me. I have thought long and hard about its implications. The Ebony article brought to mind Durkheim's classic study, Suicide, a book I had read earlier while studying sociology at Oakland City College. To Durkheim, all types of suicide are related to social conditions. He maintains that the primary cause of suicide is not individual temperament, but forces in the social environment. In other words, Suicide is caused primarily by external factors, not internal ones. 
as I thought about the conditions of black people and about Dr. Hendon's study. I began to develop Durkheim's analysis and apply it to the black experience in the United States. This eventually led to the concept of revolutionary suicide. To understand revolutionary suicide, it is first necessary to have an idea of reactionary suicide, for the two are very different. Dr. Hendon was describing reactionary suicide, the reaction of a man who takes his own life in response to social conditions that overwhelm him and condemn him to helplessness. The young black men in his study had been deprived of human dignity crushed by oppressive forces, and denied their right to live as proud and free human beings. A section in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment provides a good analogy. One of the characters, Marmeladov, a very poor man, argues that poverty is not a vice. In poverty, he says, a man can attain the innate nobility of the soul that is not possible in beggary. For while society may drive the poor man out with a stick, the beggar will be swept out with a broom. Why? Because the beggar is totally demeaned, his dignity lost. Finally, bereft of self-respect, immobilized by fear and despair, he sinks into self-murder. This is reactionary suicide. Connected to reactionary suicide, although even more painful and degrading, is a spiritual death that has been the experience of millions of black people in the United States. This death is found everywhere today in the black community. Its victims have ceased to fight the forms of oppression that drink their blood. The common attitude has long been, what's the use? If a man rises up against a power as great as the United States, he will not survive. Believing this, many blacks have been driven to a death of the spirit rather than of the flesh, lapsing into lives of quiet desperation. Yet all the while, in the heart of every black, there is the hope that life will somehow change in the future. I do not think that life will change for the better without an assault on the establishment, which goes on exploiting the wretched of the earth. Footnote for establishment. The power structure based on the economic infrastructure, propped up and reinforced by the media and all the secondary educational and cultural institutions. This belief lies at the heart of the concept of revolutionary suicide. Thus, it is better to oppose the forces that would drive me to self-murder than to endure them. Although I risk the likelihood of death, there is at least the possibility, if not the probability, of changing intolerable conditions. This possibility is important because much in human existence is based upon hope, without any real understanding of the odds. Indeed, we are all, black and white alike, ill in the same way, mortally ill. But before we die, how shall we live? I say, with hope and dignity. And if premature death is the result, that death has a meaning reactionary suicide can never have. It is the price of self-respect. Revolutionary suicide does not mean that I and my comrades have a death wish. It means just the opposite. We have such a strong desire to live with hope and human dignity that existence without them is impossible. When reactionary forces crush us, we must move against these forces, even at the risk of death. We will have to be driven out with a stick. 
Che Guevara said that to a revolutionary, death is the reality and victory the dream. Because the revolutionary lives so dangerously, his survival is a miracle. Bakunin, who spoke for the most militant wing of the First International, made a similar statement in his Revolutionary Catechism. To him, the first lesson a revolutionary must learn is that he is a doomed man. Unless he understands this, he does not grasp the essential meaning of his life. When Fidel Castro and his small band were in Mexico preparing for the Cuban Revolution, many of the comrades had little understanding of Bakunin's rule. A few hours before they set sail, Fidel went from man to man, asking who should be notified in case of death. Only then did the deadly seriousness of the revolution hit home. Their struggle was no longer romantic. The scene had been exciting and animated, but when the simple, overwhelming question of death arose, everyone fell silent. Many so-called revolutionaries in this country, black and white, are not prepared to accept this reality. The Black Panthers are not suicidal, neither do we romanticize the consequences of revolution in our lifetime. Other so-called revolutionaries cling to an illusion that they might have their revolution and die of old age. That cannot be. I do not expect to live through our revolution, and most serious comrades probably share my realism. Therefore, the expression, revolution in our lifetime, means something different to me than it does to other people who use it. I think the revolution will grow in my lifetime, but I do not expect to enjoy its fruits. That would be a contradiction. The reality will be grimmer. I have no doubt that the revolution will triumph. The people of the world will prevail, seize power, seize the means of production, wipe out racism, capitalism, reactionary intercommunalism, reactionary suicide. The people will win a new world. Yet when I think of individuals in the revolution, I cannot predict their survival. Revolutionaries must accept this fact especially the black revolutionaries in America, whose lives are in constant danger from the evils of a colonial society. Considering how we must live, it is not hard to accept the concept of revolutionary suicide. In this, we are different from white radicals. They are not faced with genocide. The greater, more immediate problem is the survival of the entire world. If the world does not change, all its people will be threatened by the greed, exploitation, and violence of the power structure in the American empire. The handwriting is on the wall. The United States is jeopardizing its own existence and the existence of all humanity. If Americans knew the disasters that lay ahead, they would transform this society tomorrow for their own preservation. The Black Panther Party is in the vanguard of the revolution that seeks to relieve this country of its crushing burden of guilt. We are determined to establish true equality in the means of creative work. Some see our struggle as a symbol of the trend towards suicide among blacks. Scholars and academics in particular have been quick to make this accusation. They fail to perceive differences. Jumping off a bridge is not the same as moving to wipe out the overwhelming force of an oppressive army. When scholars call our actions suicidal, 
they should be logically consistent and describe all historical revolutionary movements in the same way. Thus the American colonists, the French of the late 18th century, the Russians of 1917, the Jews of Warsaw, the Cubans, the NLF, the North Vietnamese, any people who struggle against a brutal and powerful force are suicidal. Also, if the Black Panthers symbolize the suicidal trend among blacks, then the whole third world is suicidal because the third world fully intends to resist and overcome the ruling class of the United States. If scholars wish to carry their analysis further, they must come to terms with that four-fifths of the world which is bent on wiping out the power of the empire. In those terms, the third world would be transformed from suicidal to homicidal, although homicidal is the unlawful taking of life and the third world is involved only in defense. Is the coin then turned? Is the government of the United States suicidal? I think so. With this redefinition, the term revolutionary suicide is not as simplistic as it might seem initially. In coining the phrase, I took two knowns and combine them to make an unknown, a neoteric phrase in which the word revolutionary transforms the word suicide into an idea that has a different meaning and dimensions, applicable to a new and complex situation. My prison experience is a good example of revolutionary suicide in action, for prison is a microcosm of the outside world. From the beginning of my sentence, I defied the authorities by refusing to cooperate. As a result, I was confined to lockup, a solitary cell. As the months passed and I remained steadfast, they came to regard my behavior as suicidal. I was told that I would crack and break under the strain. I did not break, nor did I retreat from my position. I grew strong. If I had submitted to their exploitation and done their will, it would have killed my spirit and condemned me to a living death. To cooperate in prison meant reactionary suicide to me. While solitary confinement can be physically and mentally destructive, my actions were taken with an understanding of the risk. I had to suffer through a certain situation. By doing so, my resistance told them that I rejected all they stood for. Even though my struggle might have harmed my health, even killed me, I looked upon it as a way of raising the consciousness of the other inmates, as a contribution to the ongoing revolution. Only resistance can destroy the pressures that cause reactionary suicide. The concept of revolutionary suicide is not defeatist or fatalistic. On the contrary, it conveys an awareness of the reality in combination with the possibility of hope. Reality, because the revolutionary must always be prepared to face death, and hope, because it symbolizes a resolute determination to bring about change. Above all, it demands that the revolutionary see his death and his life as one piece. Chairman Mao says that death comes to all of us, but it varies in its significance. To die for the reactionary is lighter than a feather. To die for the revolution is heavier than Mount Tai. End of section. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Part 1 During those long years in the Oakland public schools, I did not have one teacher who taught me anything relevant to my own life or experience. Chapter 1 Beginning of Quote 
Many migrants like us were driven and pursued, in the manner of characters in a Greek play, down the paths of defeat. But luck must have been with us, for we somehow survived. End quote. Richard Wright, Preface to Black Metropolis. Section. Starting out. Life does not always begin at birth. My life was forged in the lives of my parents before I was born, and even earlier in the history of all black people. It is all of a piece. I have little knowledge of my grandparents or those who went before. Racism destroyed my family history. My father's father was a white rapist. Both my parents were born in the Deep South, my father in Alabama, my mother in Louisiana. In the mid-30s, their families migrated to Arkansas, where my parents met and married. They were very young, in their mid-teens, some said too young to marry. But my father, Walter Newton, is a very good talker, and when he decided he wanted Armelia Johnson for his bride, she found him hard to resist. He was always known to be charming. Even today, I love to see his eyes light up with that special glow when he gets ready to work his magic. They were married in Parkdale, Arkansas, and lived there for seven years before moving to Louisiana to take advantage of better employment prospects. My father was not typical of Southern black men in the 30s and 40s. Because of his strong belief in the family, my mother never worked at an outside job, despite seven children and considerable economic hardship. Walter Newton is rightly proud of his role as the family protector. To this day, my mother has never left her home to earn money. My father believed in work. He worked constantly, in a variety of jobs, usually holding several at one time to provide for us. During those years in Louisiana, he worked in a gravel pit, a carbon plant, in sugar cane mills, and sawmills. He eventually became a railroad brakeman for the Union Sawmill Company. This pattern did not change when we moved to Oakland. As a youngster, I well remember my father leaving one job in the afternoon, coming home for a while, then going to the other. In spite of this, he always found time for his family. It was always high-quality time when he was home. In addition, my father was a minister. He pastored the Bethel Baptist Church in Monroe, Louisiana, and later assisted in several of the Oakland churches. His preaching was powerful, if a little unusual. The Reverend Newton planned his sermons in advance and announced the topic a week early, but he never seemed able to preach the sermon he had chosen. Eventually, he adopted the practice of stepping right into the pulpit and letting the Spirit move him to deliver whatever message was appropriate. As a child, I swelled up proud to see him up there leading church services, moving the congregation with his messages. All of us shared the dignity and respect he commanded. Walter Newton is not a particularly tall man, but when he stepped into that pulpit, he was the biggest man in the world to me. My mother likes to say that she married young and finished growing up with her children. And this is true. Only 17 years separate her from Lee Edward, the oldest child in the family. When my older brothers and sisters were growing up in Louisiana, mother was one of their best playmates. She played ball, jack rocks, and hide-and-go-seek. Sometimes my father joined in, rolling tires and shooting marbles and keeping the rules straight. This sense of family fun and participation has helped to keep us close. My parents are more than the word usually implies. They are also our friends and companions. 
My mother's sense of humor affected all of us. It was pervasive, an attitude toward life that led us to insight, affection, humor, and understanding with each other. She helped us to see the light side in even the most difficult situations. This lightness and balance have carried me through some difficult days. Often, when others expect to find me depressed by difficult circumstances, and especially by the extreme condition of prison, they see that I look at things in another way. Not that I am happy with the suffering. I simply refuse to be defeated by it. I was born in Monroe, Louisiana, on February 17, 1942, the last of seven children. Like other black people of that time and place, I was born at home. They tell me that my mother was quite sick while she carried me, but mother says only that I was a fine and pretty baby. My brothers and sisters must have agreed because they often teased me when I was young, telling me I was too pretty to be a boy that I should have been a girl. This baby-faced appearance dogged me for a long time, and it was one of the reasons I fought so often in school. I looked younger than I actually was, and soft, which encouraged schoolmates to test me. I had to show them. When I went to jail in 1968, I still had the baby face. Until then, I rarely shaved. My parents named me after Huey Pierce Long, the former governor of Louisiana, assassinated seven years before I came along. Even though he could not vote, my father had a keen interest in politics and followed the campaigns carefully. Governor Long had impressed him by his ability to talk one philosophy while carrying out programs that moved Louisiana in exactly the opposite direction. My father says he was up front, quote, looking right into his mouth, when Huey P. Long made a speech about how black men in the hospitals, out of their minds and half naked, had to be cared for by white nurses. This was, of course, unacceptable to southern whites, and therefore a number of black nurses were recruited to work in Louisiana hospitals. This was a major breakthrough in employment opportunities for black professionals. Huey Long will use this tactic to bring other beneficial programs to blacks. Free books in the schools, free commodities for the poor, public roads and bridge construction projects that gave blacks employment. While most whites were blinded by Long's outwardly racist philosophy, many blacks found their lives significantly improved. My father believed that Huey P. Long had been a great man, and he wanted to name a son after him. In our family, there was a tradition that each older child had particular responsibility for a younger one, looking after him at play, feeding him, talking him to school, taking him to school. This was called giving the newborn to an older brother or sister. The older child had the privilege of first taking the new baby outdoors. I was given to my brother, Walter Jr. A few days after I was born, he took me outside, hauled me up onto the back of a horse, and circled the house while the rest of the family followed. This ritual is undoubtedly a surviving Africanism from the old matriarchal communal tradition. I do not remember that or anything else of our life in Louisiana. Everything I know about that time I learned from the family. In 1945, we followed my father to Oakland when he came west to look for work in the wartime industries. I was three years old. The great exodus of poor people out of the South during World War II sprang from the hope for a better life in the, in the big cities of the North and West. 
in search of freedom, they left behind centuries of southern cruelty and repression. The futility of that search is now history. The black communities of Bedford Stuyvesant, Newark, Brownsville, Watts, Detroit, and many others stand as testament that racism is as oppressive in the North as it is in the South. Oakland is no different. The Chamber of Commerce boasts about Oakland's busy seaport, its museum, professional baseball and football teams, and the beautiful sports coliseum. The politicians speak of an efficient city government and the well-administered poverty program. The poor know better, and they will tell you a different story. Oakland has one of the highest unemployment rates in the country, and for the black population, it is even higher. This was not always the case. After World War I, there was a hectic period of industrial expansion, and again during World War II, when government recruiters went into the South and encourages thousands of blacks to come to Oakland to work in the shipyards and wartime industries. They came and stayed after the war, although there were few jobs and they were no longer wanted. Because of the lack of employment opportunities in Oakland today, the number of families on welfare is the second highest in California, even though the city is the fifth largest in the state. The police department has a long history of brutality and hatred of blacks. Twenty-five years ago, official crime became so bad that the California State Legislature investigated the Oakland force and found corruption so pervasive that the police chief was forced to resign and one policeman was tried and sentenced to jail. The Oakland system has not changed since then. Police brutality continues and corruption persists. Not everyone in Oakland will admit this, particularly the power structure and the privileged white middle class. But then, none of them actually lives in Oakland. Oakland spreads from the northern border of Berkeley, dominated by the University of California with its liberal to radical lifestyle, south to the port of Oakland and Jack London Square, a complex of mediocre motels, novelty shops, and restaurants with second-rate food. To the west, eight miles across the bay, spanned by the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, is a metropolitan San Francisco. To the east is a lily-white bedroom city called San Leandro. There are two very distinct geographic Oaklands, the flatlands and the hills. In the hills, and the rich area known as the Piedmont, the upper middle and upper class, the bosses of Oakland, live. Among them, former United States Senator William Noland, the owner of the ultra-conservative o- Oakland Tribune, Oakland's only newspaper. His neighbors include the mayor, the district attorney, and other wealthy white folks who live in big houses surrounded by green trees and high fences. The other Oakland, the Flatlands, consists of substandard income families that make up about 50% of the population of nearly 450,000. They live in either rundown, crowded West Oakland or dilapidated East Oakland, hemmed in block after block, in ancient decaying structures, now cut up into multiple dwellings. Here the majority of blacks, Chicanos, and Chinese people struggle to survive. The landscape of East and West Oakland is depressing. It resembles a crumbling ghost town, but a ghost town with inhabitants, among them more than 200,000 blacks, nearly half the city's population. There's a dreary, gray monotony about Oakland's flatlands, 
broken only by a few large and impressive buildings in the downtown section. Among them, significantly, the Alameda County Courthouse, which includes a jail, and the Oakland Police Headquarters building, a ten-story streamlined fortress for which no expense was spared in its construction. Oakland is a ghost town in the sense that many American cities are. Its white middle class has fled to the hills, and their indifference to the plight of the city's poor is everywhere evident. Like countless other black families in the 40s and 50s, we fell victim to this indifference and corruption when we moved to Oakland. It was as difficult then as it is now to find decent homes for large families. And we moved around quite a bit in my early years in search of a house that would suit our needs. The first house I remember was on the corner of Fifth and Brush Streets in a rundown section of Oakland. It was a two bedroom basement apartment and much too small to hold all of us comfortably. The floor was either dirt or cement. I cannot remember exactly. It did not seem to be the kind of floor that regular people had in their homes. My parents slept in one bedroom, and my sisters, brothers, and I in the other. Later, when we moved to a two-room apartment at Castro and 18th Streets, there were few of us, fewer of us. Myrtle and Leola had married, and Walter had been drafted into the army. On Castro Street, I slept in the kitchen. That memory returns often. Whenever I think of people crowded into a small living space, I always see a child sleeping in the kitchen and feeling upset about it. Everybody knows that the kitchen is not supposed to be a bedroom. That is all we had, however. I still burn with the sense of unfairness I felt every night as I crawled into the cot near the icebox. We were very poor, but I had no idea what that meant. They were happy times for me. Even though we were discriminated against and segregated into a poor community with substandard living conditions, I never felt deprived when I was small. I had a close, strong family and many playmates including my brother Melvin, who was four years older than me. Nothing else was needed. We just lived and played, enjoying everything to the fullest. Particularly the glorious California weather, which is kind to the poor. Unlike many others I knew, we never went hungry although our food was the food of the poor. Kush was standard fare. Kush was made out of day-old cornbread mixed with other leftovers, such as gravy and onions, spiced very heavily and fried in a skillet. Sometimes we ate kush twice a day, because that was all we had. It was one of my favorite dishes, and I looked forward to it. Now I see that Kush is, was not very nutritious, and it was downright bad for you if you ate it often. It is just bread, cornbread. Life grew even sweeter when I was big enough, six or seven years old, to play outdoors with Melvin. Our games were filled with the joy and exuberance of innocent children, but even they reflected our economic circumstances. We rarely had store-bought toys. We improvised with the materials at hand. Rats were close at hand, and we hated rats because they infested our homes. One had almost bitten off my nephew's toe. Partly because of the hate, and partly for the game of it, we caught rats and put them in a large can and poured coal oil into them, into the can, and light, then lighted it. The whole can would go up in flames while we watched the rats scoot around inside, trying to escape the fire, their tails sticking straight up like smoking gray toothpicks. 
Usually they died from the smoke before the flames consumed them. We also despised cats, because we were told that cats killed little babies by sucking the breath out of them. We tested the tale about cats always landing on their feet. When we caught cats and took them to the top of the stairs and hurled them down, they would land on their feet most of the time. Dirt was a favorite toy. We used it to play at being builders. The roof of the house was our building site. We would climb up there and pull up the dirt-filled buckets behind us with rope, hand over hand, to the top of the house, and then dump the dirt down on the other side. There were no swimming pools near us, but when we got a little older we began to wander down to the bay with the other kids and go swimming off the pier in the dirty water. Dirt, rats, cats. These are the games and toys of the poor, as old and cruel as economic reality. My parents insisted that we learn to get along with each other. When there was a dispute, my father never took sides. He was always an impartial judge, listening to both parties and getting to the bottom of things before making a decision. He was a fair and careful judge about all disputes, and later, when we had trouble in school, my father went every time to the teacher or the principal to learn what had happened. When we were right, he stood up for us, but he never tolerated wrongdoing. We were not taught to fight by our parents although my father insisted that we stand our ground when attacked. He told us never to start a fight, but once in it, to stand fast until the end. This was how we grew up, in a close family with a proud, strong, protective father and a loving, joyful mother. No wonder we came to feel that all our needs, from religion to friendship to entertainment, were met within the family circle. There was no felt need for outside friends. We were such good friends with each other. Footnote. Even today, my entire family lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, close to our parents. Any disagreements among us are still taken to our parents for arbitration. When one member of the family entertains, most of the guests are other family members. Outsiders are rarely included in such gatherings. End of footnote. In this way, the days of our childhood slipped past. We shared the dreams of other American children. In our innocence, we planned to be doctors, lawyers, pilots, boxers, and builders. How could we know then that we were not going anywhere? Nothing in our experience had shown us yet that the American dream was not for us. We too had great expectations. And then we went to school. End of chapter one. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Chapter two. Introductory quote. The clash of cultures in the classroom is essentially a class war, a socioeconomic and racial war, fair, being waged on the battleground of our schools with middle class aspiring teachers provided with a powerful arsenal of half truths, prejudices, and rationalizations arrayed against hopelessly outclassed working class youngsters. This is an uneven balance particularly since, like most battles, it comes under the guise of righteousness. Kenneth Clark, Dark Ghetto Losing <clears throat> Because we moved around a lot when I was growing up, I attended almost every grammar and junior high school in the city of Oakland and had wide experience with the kind of education Oakland offered its poor people.
At the time, I did not understand the size or seriousness of the school system's assault on black people. I knew only that I felt constantly felt uncomfortable and ashamed of being black. This feeling followed me everywhere without let up. It was a result of the implicit understanding in the system that whites were smart and blacks were stupid. Anything presented as good was always white. Even the stories teachers gave us to read in the early grades, Little Black Sambo, Little Red Riding Hood, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves told us what we were. I remember my reaction to Little Black Sambo. Sambo was, first of all, a coward. When confronted by the tigers, he gave up the presents from his father without a struggle. First the umbrella, then the beautiful crimson, felt-lined shoes, everything, until he had nothing left. And afterward, Sambo wanted only to eat pancakes. He was totally unlike the courageous white knight who rescued Sleeping Beauty. The knight was our symbol of purity, while Sambo stood for humiliation and gluttony. Time after time, we heard the story of Little Black Sambo. We did not want to laugh, but finally we did, to hide our shame, accepting Sambo as a symbol of what blackness was all about. As I suffered through Sambo and the Black Tar Baby story in Br'er Rabbit in the early grades, a great weight began to settle on me. It was the weight of ignorance and inferiority imposed by the system. I found myself wanting to identify with the white heroes in the, pr in the primers and in the movies I saw, and in time I cringed at the mention of black. This created a gulf of hostility between the teachers and me, a lot of it repressed, but still there, like the strange mixture of hate and admiration we blacks felt towards whites generally. We simply did not feel capable of learning what the white kids could learn. From the beginning, everyone, including us, judged smart blacks in terms of how they compared with whites, whether they could read or do arithmetic as well as the white kids. Whites were the standard of comparison in all things, even personal attractiveness. Bushy African hair was bad, straight hair was good, light was better than dark. Our image of ourselves was defined for us by textbooks and teachers. We not only accepted ourselves as inferior, we accepted the inferiority as inevitable and inescapable. By the third or fourth grade, when we had began to do simple mathematics, I had learned to maneuver my way around the teachers. It was a simple matter to put pressure on the white kids to do my arithmetic and spelling assignments. The feeling that we could not learn this material was a general attitude among black children in every public school I ever attended. Predictably, this sense of despair and futility led us into rebellious attitudes. Rebellion was the only way we knew to cope with the suffocating, repressive atmosphere that undermined our confidence. Of all the unpleasant things that happened to me in elementary school, I remember two in particular. I had disciplinary problems from the beginning, plenty of them, but often they were not my fault. For instance, in the fifth grade at Lafayette Elementary School, I was 11, I had an old white lady for a teacher. I have forgotten her name, but not her stern, disapproving face. Thinking once that I was not paying attention, she called me to the front of the room and pointedly told the class that I was misbehaving because I was stupid. She would show them just how stupid I was. Handing me a piece of chalk, she told me to write the word business on the blackboard. Now, I knew how to spell the word. I had written it many times before, and I knew I was not stupid. However, 
When I walked to the board and tried to write, I froze, unable to form even the first letter. Inside, I knew she was wrong, but how could I prove it to her? I resolved the situation by walking out of the room without a word. This happened to me time and again, growing worse with repetition. When I was asked to read aloud in class or spell a word, my mind went black and cold. Everybody thought I was dumb, I suppose, but I knew it was the lock inside my head. I had lost the key. Even now, when I read to a group of people, I am likely to stumble. The other incident also happened at Lafayette. The school had a rule that you could dump the sand out of your shoes after recess, just before you sat down. One day, I was sitting on the floor, dumping the sand from each shoe. I had quite a bit of sand, and dumping it took time. Too much for the teacher, who came up behind me and slapped me across the ear with a book, accusing me of deliberately delaying the class. Without thinking, I threw the shoe at her. She headed for the door at a good clip and made it through just in front of my other one. Of course, I was sent to the principal, but I received a great deal of respect from the other children for that act. They backed me for resisting unjust authority. In our working and lower class community, we valued the person who successfully bucked authority. Group prestige and acceptance were won through defiance and physical strength, and both of them led to racial and class conflict between the authorities and the students. The only teacher with whom I never had trouble was Mrs. McLaren, who taught me sixth grade at Santa Fe Elementary School. She had taught my brother Melvin several years earlier, and since he was a model student, Mrs. McLaren's expected a lot of me. I felt, in turn, a responsibility to live up to Melvin's reputation. Mrs. McLaren never raised her voice. She was a tranquil person, at ease and peaceful, no matter what was happening. Nobody wanted to start a fight with her. She was the exception to the rule. By then, however, even in the sixth grade, I had such a tough reputation in school, there was no need to start fights with the instructors. They were waiting for me and often provoked trouble, thinking I would pull something anyway, even when I was going along with the program. I went through a series of conversions and lapses. Each suspension brought a strong lecture from my parents, followed by a week or so of heavy soul-searching and a decision to cooperate with the teachers and give my best effort. Mother and father argued that the instructors had something I needed and that I could not expect to go into the class as an equal. I would return to the school full of firm and good intentions. Then, invariably, the instructors would provoke me, thinking I was there to continue the struggle. Sharp words, a fight, expulsion, and another semester down the drain. It often seemed that they simply wanted me out of the classroom. During those long years in the Oakland public schools, I did not have one teacher who taught me anything relevant to my own life or experience. Not one instructor even awoke in me a desire to learn more or question or explore the worlds of literature, science, and history. All they did was to try to rob me of the sense of my own uniqueness and worth, and in the process, they nearly killed my urge to inquire. End of chapter 2 Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton 3. Beginning of Quote 
He who would be free must strike the first blow. Frederick Douglass, My Bondage and My Freedom Section Growing Throughout my life, all real learning has taken place outside school. I was educated by my family, my friends, and the street. Later, I learned to love books, and I read a lot, but that had nothing to do with school. Long before, I was getting educated in unorthodox ways. One of the first things any black child must learn is how to fight well. My father taught us to play fair, and when I started school, I tried to follow his advice. His principles of justice did not prevail everywhere, however. Some games ended in fights, and at the time I did not like to fight. My first year of school, kindergarten, was tough. I developed a habit of feigning sickness so that I would not have to face some of the local bullies. When the sick excuse failed, I lost, quote, my clothes and took a long time to dress. My mother saw through these excuses, and when she learned why I was avoiding school, she had my brother Walter, Jr., Sonny Man, take me. Eventually, I began to stand my ground when others wanted to fight, and the trouble stopped because Walter taught me how to fight and fight well. All of us at that time, around 1950, thought Joe Lewis was a saint. He and Jersey Joe, Kid Gavillan, and Sugar Ray were our pantheon. I wanted to be a fighter, too, which seemed possible because I had the fastest hands on the block. Other boys assumed nicknames, Winchester, Duke, Count, but Huey was name enough for me. I beat up all the kids on the block, not to be a bully, but to protect my dignity and to survive. Many of these fights stemmed from my middle initial. The way they used to say it, Huey P. Newton became Huey, quote, P.E.E. -E Newton. And when a rhyme came at me like, Huey P. goes wee wee wee, I started throwing hands until it stopped. It got so bad for a while that I, I wanted to simplify life by dropping the middle initial, but my mother would not let me. On the streets, we had our little boxing matches. We wrapped towels around our hands for gloves and went five rounds while the wino stood around betting nickels and urging on, us on. They loved the blood, and we gave it to them. We would be in there swinging, bleeding, and crying, really slugging each other. The winos called me prize fighter. Because I thought a prize fighter received a prize when the battle was over, they sometimes bought me a ten-cent box of Cracker Jack, and I took the prize out of that, the only prize I ever knew. We could hardly eat the Cracker Jack, our mouths were so bloody. I never thought of fighting in terms of money. Later, I trained with Walter at the Campbell, Campbell Street Center and had a few bouts at the boys club. My oldest brother, Lee Edward, had already left home by the time I began to grow up, but he often came by the house to see the family. He taught me a lot about fighting, too. Lee Edward had a big reputation in the community as a man who never lost a fight. Any boy of that time would have been proud as I was to have a brother known to defend himself in all circumstances. Even though he lived, quote, on the block and saw some rough times, he never stepped aside for anybody. More than anyone else, he taught me to persist in the face of bad odds always look an adversary straight in the eye, and to keep moving forward. 
even if you were hurled back three or four times, he said, eventually you would prevail. He was right. Fighting has always been a big part of my life, as it is in the lives of most poor people. Some find this hard to understand. I was too young to realize that we were really trying to affirm our masculinity and dignity, and using force in reaction to the social pressures exerted against us. For a proud and dignified people, fighting was one way to resist dehumanization. You learn a lot about yourself when you fight. Fighting is not just a means of survival, it is also a part of friendship. All the time I was growing up, fighting was an essential aspect of camaraderie on the block. It took many forms. You fought your friends, or with your friends you fought an outside aggressor. If the neighborhood boasted a good fighter, word got around. That was how I first heard of David Hillard, now a member of the Black Panther Party. David was no bully, he never looked for trouble, but when attacked, he had great courage. He had won renown in our neighborhood as a brave adversary, who never backed down. That is one of the qualities I have always admired most in him, and the bond that was formed then, 18 years ago, has held. I was 13 years old and just out of elementary school the summer I met David. My family had just moved to North Oakland, where we were at last able to buy a house. David, who had come to Oakland from Alabama not long before, lived down the block from us. We soon became close friends. My parents were very fond of him, and eventually he became liked like one of the family. We have often wondered whether we may not be kin to one another, since my paternal grandmother was a Hillard from Alabama. David was the constant companion of my early teens, sharing with me all of the usual activities of adolescence. Sometimes we spent whole days together, listening to records and rapping. Singing groups were very popular then. I could not sing, and still cannot, but David sings well, and he and some of his friends, Joe, Snake, and Early, had a group that practiced every day one summer, hoping to hit it big. Another interest we shared was girls. Some very pretty girls lived next door to David, which made the Hillard House a popular gathering place. The fall after we met, both of us started junior high school at Woodrow Wilson. Among our friends, there was a pretty girl named Patricia Parks, whom I had known for some time. The truth is, I think I terrified her. When I came on the scene, she would disappear. But when I introduced her to David, they hit it off right away, and later they were married. Patricia is not terrified of me anymore. David was part of my education. He still is. The steadfastness of our relationship cannot be put into words. Although we have been friends for 18 years and have been in many fights together against others, we have never quarreled or had a serious disagreement. We are different in many ways, but we respect each other's differences. Another good friend in junior high was James Crawford. He was a couple of years older than me, but behind in school. James and I used to fight each other a lot, falling out one day, and coming together again the next. He could beat up most boys in the school, including me, and whenever we fought, I would lose. But I always came back with some kind of equalizer, a baseball bat or a short piece of rubber hose with a metal insert. He had to give me respect, because even when he beat me, I would come back to him. 
James and I stopped fighting each other in 1953 when we formed a gang called the Brotherhood, which eventually numbered 30 or 40 regular members, all of them 7th and 8th grade black boys. Another gang of 9th graders were our allies. Crawford and I were the leaders. The Butt Brotherhood, one of the few gangs in North Oakland, was a direct response to white aggression at school. At that time, blacks were a small minority at Woodrow Wilson, and all the blacks there viewed each other as blood relations. We called ourselves brothers or cousins and banded together to fight racist students, faculty, and administration. Back then, white staff people and students routinely called blacks niggers, and tension was high. Black students stuck together on the playground, too. We had outgrown hide-and-go-seek, King of the Mountain, and Ring Alevio, but our game still reflected our poverty. We spent hours rolling dice and pitching and flipping pennies. Since none of us ever had enough money to buy lunch or even milk, we gambled for these things. We also played what some kids call capping, or the dozens. This is a game of verbal assault in which kids insult each other by talking about sexual liberties they have taken with the opponent's mother. It is a very common game in the black community. My contests would often end in fights because I was no good at putting people in the dozens. In the mornings, David and I often talked about how to cap Crawford. But when we got to school, Crawford usually outcapped us. A typical dozens from Crawford might go like this. Motorcycle, motorcycle, going so fast. Your mother's got a pussy like a bulldog's ass. They were just words, and we were good friends in spite of it. Really, quote, tight partners. My years in junior high were a repeat of elementary school. The teachers attempted to embarrass and humiliate me, and I countered defiantly to protect my dignity. While I did not see it at the time, fierce pride was at the bottom of my resistance. These struggles had the same result. I continued to be suspended from school. My parents, the principal, and the counselor lectured me for hours, and I would again make up my mind to knuckle under and go along. As soon as I hit the classroom, however, there would be another provocation, another visit with the principal, and back on the streets again. It was a kind of revolving door. Each week, things were the same. The one class I took in junior high school that was not painful was a cooking class taught by the only black teacher I had in all my years at school, Miss Cook. There was a reason for my taking this class. Most of the white kids had money to buy their lunch, but my family could not afford that. Since I was too proud to bring my lunch in a brown paper bag and be ridiculed by my friends, I took cooking and eating. It was either that, or gambling, or stealing from the white kids. Crawford and I were always in the same, were in the same class, and we were always getting kicked out together. I remember clearly one of the teachers at Woodrow Wilson, Mrs. Gross. We had our three periods every day in what was called the dumb class. Only blacks were in it. We spent each day gambling and poking each other and generally raising hell. Crawford would shoot a rubber band at me, or I would slap him on the head, and then we would fight, and Mrs. Gross would kick us out. Sometimes she sent us to the principal's office, and sometimes she told us to stand in the hall. When you were booted from one of her classes, you were out for the whole day. It was a form of liberation. Liberation from the dumb class.
Our class was particularly bad during reading sessions. We hated being there to begin with, because we were not interested in what Mrs. Gross was saying. When the reading aloud sessions came, we were frantic to get out. We could not read, and we did not want the rest of the class to know it. The funny thing is that most of the others could not read either. Still, you did not want them to know it. At that time, and earlier, I associated reading with being an adult. When I became an adult, I would automatically be able to read, too. It was a skill that people naturally acquired in the process of maturation. Anyhow, why should I want to read when all they gave us were irrelevant and racist stories? Refusing to learn became a matter of defiance, a way of preserving whatever dignity I could hold on to in an, oppress in an oppressive system. Therefore, when it was time for Crawford to get me to read, we made a conscious effort to get kicked out of class, and were usually successful. Then we would sneak out of the school and steal a bottle of wine, or ride our bikes to one of our partner's houses, and, and while away the day playing cards. Later, after school let out in the afternoon, we often sneaked into the movies with other kids, or went to David's house and listened to records and danced with the girls. This is pretty much the way things went all during junior high. On the surface, my record was dismal. Yet those years were not significantly different from the adolescence of many blacks. We went to school and got kicked out. We drifted into patterns of petty delinquency. We were not necessarily criminally inclined, but we were angry. We did not feel that stealing a bottle of wine or cracking parking meters was wrong. We were getting back at the people who made us feel small and insignificant at a time when we needed to feel important and hopeful. We struck out at those who trampled our dreams. James Crawford had his dreams. He dreamed of becoming a great singer. There were days when Melvin and I sat listening for hours while James sang in his beautiful tenor voice. He was also a good cook and dreamed of opening a restaurant. James Crawford was talented, but the educational system and his psychological scars held him back. He never learned to read. To this day, he cannot read. His fear of failure was reinforced rather than helped by those charged with his education, and his dreams slipped away. As he became more fearful and frustrated with each passing year, James was finally expelled from school as an undesirable. Gradually, he sank into alcoholism and has been in and out of state mental hospitals since our school years. His face is scarred where the police beat him. That is the story of my friend James Crawford, another dream blown to hell. End of chapter 3. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 4, Beginning Quote The glory of my boyhood years was my father. There was no hint of servility in my father's makeup. Just as in youth he had refused to remain a slave, so in all the years of his manhood he disdained to be an Uncle Tom. From him we learned and never doubted it, that the Negro was in every way equal to the white man, and we fiercely resolved to prove it. Paul Robeson, Here I Stand Section Changing Hope has always been a scarce commodity in the black community. Claude Brown, who grew up in Harlem, 
as written of this in Manchild in the Promised Land. When he returned to Harlem after an absence of four years, he had a hard time finding many of the friends he had grown up with. Quote, it seemed as though most of the cats that we'd come up with just hadn't made it, he says. Almost everybody was dead or in jail. End quote. Many young black men in our generation can say the same thing. Drugs, oppression, and despair take their toll. Survival is not a simple matter or something to be taken for granted. When I look back on my early years, I see how lucky I was. Strong and positive influences in my life helped me escape the hopelessness that afflicts so many of my contemporaries. First, there was my father, who gave me a strong sense of pride and self-respect. Second, my brother Melvin awakened in me the desire to learn. And third, because of him, I began to read. What I discovered in books led me to think, to question, to explore, and finally to redirect my life. Numerous other factors influenced me. My mother and the rest of my family, my experiences on the street, my friends, and even religion in a peculiar way. But these three, and most of all my father, helped me to develop and change. When I say that my father was unusual, I mean that he had a dignity and pride seldom seen in Southern black men. Although many other black men in the South had a similar strength, they never let it show around whites. To do so was to take your life in your hands. My father never kept his strength from anybody. Traditionally, Southern black women have always had to be careful about how they bring up their sons. Through generations, black mothers have tried to curb the natural masculine aggressiveness in their young male children, lest this quality bring swift reprisal or even death from the white community. <clears throat> My father was never subjected to this pressure, or if he was, he chose to ignore it. He somehow managed to grow up with all his pride and dignity intact. As an adult, he never let a white man humiliate him or any member of his family. He kept his wife at home, even though whites in Monroe, Louisiana, felt she should be working in their kitchens, and made that plain to him. He never yielded, always maintaining his stand as a strong protector and he never hesitated to speak up to a white man. When we children were small, my father entertained us with stories of his encounters with whites. He has not been well for the past few years, but even now, as he tells these stories, the old strength surges through him again. None of us realized it then, but those old stories were more than simple entertainment. He was teaching us how to be men. One time in Louisiana, he got into an argument with a young white man for whom he was working. The disagreement had to do with some detail about the job, and the white man became angry when my father stood his ground. He told my father that when a colored man disputed his word, he whipped him. My father replied just as firmly that no man whipped him unless he was a better man, and he doubted that the white man was qualified. This shocked the white man and confused him, so that he backed down by calling my father crazy. The story spread quickly around town. My father became known as a crazy man, because he would not give in to the harassment of the whites. Strangely, this crazy reputation meant that whites were less likely to bother him. That is often the way of the oppressor. He cannot understand the simple fact that people want to be free. So when a man resists oppression, 
they pass it off by calling him crazy or insane. My father was crazy for his refusal to let a white man call him nigger, or to play the Uncle Tom, or allow whites to bother his family. Crazy to them, he was a hero to us. He even stood up to white men when they were armed. One evening, as he rode home from work with some other black men, for some reason they stopped their car in front of a white man's house and began to talk and laugh. They did not see the white woman on the front porch, but pretty soon a white man came out of the house with an axe and yelled at them for laughing at his sister. The driver panicked and drove off. When they reached the corner, my father made him stop. He climbed out and walked back alone. The white man was advancing down the road with the axe. My father asked him why he had come out with an axe and what he had in mind to do with it. The white man passed off the incident lightly by saying something about, you know how these southern women can be, and now he had to make a show to satisfy his sister. My father realized that in the etiquette of southern race relations, this was an apology. He accepted it, but not before he made it clear to the white man that he would not be threatened. He never hesitated to make his view known to anyone who would listen. Once, when he felt cheated by a white man, he let all the town know what had happened. The man heard the stories and came to our house to see my father. This white man carried a gun in the glove compartment of his car. My father knew that, but he nevertheless went outside unarmed to talk. He maneuvered around to the right side of the car and sat on the running board with the white man in front of them so that he could not get to the gun. Then he told the white man what he thought of him and said, If you hit me a lick, the other folks will have to hunt me down because you'll be lying here in the road dead. The white man drove off, and my father heard no more about it. Another time, some whites invited him to go hunting. To this day, I do not know why they asked him. They all took their shotguns. Knowing my father was a preacher, they tried to goad him into a discussion about the Bible and the origin of man. Adam and Eve were surely white, they said, so where did black people come from? Their convenient interpretation was that blacks must have sprung from the union of Adam and a gorilla. My father countered by saying that Adam must have been a low-life white man to have had sex with a gorilla. At this, the situation grew fairly tense, but nothing came of it. His protection extended to every member of our family. At the age of 15, my oldest brother, Lee Edward, went to work with my father in a sugarcane mill. The first step in the sugarcane process was to feed stalks into a gasoline-powered grinder. The grinder never stopped, and it had to be kept full or it would burn out. This was Lee Edward's job. They had cut the engine down some in the hope that Lee Edward could run it, but he got tired his first day in the mill, and about 11 o'clock, after four hours on the job, he could not keep the machine full. It ran down and burned out. When the owner saw this, he began yelling at Lee Edward, but before he could say much, my father was right there. This white man was over six feet tall and weighed 200 pounds, but my father got right in the middle of it. He shut off the motor and told the owner it took a grown-up to keep Kane in the, in the mill. My father took Lee Edward off the job after that. He wanted us to be good workers, just as he was, but he also wanted us to grow up proud.
I heard these stories, and others like them, over and over again, until in a way his experiences became my own. Anyone who tried to bother us, black or white, had to contend with my father. It made no difference that the South did not tolerate such behavior from blacks. My father stood up to the white South until the day he left for California. He has never returned. The fact that my father survived these encounters may go deeper than a simple white defense mechanism. His blood was, after all, half white, and that same blood flowed in the veins of other local people, in his father, his cousins, aunts, and uncles. While local whites were willing enough to shed the blood of black people, it may be that they were afraid of being haunted by the murder of another white. Statistics bear this out. The history of lynching in the South shows that blacks of mixed blood had a much higher chance of surviving racial oppression than their all-black brothers. In any case, my father's pride meant that the threat of death was always there. Yet it did not destroy his desire to be a man, to be free. Now I understand that because he was a man, he was also free, and he was able to pass this freedom on to his children. No matter how much society tried to steal our self-esteem, we survived on what we got from him. It was the greatest possible gift. All else stems from that. This strong sense of self-worth created a closeness among us and a sense of responsibility for each other. Since I was the youngest in the family, all the other children had a deep influence on me, but particularly my three brothers. Of the three, it was Melvin who opened up most decisively the possibilities for intellectual growth and a special kind of self-realization. Melvin is only four years older than I am, and during childhood we were constant playmates. Melvin planned to become a doctor, and I dreamed of being a dentist so that we could open an office together in the community. Somewhere along the way these desires were lost, probably in school, where my scholarly ambitions died early. Although Melvin did not go to medical school, he was always a good student. Now he teaches sociology at Merritt College in Oakland. I always admired Melvin's intellectual activities. It was he who helped me overcome my reading difficulties. When he began college, I used to follow him around and listen to him discuss books and courses with his friends. I think this later influenced me to go to college, even though I had not learned anything in high school. Melvin also taught me poetry by playing recordings of poems or reading to me. He was studying literature in school, and I suppose teaching me poems was a way of learning them himself. We often discussed their meanings. Sometimes Melvin explained the poems to me, but after a while I found that I could understand them alone, and I began to explain them to him. I seemed to remember poetry without effort, and by the time I entered high school, my memory held a lot of poetry I had read about. As Melvin studied for his literature class at Oakland City College, I learned Edgar Allan Poe's The Bells and The Raven, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot, Shelley's Ozymandias and Adonais, I also liked Shakespeare, particularly Macbeth's despairing speech that begins, Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day. Shakespeare was speaking of the human condition. He was also speaking to me, for my life sometimes crept aimlessly from day to day. 
I was often like the player, fretting and strutting, my brief hour upon the stage. Soon, like a brief candle, my life would go out. I was learning a lesson, however that, con however, that contradicted Macbeth's despair. While life will always be filled with sound and fury, it can be more than a tale signifying nothing. Adonais, too, had a special impact on me. The poem tells the story of a man whose friend dies or is killed. One of the best things in the poem is the sense that with the passing of years, the poet's feelings alter and he begins to see things differently. He tells how he feels, how his attitude towards his friend changes as time goes on. This was an experience I began to have near the end of high school, as my friends drifted into the service, or got married, or tried to become part of the very system that had humiliated us all the way through school. As time passed, I began to see the futility of the lives toward which they were headed. Marriage, family, and debt. In a sense, another kind of slavery. Ozymandias impressed me because I felt there were different levels of meaning in it. It is a rich and complex poem. Beginning of quote. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passages read, passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand, stretch sands stretch far away. End quote. The poem could mean that a man's life is like the myth of Sisyphus. Each time you push the rock up the mountain, it rolls back down on you. Men build mighty works, and yet they are all destroyed. This king foolishly thought that his works would last forever, but not even works of stone survive. The king's great monument was destroyed, victim of the inevitable changes that come with time. On the other hand, it could be that the king was so wise that he wanted people to take their minds off their achievements and look with despair, because they, too, would reach that edge of time where everything around them will be leveled. Often it is impossible to understand at any specific period in your life just what is happening to you, since changes take place in imperceptible ways. This was true of my own adolescence. My admiration for Melvin led to a love of poetry, and later to my interest in literature and philosophy. Later, when my brother and I analyzed and interpreted poetry, we were dealing in concepts. Even though I could not read, I was becoming familiar with conceptual abstractions and the analysis of ideas and beginning to develop the questioning attitude that later allowed me to analyze my experiences. That led in turn to the desire to read, and the books I read eventually changed my life profoundly. End of chapter 4 Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 5 
beginning quote. It's about a kid like you were who believed. He was born believing, but as he grew, everything around him, beginning with his parents and sisters and teachers, everybody seemed to say that what he believed wasn't so. Sure, they said they believed and they prayed and cried to God and Jesus Christ Almighty, but that was a few moments out of a couple hours in the church each week. So somehow he became two personalities, one as sincere as the other, and then three, because he could stand off and watch the other two. The reason was that he suspected maybe the people who didn't believe might be right, that there was nothing to believe in. But if he accepted this, and put down the beautiful, honest, good things, he'd lose out, he'd lose out on all he could have gained if he'd never lost his belief in believing. Charles Mingus, Beneath the Underdog Section Choosing During my adolescence, often without realizing it, I was making important choices. Some influences in our early years are so clear that their effect cannot be denied. We may also unconsciously reject other influences as we go along. It is hard to say at any point how things will turn out. All the time, I was going to junior high school and getting into trouble, fighting on the block, listening to poetry, and talking with Melvin. Other strong forces were, were at work. Often they were contradictory in nature and pulled me in different directions. This caused confusion and conflict later, until I learned to sort them out and understand what they meant. One of the most long-lasting influences on my life was religion. Both my parents are deeply religious, and when Melvin and I were small, my father often read to us from the Bible. My favorite was the Samson story, followed closely by David and Goliath. I must have heard those stories a thousand times. Samson's strength was impressive, as well as his wisdom and his ability to solve riddles put to him. Strength and wisdom. I still link the hero with my father in those terms. I liked David and Goliath because, despite Goliath's strength and power, David was able to use strategy and eventually gain the victory. Even then, the story of David seemed directed to me and to my people. When we were growing up, we went to church every day, or so it seemed. Back then, the Antioch Baptist Church was only a little storefront, where the faithful gathered. I belonged to the Baptist Young People's Union, the Young Deacons, the Junior Choir, and I attended Sunday school and worship services weekly. My father was the associate pastor for a long time. He liked to preach the sermon about the prodigal son, and as he preached he really moved around in the pulpit, waving his arms and beating the stand. He terrified me with tales of fire and brimstone, and how sinners and the unrepentant would end up in a lake of fire. He was a real, quote, burner. The whole family was involved in church one way or another, holding offices, singing in the choir, serving on the usher board, or other committees. I was very active as a junior deacon, and every third Sunday the regular deacons gave us their chairs below the pulpit. We sat in their places and administered certain parts of the services, taking up the collection and leading the congregation in prayer, everything except delivering the sermon. I did it all. I even read the sick list and special messages, although I had difficulty with reading. None of the other junior deacons did any better, however. We were all pretty illiterate. If we were weak in reading, however, other activities compensated. 
I loved to act in plays because I had acquired a certain eloquence reciting the poetry that Melvin taught me. It was easy for me to remember a part after I had heard it once or twice. My activities in church led to music. My parents were so impressed with everything I was doing that they decided to have me study the piano, mainly as a good way for me to take a more active role in the religious services. I studied piano for seven years with some excellent music theorists and classical pianists. Looking back, I see that my friends and I were all in the same boat, heading for hell on earth and trying to reach heaven in church. Nevertheless, taking part in church activities and leading the services gave us a feeling of importance unequaled anywhere else in our lives. For years, our pastor, Reverend Thomas, had a sign on the pulpit, Prayer Changes Things. The congregation was encouraged to see prayer as the only way to salvation. If we had problems, sickness, accidents, financial difficulties, prayer was the answer. Everybody in church prayed with you, sharing a common purpose that relieved tension and had a cathartic effect. No other institution in the community provided such an outlet. At the time, the church was the only stable force in the black community. And while some people do not think it was very effective, it did offer a kind of permanence and stability to our lives. The church was always there, providing solace and hope. For me, the church was a source of inspiration that offered a countermeasure against the fear and humiliation I experienced in school. Even though I did not want to spend my life there, I enjoyed a good sermon and shouting session. I even experienced sensations of holiness, of security, and of deliverance. They were strange feelings, hard to describe, but involving a tremendous emotional release. Though I never shouted, the emotion of others was contagious. One person stimulated another, and together we shared an ecstasy and believed our problems would be solved, although we never knew how. James Baldwin has described this religious experience very well in The Fire Next Time. He writes about the excitement and ecstasy that can fill a church during the service. There is no music, he says, like that music, no drama like that drama of the saints rejoicing, the sinners moaning, the tambourines racing, and all those voices coming together crying wholly unto the Lord. Their pain and their joy were mine, and mine were theirs. They surrendered their pain and joy to me, and I surrendered mine to them. End of quote. Once you experience this feeling, it never leaves you. For a while, I thought of becoming a minister, but I gave it up when I studied philosophy in college. I began asking questions about the concept of religion and the existence of God. In trying to find God and understand him as a philosophical ex existential being, I began to question not only the Christian definition of God, but also the very foundation of my religion. I saw that it was based on belief alone the soundness of which was never questioned. Because I eventually found it necessary to question and examine every idea and every belief that touched my life, I reached a kind of impasse with religion. Yet its impact on me continues in different ways. To this day, for example, I rarely use profanity. People who have come to know me often ask why. I can only say that profanity was never used in our home. If I had been caught using it, my father would have punished me. My mother and father always lived as Christians, and this extended to the way they spoke. When I think back on the meetings in that storefront, it seems to me that religion made an impression in a more important, yet less direct way. It has nothing to do with a personal system of belief, but rather an awareness of what religious action can or ought to be. 
something remarkable was taking place during every prayer service. When people in the congregation prayed for each other, a feeling of community took over. They were involved in each other's problems and trying to help solve them. Even though it was entirely directed to God and did not go beyond the meeting, it suggested how powerful and moving it can be to have a shared sense of purpose. People really related to each other. Here was a microcosm of what ought to have been going on inside, outside the community. I had the first glimmer of what it means to have a unified goal that involves the whole community and calls forth the strengths of the people to make things better. I am sure that is part of why I was drawn to religion, and why it offered so much to me then. At the same time, I was growing aware of a wholly different style of life that had nothing to do with religion. One of the reasons so many people found comfort and solace in church was that it provided, even though briefly, an escape from the burdens and troubles of everyday life. There was another way of life, however, that did not seem to find this relief necessary. From what I could see, this other life also had none of the worries and problems that beset ordinary working-class people. In our community, some people had achieved a special kind of status. They drove big cars, wore beautiful clothes, and owned many of the most desirable things life has to offer. Almost without trying, they seemed to have gotten things for which the rest of the people were working so hard. Moreover, they were having fun in the process. They were not forced to compromise by imitating white boys and going on in school. They succeeded in spite of the humiliations of the school system. As a matter of fact, they often won success at the expense of the very people who caused our troubles. They opposed all authority and made no peace with the establishment. In doing so, they became big men in the lower class community. This was the world of Walter Jr., my second oldest brother, who was always called Sunny Man in our family. When I was small, he often took care of me, and I looked up to him. By the time I was a teenager, Sunny Man was a hustler with a reputation as a ladies' man. To this day, he has never married. To be a hustler means to be a survivor. The brothers on the block respected him and called him a hipster, even in those days. When people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said I wanted to be like him. To me, Sunny Man was much freer than the rest of us. Compared with my father's struggle, the way Sunny Man lived offered much to my hungry eyes. My father's constant preoccupation with bills is the most profound and persistent memory of my childhood. We were always in debt, always trying to catch up. From an early age, the bills meant I could not have any of the extra things I wanted. I hated the words so much it made me cringe inside, just like the way I felt listening to Little Black Sambo and the Tar Baby stories. For me, no words on the street were as profane as the bills. It killed me a little each time they were mentioned, because I could see the never-ending struggle and agony my father went through trying to cope with them. It is a situation familiar to most people in the black community. In one of his letters to his father, George Jackson spoke for me. Quote, how do you think I felt when I saw you come home each day a little more depressed than the day before? How do you think I felt when I looked in your face and saw the clouds forming? When I saw you look around and see your best efforts go for nothing, nothing. End quote. I know exactly what he meant.
My father always paid his bills on time. He might complain about them, particularly about the interest, but he paid. As I grew older, I would sometimes examine the bills he received, and I saw that in most cases the greater portion of the money was going to pay interest. If we bought something like a refrigerator, we wound up paying double the original cost. Sometimes the bills exceeded his whole paycheck. My father never mailed his payments. Melvin and I took them to the stores because he wanted the receipts stamped. He felt that if he mailed the payments, they might make a mistake not send the receipt, and charge him more. This had happened in the past. Every two weeks, or once a month, depending on when the payment was due, he would make out a list for us and arrange the money in separate envelopes, one for each store, with the receipts inside. Then when we returned, he would carefully check the receipts. For years, Melvin and I made the rounds of Oakland stores, paying bills for our father. I was still doing this when I was arrested in 1967. When I became aware of the effect of the bills on my family, I wanted to be free of them. It was more than the bills that disturbed me, however. We were in an impoverished state and I found it hard to understand how my father could work so hard, yet have so little. He was a jack-of-all-trades, carpenter, brick mason, plumber, no job was beyond him. He worked at two, and sometimes three jobs at once, and yet we never got ahead. After finishing one of his various jobs, he would hurry home and work around the house or in the garden and then go off to another job. We could not understand how he did it. Never a day to rest or relax, and never a complaint. I think the years of hard work are partially responsible for his poor health now. He was always a strong person, and never sick until his later years. When I was older, and had a chance to see how people in better circumstances lived, I saw that our difficulty resulted from the large number of people in our family. For years, all nine of us lived in three or four rooms, with little opportunity for privacy. Until I was eleven or twelve, I had to sleep with Melvin in the kitchen, and sometimes before that, in bed with my sisters. It never occurred to me that I could have a room of my own. Fortunately, there was a great deal of affection and humor among us all, but still it was hard. I see now that in those years the idea took root in my mind that we were suffering such hardship through our own fault. I equated the idea of the family with being trapped and plagued by bills. At an early age, I made up my mind never to have bills when I grew up. I could not know then that this determination would extend eventually to the point of not being married or having a family of my own. My fear of being hounded by debt led me down Sunny Man's Road for a while. When I saw how much he was respected on the block, I began to spend most of my time there, at first in the little gangs we had in school and at parties, but later in the pool hall and bars. For a long time, I was attracted to this way of life, until I discovered it was not what it seemed. That came later. Even though I was attempting to be like Sunny Man, I nonetheless admired Melvin and his educational achievements. Both avenues seemed to offer a way, but I could not know which road was best. I had seen blacks take the education road and get nowhere. 
Many of them returned to the block, scorning their years in school and cursing the white man for holding them back. Other blacks had apparently made it on the block, but ended up broken men, in prison or dead. There was no clear pattern to follow. It was hard to know what to do. This dilemma faces almost all young black men struggling to achieve a sense of identity in a society that denies them their basic rights. The black teenager, in his most impressionable and vulnerable years, looks around and sees a contradiction between society's expressed values and reality, the way things actually are. The sunny men of the community, who defy authority and break the law, seem to enjoy the good life and have everything in the way of material possessions. On the other hand, people who work hard and struggle and suffer much are the victims of greed and indifference, losers. This insane reversal of values presses heavily on the black community. The causes originate from outside and are imposed by a system that ruthlessly seeks its own rewards, no matter what the cost in wrecked human lives. This can be profoundly disorienting to a teenager trying to understand and define himself. Like adolescents everywhere, he wants an image to model himself after, and he becomes confused because there is such disparity between what he is taught and what he sees. Most adolescents in black communities expect no justice from school authorities or the police. The painful reality of their lives from childhood on reveals that the inequities they encounter are not confined to a few institutions. The effects of injustice and discrimination can be seen in the lives of nearly everyone around them. A brutal system permeates every aspect of life. It is in the air they breathe. In attempting to cope, the teenager seeks some kind of protection for himself in order to survive, some way of dealing with the contradictions that surround him. This usually takes the form of resistance to all authority. For many adolescents, it is the only weapon they have. Most of the time, their rebellion is directed against authority outside the home. But if there is no strong family support, it can disrupt their relationships at home. Even the closest families crumble because outside pressures are so relentless. To a certain extent, this was true for me when I was in junior high school. My rebellion was minor and never became a serious problem, though it caused friction for a while. Looking back, I see that it was a reflection of the confusion and sense of fragmentation I was going through, part of the process of finding out who I was. It was also the beginning of my independence. Everyone in our home shared the household chores. Mine were the usual ones, taking out the garbage and, after my sisters left home, washing the dishes and cleaning the stove. I also had to trim the hedges around the house. My father supervised the outside, while my mother's domain was inside the house. I hated chores and always tried to escape them pedaling away on my bike and leaving everything to Melvin. I often stayed away from home until late at night, even though I knew my parents would punish me when I returned. Sometimes I made up fancy stories to tell them, but nothing could save me from punishment. I preferred my mother's whippings. She was more gentle, but most of the time my father did it. Another responsibility I failed to carry out was a paper route I had for a time. 
I spent all the money I collected and could not pay the bill. When the people who had paid money did not receive their papers, I had to give it up. This kind of resistance was due in large part to the need to assert myself as a separate person, apart from my parents. I was beginning to want to make my own decisions. Often this independence took the form of avoiding responsibilities. At other times, it was more constructive. Ever since I can remember, I have hated to see anyone do without the things he needs. This attitude probably came from my father's influence and the ideas he expressed in church. Once, when I was about 15, I met a kid who had no food at home. This was one of those nights when I was staying out late and I brought him home and woke up my parents, rummaging through the kitchen cabinets. When I told them the boy and his family needed food, and that we could share ours, they did not object, although they were angry about my staying out late. Another time, when Melvin was going to San Jose State College, he needed a car but had no money. I had a small savings account, about $300, and I gave him all of it. My parents teased me about giving away all my money, but at bottom they were proud of this example of family closeness. Other times, though, I showed my sense of closeness in ways they did not approve of. Whenever my sister Myrtle got stranded at a party or somewhere else, she always called and asked me to pick her up. I would wait until my parents were asleep and then swipe the car keys. I did this every time she asked me, and every time I got into trouble for taking the car because I was not old enough to drive. My parents never spared the rod when I was young. As I grew older, they punished me in other ways, but I knew they did it because they cared about me and wanted me to develop a sense of responsibility. I think, too, they admired my inter independence, even though it sometimes worried them. They must have known I was at a difficult stage of development. Most black parents are very aware of the conflicting and bewildering influences that surround their children and they experience a deep anxiety over whether they will get into trouble with the law or at school. They understand only too well how the system works. The loving discipline exerted in our home was not lost on me, and when the time came, it stood me in good stead. End of chapter 5 Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 6 Introductory Quote We love our country, dearly love her, but she does not love us, she despises us. Martin Delaney, 1852 Section High School Throughout high school, I constantly did battle with the instructors. The clashes I had steadily intensified and finally led to my transfer out of the Oakland system for a while. In the 10th grade, I was attending Oakland Technical High School on Broadway and 41st. One day, the teacher sent me to the principal's office for a minor offense I had committed the day before. The principal and teacher agreed that I could come back if I said nothing in class for the rest of the semester. I had already decided that I wanted out of school entirely, but I tried to sit mutely in class and not violate any of the rules, such as chewing gum or eating sunflower seeds. One day I forgot the agreement and raised my hand to ask a question. The teacher blew up. Put your hand down, he said. I don't want to hear any more from you this whole term. I stood up and told him it was impossible to learn anything if I was forbidden to ask questions. 
Then I walked out of the class. Leaving school then meant I was short of classes and would be unable to go on to the 11th grade and graduate. So I went to live in Berkeley with my oldest sister, Myrtle, and transferred to Berkeley High School. Although Oakland was known in the East Bay area as a rough community, it was not until I transferred to Berkeley High School that real trouble started with the police. One Sunday, while walking over to a girl's house, I met four or five girls I knew. They asked me to go with them to a party. Although I did not take up their offer, we walked along together, since we were going to the same way. Pretty soon, a car pulled up carrying a guy named Mervyn Carter, he's dead now, and some others. They jumped out and began hassling me about messing with their girlfriends. I recognized Merv Carter. In fact, I had hung around Berkeley High with him and a couple of his friends. Like everybody else, they were turf conscious and hated to see an outsider making time with their girls. I reminded him that we knew each other, that I was not interfering with the girls, and was on my way somewhere else. Anyway, I said, we hang around together in school. He told me we were friends inside school, but not outside. I could not understand why he said that, whether he meant it or was just trying to impress his buddies. By that time, they had dropped a half circle on me. I realized they were going to jump me, so I hit Merv in the mouth, and then they all came at me. They beat me up pretty badly, but I refused to fall down. The girls were yelling at me to run, but I would not. No matter how many guys Merv had with him, I meant to stand my ground. As long as I could, I was going to look them in the eye and keep going forward. Somebody had called the police, but by the time they arrived, Carter and the others had gone, and I was there alone, bleeding and missing several teeth. Although the police tried to find out who did it, I would not tell them anything. I did not want to be an informer, because this was a problem between the brothers. The outside race authorities had nothing to do with it. I have always believed that to inform on someone to the teacher, to the principal, or to the police is wrong. These people represent another world, another racial group. To be white is to have power and authority, and for a black to say anything to them is a betrayal. So I did not inform, and they escaped the police, but they could not escape me. The next day, I went to school carrying a carpenter's hammer and an old pistol I had swiped from my father. The pistol did not work. It lacked a firing pin. But I had no intention of shooting anybody anyway. At lunchtime, I, quote, cold-trailed Merv and about six of his buddies downtown. Catching up with them finally, I started to swing on him with the hammer. I hit him several times, wanting to hurt him, but he rolled with most of the blows and was not too hurt bad, not hurt too badly. Meanwhile, I forgot I had the gun. When the others began picking up rocks and sticks, I remembered the gun and used it to keep them at bay. This was the only way I could defend myself, because I had no friends at Berkeley High School to help me. I could not let them get away with what they had done, particularly since they had falsely accused me of messing with their girlfriends. Somebody called the police again, and when I heard the sirens, I ran farther downtown, where I was arrested. I was only about 14 then, so they took me to Juvenile Hall, where I stood for a month while they investigated my family background. Then I was released to the custody of my parents. This was my first time into anything that could be called criminal, even though I had raided fruit trees, cracked parking meters, and helped myself to stuff in the neighborhood stores. 
I never looked upon that as stealing or doing anything illegal, however. To me, that was not taking things that did not belong to us, but getting something really ours, something owed to us. That, stealing, was merely retribution. When I was released from Juvenile Hall, Berkeley High School refused to admit me again because my parents lived in Oakland. I went back to Oakland Tech. My friends there and others who knew me praised what I had done in Berkeley. What I had done was an accepted action under the circumstances. If I had not retaliated, I would have been less respected. Things went along well at Oakland Tech for a change. I was able to handle my differences with the teachers a little better because of my satisfaction with life outside the classroom. My reputation as a fighter kept the wolves away. I was also known as a hipster like my brother Sonny Man, and I liked that too. Some of the kids even called me crazy, but that never bothered me, because they used to call my father that. To me, crazy was a positive identity. When I got my first car, it did a lot to help my crazy reputation. My father gave me one that had a lot of spots on it from primer paint. Melvin named it the Grey Roach. We would pile into it and go riding, looking for girls or some action. My friends did not like the way I drove, which led to any number of arguments and fights. Since there were so few cars available to joyride in, they had little choice. Sometimes I backed up as fast as I could down a whole block, and when we reached the corner, I would jam on the brakes. The guys would fall out of the car, yelling. Sometimes fights started right there. At railroad crossings, when the guardrail was down to signal an approaching train, I kept right on driving around the guardrail and over the tracks. I had several near misses, and as soon as we crossed the tracks, everyone would pile out of the car again, arguing and fighting. When the fights were over, our friendships were stronger than ever. They respected me, even though they thought I was crazy. I thought I could outmaneuver anybody, anything, and never passed up a chance to try. Since I always won, I soon believed that I could always defeat the invincible and the powerful, the way David defeated Goliath. Eventually, in my pride, I believed that I could outmaneuver death. I have never feared death. The escape from finitude was an idea that came to me after I saw the movie Black Orpheus. I loved that film and saw it many times, although I thought the outcome would have been different had it been my life. Whereas Orpheus flirted with death and died, I had been in lots of conflicts, near death on many occasions, but had always come out alive. Since I had not been killed, I guess I concluded that I could not be killed. Orpheus, too, attempts to outmaneuver death, even though the history of mankind proves that death always wins. In spite of this, the only way that Orpheus can maintain his dignity is to be unafraid and attempt to outmaneuver his oppressor. This seems characteristic of human existence. For although all of us are sentenced to death each day, we de try desperately to get away from it. If we cannot, we try to put it off by acting in a manner that discredits death and eliminates our fear of it. This is our victory. Black Orpheus demonstrates an even more profound truth. It is possible to circumvent death through the heritage that one generation passes on to another. At the end of the film, the little girl is dancing, while the little boy plays Orpheus's guitar. Though Orpheus and his woman are dead, her dance is a victory over death. 
the new generation survives, and the sun still rises. The world does not stop because death has crushed a beautiful and significant part of it. Orpheus had passed on his guitar to the little boy. This means of sustaining life raises the sun again. I held on to the idea that I was immune to death for a long time. I still do not fear the end, but I no longer believe that I cannot be killed. Life has taught me that it is an ever-present possibility. Too many of my comrades have died in the past few years to let me feel that my last day will never come. Even so, I tell the comrades, you can die only die once, so do not die a thousand times worrying about it. Around this time, some people got the notion that I had mystical powers. I began to put various friends and acquaintances into hypnotic trances, mostly at parties or in some of the rap sessions with brothers on the block. I learned the technique first from Melvin, who had been taught by Solomon Hill, a fellow student at Oakland City College. Later, I studied hypnosis techniques on my own and became pretty good at it. It is easy to learn, but dangerous. Just learning the technique does not teach you all you should know when you are dealing with a person's mind. You can easily hurt someone. I guess I have put over 200 people into trances at various times. I gave them post-hypnotic suggestions to eat grass, bark like a dog, or crawl over the floor like a baby and sometimes I stuck pins and needles into their flesh. Once, I used auto-hypnosis and put myself into a trance. When Melvin put a red-hot cigarette out, out on my arm, I did not move or feel any pain, although he burned me pretty badly. This incident impressed a lot of people, but Melvin was pretty upset about it. Far from using hypnosis in a destructive way, I used it for, quote, styling in the community. As my reputation grew, the novelty wore off, and finally I stopped, because it was no longer interesting. When I was not putting people into trances or racing around in the Grey Roach and drinking wine with the brothers, I was standing in a crowd of people at parties reciting poetry. My problem was that I could not dance, and when the music began, I felt self-conscious. If I did not leave when the dancing started, I would begin discussions or recite poetry. By the time I reached high school, I was really very good at remembering the poetry I had heard read aloud. Much of it was poetry that Melvin had taught me. David's favorite was The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Whenever I recited at parties or got people into deep conversations, everyone would stop dancing and gather around. <clears throat> Some of them would ask me to recite things I had memorized. <clears throat> the host or hostess usually became angry when people stopped dancing, and often I would be asked to sit down and shut up or split. This usually signaled the beginning of a fight. Somehow, I managed to stay in Oakland Tech until I graduated, despite my continued defiance of the authorities. They tried to down me for many years, but I knew inside that I was a good person, and the only way I could hold on to any self-esteem was to resist and defy them. Everything they opposed, I supported. That was how I first became a supporter of Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution. Earlier, when I heard teachers criticizing Paul Robeson, I defended him and believed in him, even though I knew very little about his life. When they started putting down Castro and the revolution of the Cuban people, I knew it must be good, too. I became an advocate of the Cuban revolution. My high school diploma was a farce. 
when my friends and I graduated, we were ill-equipped to function in society, except at the bottom, even though the system said we were educated. Maybe they knew what they were doing, preparing us for the trash heap of society, where we would have to work long hours for low wages. They never realized how much they had actually educated me by teaching me the necessity of resistance and the dignity of defiance. I was on my way to becoming a revolutionary. End of chapter 6 Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Part 2 I began to question what I had always taken for granted. Chapter 7 Introductory Quote I knew right there in prison that reading had changed forever the course of my life. As I see it today, the ability to read awoke inside me some long dormant craving to be mentally alive. My homemade education gave me, with every additional book I read, a little bit more sensitivity to the deafness, dumbness, and blindness that was affecting the black race in America. From the Autobiography of Malcolm X Section. Reading. <clears throat> By the time I had reached my last year of high school, I was functionally illiterate. Melvin was in college and doing very well. I felt that I could do it, too. But when I talked to a counselor about it, he made the mistake of telling me I was not college material. I set out to prove them wrong. First, I had to learn to read. The school authorities told me not only that I was not college material because of my performance in school, but also that I was not intelligent enough to do college work. According to the Stanford Binet test, I had an IQ of 74. They felt justified in discouraging me. I knew I could do anything I wanted to do. That was how I maintained my self-respect. I wanted to go to college so my defiance of their opinion, as well as my admiration for Melvin, were incentives for me to learn to read. I knew I would have to learn to read well in order to make it in college. I also knew that it would be difficult to find someone to teach me because I was embarrassed. I decided to teach myself. My key was the poetry I had learned to recite. I knew plenty of words, but could not yet recognize them in print. Using Melvin's poetry books, I began to study the poems I knew, associating the sounds in my head with the words on the page. Then I picked up Melvin's copy of Plato's Republic, bought a dictionary, and started learning to read things I did not already know. The Republic seemed a logical choice. I wanted to join Melvin and his friends in their intellectual conversations. It was a long and painful process, but I was determined. Lee Edward had taught me to look them in the eye and keep advancing. They said I was not college material, so I was advancing on them. I spent long hours every day at home going through the Republic and pronouncing the words I knew. If I did not know a word, I would look it up in the dictionary, learn how to sound it out if I could, and then learn the meaning. Proper names and Greek words were difficult, and I soon began to ignore them. Day after day, for eight or nine hours at a time, I worked on that book going over it page by page, word by word. I had no help from anyone because I did not want it. Embarrassment overwhelmed me. My mother loved reading and devoured books. Here I was, an adult who could not read, as my father, my mother, and Melvin could. <clears throat> I felt so low I stayed in my room where nobody could see what I was doing, poring over the words using the dictionary on every single line, 
and memorizing the sounds and the meanings. Once or twice, I asked Melvin to pronounce a word for me or explain it. He was shocked that I could not recognize some of them, and at first, I think, disgusted. That hurt. His disgust, his disgust could not compare with my own. He said that not knowing how to read was a very bad thing. But I knew that by then, and his disapproval made it even more difficult to learn. My sense of shame had kept me from seeking help earlier. Now it became impossible for me to ask. I had to do it by myself. It seems to me that nothing is more painful than a sense of shame that overwhelms you and afflicts the soul. This pain may not even be your fault, but it can still be very acute. It hurts more when you know that there is no natural process, as in the body, whereby the pain will go away. You have to relieve it with your own strength of will, your own discipline and determination. I had been hurt many times in fights, but nothing equaled the pain I felt at not being able to read. The pain from fighting went away in time. The shame I felt would not go away. I do not know how long it took me to go through Plato the first time, probably several months. When I finally finished, I started over again. I was not trying to deal with the ideas or concepts, just learning to recognize the words. I went through the book about eight or nine times before I felt I had mastered the material. Later on, I studied the Republic in college. By then, I was prepared for it. When I began to read, a whole new world opened to me. I became interested in books. I still could not read very well, but each new book made it easier. I did not mind spending many hours, because reading was enjoyment rather than work. When I reached this point, I accumulated books and read one after another. I did this all through my senior year in high school and the summer following. By the time I really knew my way through a book, I had graduated from high school. End of chapter 7 Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 8 Introductory Quote All my life I had been looking for something, and everywhere I turned someone was trying to tell me what it was. I accepted their answers, too though they were often in contradiction and even self-contradictory. I was naive. I was looking for myself and asking everyone except myself questions which I, and only I, could answer. It took me a long time and much painful boomeranging of my expectations to achieve a realization everyone else appears to have been born with, that I am nobody but myself. Ralph Ellison, The Invisible Man Section. Moving on. About two years before I completed high school, my inner life was plunged into a sea of confusion and turmoil that lasted until Bobby Seal and I organized the Black Panther Party. <clears throat> For four years, I went through the kind of pain that comes when you are letting go of old beliefs and certainties and have nothing to take their place. This distress had begun earlier and was a result of contrasting and varying elements in my life. As I matured physically, the problem seemed more insoluble. The strain became greater. I felt adrift. I began to question everything about my life. There seemed no haven of security in anything I was doing or hoped to do. I questioned my religious activities and my search for God. I questioned whether school was worth the effort. Most of all, I questioned what was happening in my own family and in the community around me. 
My father's struggle with bills was common in many of the families of my comrades. He had worked hard all his life, only to sink more deeply in debt. It seemed that no matter how hard he worked and sacrificed for his family, it led to more work. Things never became easier. I began to ask why this had happened to us and to everybody around us. Why could my father never get out of debt? If hard work brought success, why did we not see more success in the community? The people were certainly working hard. It seemed we were predestined to endless toil. We poor people have never never reached the point of having time to pursue the things we wanted. We had neither leisure time nor material goods. Not only did I want to know why this was so, I wanted to avoid a similar fate. <clears throat> While I was looking for answers to the questions of my family and religion, I was also thinking of joining a monastery, not so much out of religious conviction as for the isolation and time to examine these questions in peace. I felt the need to have a place where I could examine things without interference. Isolation would shield me from the troubles that were suffocating my father and my family. But I did not entertain the idea very seriously and soon gave it up. I began to think that Melvin's approach, through books, was one way to examine these questions. His life required a certain amount of detachment from the community, and that was attractive to me. On the other hand, there was my brother Sunny Man. For a long time, I had believed that he had the freedom I was seeking. He had possessions galore, no bills, and was defying the authorities and getting away with it. Even so, I came to the conclusion that he had not so much defied the authorities as compromised with them. All the hipsters with cars, clothes, and money had rejected the family relationship that I valued so highly. They had achieved a level of freedom at great personal cost. To me, this was not freedom, but another form of subjugation to the oppressor. Even if Sunny Man had escaped their control, his life did not answer my questions. It did not help me understand why most blacks never gained the freedom he seemed to have. I finally decided that Sunny Man and his comrades did not have the power to determine their destiny. <clears throat> they operated through someone else's power, the oppressors, and they were not free as long as they had to reject some part of themselves. The religious beliefs acquired in childhood also troubled me. After struggling through some of Socrates' works, as well as those of Aristotle, Hume, and Descartes, I began to question what I had always taken for granted. The ideas in the philosophical works that Melvin was studying spilled over into my confused mind. All the while, I felt damned. To question religion was a profane, heretical act that went against every moral tenet I had known at home. I identified very strongly with Stephen Dedalus in James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, because he went through a similar experience. He felt great guilt when he first questioned Catholicism, believing that he would be consumed by the fires of hell for his doubt. In a way, that is what happened to me. The struggle with religious faith is a difficult experience to describe because it involves many things that are either repressed earlier in life or not understood. In the process, the fears that are not related to religious beliefs are released. By then, you no longer have any protection from your religion, and you have to start dealing with your dread. The real world closes in on you, cutting off traditional comforts like a simple prayer. Eventually, you and you alone have to deal with troubling questions. This always leads to anxiety. There is nothing, 
so you are free and terrified. In a way, the turmoil and conflict I was experiencing were a kind of madness with no way out. The patterns that appealed to me as answers to my questions were closed to me. Sunny Man represented an attractive way of life, but it did not provide the answers I was seeking. Melvin was into another appealing pattern, but I had never been able to handle school effectively. I was confused. Sunny Man had an illusion of freedom. Melvin had an approach, but I could not read. Nobody had any answers for me. Sometimes I went one way, sometimes another. I never expressed these feelings to my parents. I had such respect and admiration for my father, who had done so much for us, that I could not openly question his life. He would not have understood what I was going through. I was grateful, I was appreciative, and I loved and admired him, but I had questions not easily answered. When my high school years came to an end, these doubts and troubles were at a high pitch. They were still with me when I started Oakland City College in the fall of 1959, and were reflected in the new way of life I was beginning. My lifestyle alarmed my parents. They must have sensed my inner turmoil because they began to object strenuously to certain things I was doing. It was the beatnik era in the Bay Area, and I grew a beard. To my parents, a beard meant a bohemian, and my father insisted I shave it off. I refused. Because he was accustomed to wielding total authority in our family, my refusal was a serious family violation. My father pressed me again to shave. I continued to resist. The climax came abruptly one night when he confronted me with an ultimatum to shave right then and there. I told him I would not do it. He struck me, and I ran to him, grabbing him with a bear hug to restrain his arms, and then pushing him out of the way. He chased me out of the house, but I could run much faster. I also knew that I was strong enough to overpower him, but I, I would never have done that. I just fled. My love for my father had clashed with a need for independence, symbolized by the beard. Knowing I could not return without shaving, I decided to move out. While my father was at work the next day, I packed my things and moved in with a friend. Richard Thorne. For years, a room was kept for me in my father's house, and periodically I returned home for short periods of time. Our differences mellowed and eventually disappeared. My room in my parents' house was not considered given up until 1968, when I was sentenced to prison. End of chapter 8. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 9 Introductory Quote Black is not only beautiful, it's bad, too. It's fast, classy, name-taken, and ass-kicking, too. Melvin Van Peebles Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death Section College and the Afro-American Association In 1959, when I started at Oakland City College, now Merritt College, it was a junior college located in North Oakland, surrounded by the black community. Many local black people attended it at that time, and I joined that crowd. College for me was more than books and lectures and classes, although they were important. For one thing, I never really left my neighborhood, and I still ran with the brothers on the block. Any money I had came from petty crime, an old pattern with me. This, however, 
became a time for making new friends and joining organizations that started me in new directions. One of my first friends at Oakland City College was Richard Thorne. Richard was a very tall, very black fellow who even then, prior to the Black Cultural Revolution, wore his hair in a natural. His appearance caused awe in some people and frightened others. He knew how to excite these feelings and how to exert an influence over those around him. I stayed with Richard for about a month after I left home, before I moved into Poor Boys Hall. Poor Boys Hall was behind a bookstore across from the college. The owners had converted a big storage warehouse into a dormitory with rooms. Not really rooms, but stalls, with thin plywood dividers. A stall rented for 15 bucks a month. I loved being around Poor Boys Hall because most of my friends among the rumors were young fellows just beginning to get their thing together. Like me, they were searching. Some of them have gone on to become a part of the system, while others have been further victimized. I kept up close contact with Richard Thorne, too and we spent a lot of time together at his apartment. Richard usually had several girls around and was always talking about the two or three books he intended to write. I was more interested in the girls. Richard had a theory about intimate human relations. He saw non-possessive love as pure love, the only love, and possessive love as a mockery of pure love. Non-possessive love did not enslave or constrain the love object. Richard was critical of what he called bourgeois love relationships, of the marriage system, and the requirements of the marriage partners to each other, i.e. sex with one partner, jealousy, limits upon mobility, well-defined roles based upon sex. He felt that people should not be like cars or houses. No man should own a wife nor should a wife own a husband, because ownership is predicated upon control, fences, barriers, constraints, and psychological tyranny. Non-possessive love is based upon shared experiences and friendship. It is the kind of love we have for our bodies, for our thumb and foot. We love ourselves, our bodies, but we do not want to enslave any part of ourselves. Richard and I engaged in some deep discussions. Sometimes we stayed at his house for days talking about the general situation, cursing the white man for everything and drinking wine. When I tired of these sessions, I made it down to the block to be with the Righteous Street Brothers. I was an angry young man at this time, drinking wine and fighting on the block, burglarizing homes in the Berkeley Hills and going to school at Oakland City College. I was moving away from family and church, which had offered me so much comfort in earlier days, and was looking for something new. The questions I asked during this period were so disturbing that I acted outrageously to drive them away. I was looking for something more tangible with which to identify. I saw all my turmoil in terms of racism and exploitation, and the obvious discrepancies between the haves and have-nots. I was trying to figure out how to avoid being crushed and losing respect for myself, how to keep from embracing the oppressor that had already maimed my family and community. In the discussions at Phi Beta Sigma, a social fraternity I joined for a while, I expressed my anger about society and white racism. The others told me that I sounded like a guy named Donald Warden, who was preaching blackness at the Berkeley campus of the University of California. He was the head of an organization called the Afro-American Association. I went to Berkeley to find Warden and hear what he was saying. 
The first member I met, though, was Maurice Dawson, one of Warden's tight partners. He turned me off with his arrogance. I had come searching for something, and he scorned me because I did not already know what I was seeking. I could not understand what he was saying about Afro-Americans. The term was new to me. Dawson really put me down. You know what an Afro-Cuban is? I answered yes. You know what an Afro-Brazilian is? Yes. Then why don't you know what an Afro-American is? It may have been apparent to him, but not to me. But I was still interested. Maurice taught me a lesson that I try to apply to the Black Panther Party today. I dissuade party members from putting down people who do not understand. Even people who are unenlightened and seemingly bourgeois should be answered in a polite way. Things should be explained to them as fully as possible. I was turned off by a person who did not want to talk to me because I was not important enough. Maurice just wanted to preach to the converted, who already agreed with him. I try to be cordial, because that way you win people over. You cannot win them over by drawing the line of demarcation, saying that you are on this side and I am on the other. That shows a lack of consciousness. After the Black Panther Party was formed, I nearly fell into this error. I could not understand why people were blind to what I saw so clearly. Then I realized that their understanding had to be developed. I started going to meetings of the Afro-American Association, whose purpose was mainly to develop a sense of pride among black people for their heritage, their history, and their contributions to culture and society. Donald Warden, a lawyer from the University of California, Berkeley, had started it. Most of the meetings were book discussion groups, which I enjoyed, because by then I was relating to books more and more. I began reading books about black people, and every Friday we sat up half the night discussing them. We read The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington, and The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. I was one of the first ten to join the organization. On Saturday afternoons, we would go into the black community in Oakland or San Francisco and speak on the street corners, running down the racist system. People came to listen because they were bored and wanted some entertainment, not because Warden's words were relevant to their lives. I started to bring more of the poor, uneducated brothers off the block into the association. Most of the people in the association were college students and very bourgeois, but my people were off the block. Some of them could not even read, but they were angry and looking for a way to channel their feelings. Warden was glad to have the Lumpen brothers along. He needed some strong-armed men who would just follow instructions without question. Some brothers and I formed a bodyguard for him. Sometimes our street meetings on Saturdays ended in fights, because white boys came around looking for trouble. That was when I began to see through Warden. My family thought that Warden was up to no good, and they were quite unhappy when I joined him. They said that he was interested only in building up his law practice, but I had to find that out for myself. My disillusionment began when I realized he would not stand his ground in a fight. Once, in a San Francisco meeting, some white guys yelled at us from a window and then came down to fight. I was throwing hands, trying to protect Warden, and when I looked up, he had run off, leaving us there by ourselves. My real decision to quit the group came after I observed Warden in a debating situation where his training and skill should have put him in a superior position. 
the Oakland Tribune ran an article reporting how the city council had made derogatory marks about the association. Warden wrote and asked to be placed on the agenda of their next meeting. About 20 of us went down to City Hall expecting Warden to take them to task. We were eighth on the agenda, and when our turn came, Mayor John Houlihan, who later went to jail for embezzlement, said that we could not speak then because some important people were there from Piedmont, an all-white upper-class area within the city limits of Oakland. Houlihan told us to wait until last, even though it was our turn on the agenda. I thought Warden would object, but no, he just bowed his head, and I, and I thought I saw him shuffle a little. After the Piedmont merchants made their presentation, Houlihan declared the agenda closed because there was time to consider only ten items. He told us to write the city council and say our piece. One of the councilmen insisted we be heard. However, since we had written to them in accordance with the rules and had been properly placed on the agenda, Don still had not taken a position. When he rose to speak, he started by saying we were there because the Tribune had reported some derogatory remarks made about us at the council's last meeting. He denied that the Afro-American Association wanted trouble. The association, he said, wanted to end, wanted an end to the lethargy of black people, to get them off welfare, make them clean themselves up, and sweep their streets in a big self-help effort. He said he wanted black people to stop lying around, collecting unemployment checks. That was when I decided that my parents were right about him. Afterward, the whole city council, including, including Mayor Houlihan, patted Warden on the back. He ate it up. In our own meetings, with no white people around, he really took them apart. But he had little interest in black people. He was interested in getting Barry Goldwater's daughter to contribute money to his sister's little sewing shop, which he claimed was a clothing factory. Goldwater's daughter became an honorary member of the Afro-American Association. I was really sick when I saw what went down before the city council. Warden talked about black folks as if we were a bunch of lazy people who hated ourselves and had no will to better our own situation. He said nothing about causes, although in that city council room he was speaking to some of the major causes of black people's suffering in the city of Oakland. Disillusioned, I left the organization, but not before I had gotten a lot out of it. For one thing, I had begun to learn about the black past, but I could not accept Warden's refusal to deal with the black present. He was obviously interested in building his law practice and routinely began street meetings by saying that he did not have to be there, that he was a Phi Beta Kappa and a lawyer. A lot of people who went to him for legal services found him out. They thought he would charge less money, being one of them, but he charged high fees. I went to him once, and he charged more than double the usual fee. Another attorney asked two fifty, but Warden wanted seven hundred and fifty dollars before he even stepped into the courtroom. He offered the community solutions that solved nothing. I could have accepted this if he had been ignorant, but I believe he knew what he was doing. At least he knew what the popular position was. That is why I tell the Black Panther Party that we must never take a stand just because it is popular. We must analyze the situation objectively and take the logically correct position, even though it may be unpopular. If we are right in the dialectics of the situation, our position will prevail. Warden was just the opposite. He rode the tide, even if it went against the community. He talked of a mass exodus to Africa and never believed in it. He maintained that capitalism in general 
and black capitalism in particular, was the best economic system. The only thing wrong with it, he said, was the racism in the system. He never spoke of the link between capitalist exploitation and racism. Wanting whites to believe that blacks were behind him, Warden talked up black power and black history, using the people to gain their support. Downtown, he looked for whites to support him out of their fear of organized blacks. Warden gathered the people around him to lead them like sheep. That is what he did at the city council. He is the only black man I know with two weekly radio programs and one on television. The mass media, the oppressors, give him public exposure for only one reason. He will lead the people away from the truth of their situation. Others also drifted away from the Afro-American Association. Richard Thorne was in it for a while, but he left to found the Sexual Freedom League. Later, he organized a spiritual cult called Om Eternal and changed his name to Om. He is now that cult's unquestioned high priest, God. Another member of the Afro-American Association at that time was a skinny, bright, and articulate fellow called Ron Everett. He went from the association to Watts in Los Angeles, where he established his own cultural nationalist group, US, which eventually became a cult. He called himself Karenga, the original. Later, the Black Panthers had some bitter confrontations with US, and they killed two of our finest comrades. Footnote. The Black Panther believes that Karenga's organization and the Los Angeles police conspired against Los Angeles Party or Los Angeles Party organizers, John Huggins and Alprentis Bunchy Carter, and assassinated them. The police wanted to stop the Black Panther's organizing efforts, and Karenga's organization wanted to curtail a competitive group and buy the friendship of police. End of chapter 9. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 10 Introductory Quote My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Langston Hughes, The Negro Speaks of Rivers Section Learning Life was opening up for me. I was trying to relate to Donald Warden and his program, trying to stay close with my righteous partners on the block, and also attending Oakland City College on a come-and-go basis. My motivation had been to prove to my high school teachers that they were wrong about me. To my surprise, I found myself enjoying the learning process and tremendously stimulated by ideas I encountered. Since I had studied classical piano for almost seven years, I took music appreciation, music history, music theory, and also art appreciation and art history. Most semesters I started out with a regular load, but if something came up in class that excited my imagination, I sometimes skipped classes, gathered as many books and materials as I could find on the subject, and stayed in the library or at home in my apartment reading. While studying psychology, for example, I became fascinated with the principle of stimulus response and the biological behaviorism of John B. Watson. I read a number of books on the subject, works by B.F. Skinner and Pavlov, and read about their studies and theories of personality and human development. By the time I was satiated with stimulus response, or whatever, the class had moved on to another unit that was of no interest to me. Philosophy was another favorite subject. I still remember some of the issues raised in logic class 13 years ago. Such points as the difference between lexical and stipulative definitions I use in discussions today. 
Even now, I find it difficult to enter into a dialogue on philosophy or Black Panther ideology until there is agreement on basic definitions. This presents problems when I speak on college campuses. I try to lead an audience into rational and logical discussions, but many students are looking for rhetoric and phrase-mongering. They either do not want to learn or do not believe that I can think. I was also impressed with A.J. Ayer's logical positivism, particularly his distinction between three kinds of statements, the analytical statement, the synthetic statement, and the statements of assumption. These ideas have helped me to develop my own thinking and ideology. Ayer once stated, nothing can be re real if it cannot be conceptualized, articulated, and shared. That notion stuck with me and became very important when I began to use the ideological method of dialectical materialism as a worldview. The ideology of the Black Panther stands on that premise and proceeds on that basis to conceptualize, articulate, and share. Some key aspects of Black Panther ideology and rhetoric, like all power to the people and the concept pig, developed out of that. They were not haphazardly introduced into our thinking or vocabulary. While studying philosophy, I realized that I had been moving for some time towards existentialism. I read Camus, Sartre, and Kierkegaard, and saw that their teachings were similar to lessons I have learned from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. Actually, the, quote, preacher was the first existentialist. Quote, all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous, and to the wicked, to the good, and to the clean, and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth, and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth, as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live, and after they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all living there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. I returned, and saw under the sun, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. From then on, I began to engage friends in existentialist discussions. If a brother was hungry, I would say that it is all the same whether you are hungry or full, whether you are cold or warm, it is all the same. They really thought I was crazy. Then I began living like an existentialist, hitchhiking to Los Angeles and back, walking into the class dirty without shoes, and sometimes soaked to the skin from the rain. It was all the same to me. One way or another, I kept my reputation going. All the time I was on the streets, I read Ecclesiastes at least once a month, until I was sentenced to the penitentiary, where they refused me all reading material. I was still questioning. Although college work did not give me answers as such, I was beginning to comprehend human beings and the universe, to feel I could develop answers that suited my own experience and my knowledge of the world. Then, too, I was convincing myself that they had been wrong about me in public schools. When that teacher told me to write business on the board, she wanted to show the class that I was stupid. When they discouraged me from going to college, it was because they thought I was stupid. As a matter of fact, some of my college teachers thought I was stupid too, because I never did well on those silly little tests they gave us. 
One psychology teacher told me that I scored at the level of a dull normal on an IQ test. Since I really liked this teacher, that hurt me badly. Then he gave another test, which he said indicated that I was intelligent. Only I knew what was happening inside of me. Only I knew what was happening between me and those books up in my apartment. I was learning and learning well. I could think, I could read, and I could retain the most difficult ideas. For over 12 years, they had tried to knock me down, but I kept getting up, and now I was advancing on them. What I learned from Sunny Man also helped me to acquire an education. I was free to pursue my education in my own style, because I could support myself with activities on the block. Most important, I did not have to work. I ran gambling sessions at my apartment, serving as the houseman. This meant that I set up the games, cards or craps, for everybody else to participate in, and then took a cut of the winnings. It was my studying and reading in college that led me to become a socialist. The transformation from a nationalist to a socialist was a slow one, although I was around a lot of Marxists. I even attended a few meetings of the Progressive Labor Party, but nothing was happening there, just a lot of talk and dogmatism, unrelated to the world I knew. I supported Castro all the way. I even accepted an invitation to visit Cuba and recruited others for the trip, but I never made it. When I presented my solutions to the problems of black people, or when I expressed my philosophy, people said, well, isn't that socialism? Some of them were using the socialist label to put me down, but I figured that if this was socialism, then socialism must be a correct view. So I read more of the works of the socialists and began to see a strong similarity between my beliefs and theirs. My conversion was complete when I read the four volumes of Mao Zedong to learn more about the Chinese Revolution. It was my life plus independent reading that made me a socialist, nothing else. I became convinced of the benefits of collectivism and a collectivist ideology. I also saw the link between racism and the economics of capitalism. Although, despite the link, I recognized that it was necessary to separate the concepts in analyzing the general situation. In psychological terms, racism could continue to exist even after the economic problems that had created racism had been resolved. Never convinced that destroying capitalism would automatically destroy racism. I felt, however, that we could not destroy racism without wiping out its economic foundation. It was necessary to think much more creatively and independently about these complex interconnections. Even though I liked my lectures and the discussions, I did not identify with the lifestyle on campus. As soon as I finished my classes, I would go down to the block, sometimes to Sacramento Street in Berkeley or over into West or East Oakland, and drink wine, gamble, and fight. More than once, I came from the block to class dead drunk. I never minded being drunk in class because the ideas were more intoxicating. But I had instructors who hated having anyone go to the bathroom while they were lecturing. It disturbed them. But when you are full of wine, you just cannot hold your urine. College was enjoyable, largely because I was not forced to go. This made it different from high school. I could go to school or stay in my apartment and read. Some days I went to a movie or stayed on the block. I started each semester setting my own pace, which often included a trip to Mexico or to jail or dropping out, and all along I learned a great deal.
In spite of the learning, I was still searching for answers to other questions. The Afro-American Association had been a deep disappointment. I had often felt that it was nothing more than a training ground for the Muslims. Warden seemed to have adopted a lot of their styles and rhetoric. I began to investigate them more closely. I had read C. Eric Lincoln's book, Black Muslims in America, but what attracted me most was Minister Malcolm X. I first heard Malcolm X speak at McClyman's High School in Oakland when he attended a conference sponsored by the Afro-American Association on the mind of the ghetto. Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, was with Malcolm, and he told about his conversion to Islam. He was not yet the heavyweight champion. Malcolm X impressed me with his logic and with his disciplined and dedicated mind. He was a man who combined the world of the streets and the world of the scholar, a man so widely read he could give better lectures and cite more evidence than many college professors. He was also practical. Dressed in the loose-fitting style of a strong prison man, he knew what the street brothers were like, and he knew what had to be done to reach them. Malcolm had a program, armed defense when attacked, and reaching the people with ideas and programs that speak to their condition. At the same time, he identified the causes of their condition instead of blaming the people. I started going to the Muslim mosques in both Oakland and San Francisco, although not regularly. However, I knew a number of Muslims and talked to them fairly often. I did read their paper regularly to follow the speeches and the ideas of Malcolm. I would have joined them, but I could not deal with their religion. By this time, I had had enough of religion and could not bring myself to adopt another one. I needed a more concrete understanding of social conditions. References to God or Allah did not satisfy my stubborn questioning. Back at the college, Kenny Freeman, along with Isaac Moore, Doug Allen, Ernie Allen, Alex Papillon, and some, other, and some others had begun to organize the West Coast branch of RAM, the Revolutionary Action Movement. They claimed to function as an underground movement, but instead of revolutionary action, they indulged in a lot of revolutionary talk, none of it underground. They were all college students with bourgeois skills who wrote a lot. Eventually, they became so infiltrated with agents that when an arrest was made, the police spent all their time showing each other their badges. Bobby Seal tried to get me into the RAM chapter, but the members refused to accept me. They said I lived in the Oakland Hills and was too bourgeois, which was an absolute lie. All my life, I have lived in the flatlands. Actually, I think I threatened them because I could use my head, but could also get down like the Street Brothers. They claimed to be dedicated to the armed overthrow of the government, when in reality, most of them were headed for professional occupations within the system. Freeman and the other RAM members eventually excluded Bobby because he lacked bourgeois skills. RAM formed a front group on campus, the Seoul Students Advisory Council, and Kenny Freeman stacked it with his boys. I became very active in it, joining the main thrust to get a course in Negro history into the curriculum. We held street meetings outside the college and met with the administrators, who offered foolish reasons about why Negro history should not be offered. Most of them came down to the belief that black people had no history to teach. We eventually brought about a few changes, not many, and for a short while Ram seemed very engaging to me. I considered that the answer to many things I was searching for, and felt fulfilled when I talked with others about the African past and what we had contributed to the world. 
all the groups I went through that had that in common. Everyone, from Warden and the Afro-American Association, to Malcolm X and the Muslims, to all the other groups active in the Bay Area at that time, believed strongly that the failure to include black history in the college curriculum was a scandal. We all set out to do something about it. The Seoul Students Advisory Council lacked any real depth, and when we succeeded in getting the black history class on campus, we had nothing else to do. There were the usual parties and other social activities, but these had no real meaning for me and provided no satisfaction. End of chapter 10. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Chapter 11. Introductory Quote. As for the future, the young street corner man has a fairly good picture of it. It is a future in which everything is uncertain except the ultimate destruction of his hopes and the eventual realization of his fears. The most he can reasonably look forward to is that these things do not come too soon. Elliot Libo, Tally's Corner Section Brothers on the Block Nothing we had done on the campus related to the conditions of the Brothers on the Block. Nothing helped them to gain a better understanding of those conditions. As I saw so many of my friends on their way to becoming dropouts from the human family, I wanted to see something good happen to them. They were getting married and beginning to have babies. Ahead of them were the rounds of jobs and bills my father had gone through. It was almost like being on an urban plantation, a kind of modern-day sharecropping. You worked hard, brought in your crop, and you are always in debt to the landholder. The Oakland brothers worked hard and brought in a salary, but they were still in perpetual debt to the stores that provided them with the necessities of life. The Seoul Students' Advisory Council, RAM, the Muslims, and the Afro-American Association were not offering these brothers and sisters anything concrete, much less a program to help them move against the system. It was agonizing to watch the brothers move down those dead-end streets. The street brothers were important to me, and I could not turn away from the life I shared with them. There was in them an intransigent hostility towards all those sources of authority that had such a dehumanizing effect on the community. In school, the, quote, system was the teacher, but on the block, the system was everything that was not a positive part of the community. My comrades on the block continued to resist that authority, and I felt that I could not let college pull me away no matter how attractive education was. These brothers had the sense of harmony and communion I needed to maintain that part of myself not totally crushed by the schools and other authorities. At Oakland City College, many of the blacks were working as hard as they could to become part of the system. I could not relate to their goals. These brothers still believed in making it in the world. They talked about it loud and long, expressing a desire for families, houses, cars, and so forth. Even at that time, I did not want those things. I wanted freedom, and possessions meant non-freedom to me. It was a complex scene. Sunny Man was involved only with the brothers who did not go to college. His friends who had gone to college were estranged from him. Some of his closest running partners in high school moved away from him after they went to college, and he stayed on the block. Now that I was also in college, I did not want to move away from the Street Brothers, as Walter's friends had done. That is why when I was not studying or in class, I was down on the block with the Righteous Brothers.
I think one of the reasons why I, in particular, had so many fights was because I weighed only about 130 pounds. You got a lot of prestige from being able to fight the hefty guys who first gained their reputation by downing lightweights like me. There were not many others as small as I was who looked the big ones in the eye. I had an added disadvantage. All the way through school, my baby face made people think I was younger than I was. I resented being treated like a baby, and to show them I was as bad as they were, I would fight at the drop of a hat. As soon as I saw a dude rearing up, I struck him before he struck me, but only when there was going to be a fight anyway. I struck first, because a fight usually did not last very long, and nine times out of ten, the winner was the one who got in the first lick. Sunny Man was very good with his hands, and he taught me how to hit hard in spite of my light weight. Most of the other guys really did not know how to hit, so I always fired first and knocked them out, or at least knocked out a tooth or closed up an eye. Finally, I got a reputation as a bad dude, and I did not have to fight as much. Every once in a while, however, one of the, quote, tush hogs, our name for a bad, tough street fighter on the block, would challenge me. After the fight, we usually became really good friends, because he would realize that my features were deceiving. Sometimes I got into teaching on the block, reciting poetry or starting dialogues about philosophical ideas. I talked to the brothers about things that Hume, Pierce, Locke, or William James had said, and in that way I retained ideas and sometimes revolved, resolved problems in my own mind. These thinkers had used the scientific method by applying their ideas to particular formulas. They excluded those things that did not fit into their formulas. I explained this to the brothers, and we talked about such questions as the existence of God, self-determination, and free will. I would ask them, do you have free will? Yes. Do you believe in God? Yes. Is your God all-powerful? Yes. Is he omniscient? Yes. Therefore, I told them, their all-powerful God knew everything before it happened. If so, I would ask, how can you say that you have free will when he knows what you are going to do before you do it? You are predestined to do what you do. If not, then your God has lied or he has made a mistake. And you have already said that your God cannot lie or make a mistake. These dilemmas led to arguments that lasted all day, over a fifth of wine. They cleared my thinking, even though I sometimes went to school drunk. Some of the brothers thought I was a pedant, putting them down. Fights started occasionally over an imaginary insult, especially with newcomers to the group, who did not know me or my relationship to the brothers. I liked talking about ideas, and Street Brothers were the only ones I wanted to be with at the time, because I liked the things we were doing. Standing on the corner, meeting people, watching the women, and relating to those who struggled for survival on the block. Rap sessions like this took place all over, in cars parked in front of the liquor store on Sacramento Street, near Ashby and Berkeley outside places where parties were being held, and sometimes inside. I told them about the allegory of the cave from Plato's Republic, and they enjoyed it. We called it the story of the cave prisoners. In the cave allegory, Plato describes the plight of the prisoners in a cave who receive their impression of the outside world from shadows projected on the wall by the fire at the mouth of the cave. One of the prisoners is freed and gets a view of the outside world, objective reality. 
he returns to the cave to tell the others that the scenes they observe on the wall are not reality, but only a distorted reflection of it. The prisoners tell the liberated man he is crazy, and he cannot convince them. He tried to take one of them outside, but the prisoner is terrified at the thought of facing something new. When he is dragged outside the cave anyway, he sees the sun and is blinded by it. The allegory seemed very appropriate to our own situation in society. We too were in prison and needed to be liberated in order to distinguish between truth and the falsehoods imposed on us. The dudes on the block still thought I was, quote, out of sight and sometimes just plain crazy. One of the reasons for the crazy label was because I always did the unexpected, a valuable practice in keeping your adversary off balance. If I knew that some guys wanted to jump on me, I would go where they hung out, just show up by myself, and challenge them right on the spot. Many times they were too shocked to do much about it. This street philosophy also crept into my academic work. The brothers were hostile toward the police because they were always brutalizing and intimidating us. So I began to study police science in school to learn more about the thinking of the police and how to outmaneuver them. I learned how they conducted investigations. I also began to study law. My mother had always urged me to do this, even in high school, because I was good at arguing points, and she thought I would be a good lawyer. I studied law, first at City College and later at San Francisco Law School in San Francisco. Not so much to become a lawyer, but to be able to deal with the police. I was doing the unexpected. One day, in 1965, as I was walking across Grove Street to the college, I saw a white man swide swipe a brother's car. A motorcycle cop came up and the two drivers entered into an argument over who was wrong. The cop was about to write a ticket for the brother. I had been standing there with the other people watching this incident, and I walked over to the white man and told him that he was wrong. Angry at this, the cop told me to be quiet because I was not involved. I came back at him and told him that I was involved because I knew how he treated people on the block. The fact that he had a gun, I said, did not give him the right to intimidate me. The gun did not mean anything because the people were going to get guns of their own and take away the guns of the police. I ran these things down to him in front of all the people. That was the first time I stood a policeman down. End of chapter 11. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 12 Introductory Paragraph What is property? Property is theft. Pierre Joseph Proudhon, 1840 The brigand is the true and only revolutionary. Bakunin, 1870 Section Scoring. I first studied law to become a better burglar. Figuring I might get busted at any time, and wanting to be ready when it happened, I bought some books on criminal law and burglary and felony, and looked up as much as possible. I tried to find out what kind of evidence they needed, what things were actually considered violations of the law, what the loopholes were, and what you could do to avoid being charged at all. It had a law for everything. I studied the California Penal Code in books like California Criminal Evidence and California Criminal Law by Frick and Alarkin, concentrating on those areas that were somewhat vague. The California Penal Code says that any law which is vague to the ordinary citizen, the average reasonable man who lives in California, and who is exposed to the state's rules, regulations, and culture, 
does not qualify as a statute. Later on, law enforcement courses helped me know how to deal with the police. Before I took criminal evidence in school, I had no idea what my rights really were. I did not know, for instance, that police can be arrested. My studying helped, because every time I got arrested, I was released with no charge. Until I went to prison for something I was innocent of, I had no convictions against me. Yet I had done a little of everything. The court would convict you if it could, but if you knew the law and were articulate, then the judges figured you were not too bad because of your very manner of speaking that indicated that you had been indoctrinated into their way of thinking. I was doing a lot of things that were technically unlawful. Sometimes my friends and I received stolen bank checks from a company, which we would then make out for 150 to 200 never more than an amount consistent with a weekly paycheck. Sometimes we stole the checks ourselves. Other times we bought them from guys who had stolen them. You had to do this fast before the companies distributed check numbers to banks and stores. We burglarized homes in the Oakland and Berkeley Hills in broad daylight. Sometimes we borrowed a pickup truck and put a lawnmower or garden tools in it. Then we drove up to a house that appeared empty and rang the bell. If no one answered, we rolled the lawnmower around to the back as if we planned to cut the grass and trim the hedges. Then swiftly we broke into the house and took what we wanted. Often, I went car prowling by myself. I would walk the streets until I saw a good prospect, then break into the car and take what was on the seat or in the glove compartment. Many people left their cars unlocked, which made it easier. We scored best, however, with the credit game or short change games. We stole or bought stolen credit cards and then purchased as much as possible with them before their numbers were distributed. You could either sell the booty or use it yourself. A very profitable credit game went like this. We would pay 20 or 30 bucks to someone who owned a small business to say that we had worked for him for five years or so. This established a work record good enough for credit in one of the big stores. Then we would charge about $150 with a merchandise and pay 20 down. Of course, we used an assumed name and a phony address, but we let them check the address because we gave them a location and telephone number where one of our friends lived. We made payments for a couple of months. Then we would charge over the $150 limit. If you were making payments, they raised your credit. We would buy a big order and then stop making payments. If they called our place of work, they were told we had just quit. If they called our alleged address, they learned we had, quote, moved over a month ago and the store was left hanging. They did not really lose because they were actually robbing the community blind. They just wrote off the amount and continued their robbing. The lesson? You can survive through petty crime and hurt those who hurt you. Once into petty crime, I stopped fighting. I had transferred the conflict, the aggression, and hostility from the brothers into in the community to the establishment. The most successful game I ran was the short change game. Short changing was an art I developed so well that I could make 50 to 60 bucks a day. I ran it everywhere, in small and large stores, and even on bank tellers. In the short change game, I would go into a store with five $1 bills, ask the clerk for change, 
and walk out with a $10 bill. This was the $5 to $10 short change. You could also do a $10 to $20 short change by walking into the store with 10 $1 bills and coming out with a $20 bill. The $5 to $10 short change worked this way. You folded up the four, four of the bills into a tight, small tight wad. Then you bought something like candy or gum with the other bill so that the clerk had to open the cash register to give you change. I always stood a little distance from the register so that the clerk had to come to me to give me the change. You have to get the cash register open and get the clerk to move away from it so that his mind is taken off what he has in the register. When he brought my change from the candy, I handed him the wad of four $1 bills and said, here are five singles. Will you give me a $5 bill for them? He would then hand me the $5 bill before he realized that there were only four singles in the wad. He has the register open, and I am prepared for him to discover the error. When he did, I would then hand him another single, but also the $5 bill he had given me, and say, Well, here's six more. Give me a ten. He would do it, and I would take the ten, and be gone before he had realized what happened. Most of the time, they never understood. It happened so fast, they would simply go on to another customer. By the time things began to click in their minds, they could never be sure that something had in fact gone wrong until the end of the day when they tallied up the register. By that time, it was, I was just a vague memory. Of course, if the clerk was quick and sensed that something was not right, then I pretended to be confused and would say I made, had made a mistake and give him the right amount. It was a pretty safe game, and it worked for me many times. The brother who introduced me to shortchanging eventually became a Muslim. But before that, he taught me to burglarize cars parked by the emergency entrances of the hospitals. People would come to the hospital in a rush and leave their cars unlocked with valuables in the open. I never scored on blacks under any condition, but scoring on whites was a strike against injustice. Whenever I had liberated enough cash to give me a stretch of time, I stayed home reading books like Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, The Devils, and The House of the Dead, The Trial by Franz Kafka, and Thomas Wolfe's Look Homeward, Angel. I read and reread Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, the story of Jean Valjean, a Frenchman who spent 30 years in prison for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his hungry family. This really reached me because I identified with Valjean, and I often thought of my father being in a kind of social prison because he wanted to feed his family. Albert Camus the Stranger and The Myth of Sisyphus made me feel even more justified in my pattern of liberating property from the oppressor as an antidote to social suicide. I felt that white people were criminals because they, they plundered the world. It was more, however, than a simple anti-white feeling, because I never wanted to hurt poor whites even though I had met some in school who called me nigger and other names. I fought them, but I never took their lunches or money because I knew they had nothing to start with. With those who had money, it was a different story. I still equated having money with whiteness, and to take what was mine and with what the white criminals called theirs gave me a feeling of real freedom. I even bragged to my friends how, I go how good I felt about the whole matter. When they were at my apartment during times when there wasn't any food to eat, I told them that even though I starved, 
My time was my own, and I could do anything I wanted with it. I didn't have a car then, because most of my money was spent on the apartment, food, and clothes. When friends asked me why I did not get a car, I told them it was because I did not want bills, and that a car was not my main goal or desire. My purpose was to have as much leisure time as possible. I could have pulled bigger jobs and gotten more, but I did not want any status symbols. I wanted most of all to be free from the life of a servant forced to take those low-paying jobs and looked at with scorn by white bosses. Eventually, I got caught, and more than once. But by then, I had developed a, good, a fairly good working knowledge of the law, and I decided to defend myself. Although no skilled legal technician, I could make a good defense. If you are an existentialist, defending yourself is another manifestation of freedom. When you are brought into the courts of the establishment, you can show your contempt for them. Most defendants want to get high-priced counsel or use the state to speak for them through the public defender. If you speak for yourself, you can say exactly what you want, or at least not say what you do not want to. Or you can laugh at them. As Elaine Brown, a member of the Black Panther Party, says in her song, The End of Silence, quote, You laugh at laws passed by a silent lot that tell you to give thanks for what you've already got. End of quote. The laws exist to defend those who possess property. They protect the possessors who should share, but who do not. By defending myself, I showed my contempt for that structure. It gave me real pleasure to defend myself. I never thought in terms of conviction or acquittal, although it was an added treat to escape their net. But even a conviction would not have dismayed me, because at least I had the opportunity to laugh at them and show my contempt. They would see that I was not intimidated enough to raise the money to get counsel, money that I did not have in the first place, or to accept a public defender. I especially liked traffic violations. For a while, I paid a lot of traffic tickets. When I became my own defender, I never paid another one. Of the three major cases in which I defended myself, the only one I lost was the one in which I was innocent. Once, I was indicted on 16 counts of burglary through trickery as a result of the shortchange game. And I beat the cases during the pretrial period because the police could not establish the corpus delecti, or the elements of the case. Each law had a body of elements, and each element has to be violated in order for a crime to have been committed. That's what they call the corpus delecti. People think that the term means physical body but it really means the body of elements. For example, according to California law, in order to commit an armed robbery, you have to be armed, and you must expropriate through fear or force related to weapons. You can have armed robbery without any bullets in the gun. The elements of the case relate to fear and force in connection with weapons. In the short change, or Bunko case, I was confused of running my game in 16 stores. However, they could only get a few people to say they were short in their registers. I was really saved from being convicted because the police tried to get a young woman teller from a bank to say that I had shortchanged her. A lot of people would not admit they have been shortchanged. In the pretrial, in which they were trying to get a federal case, they asked me whether I had gone into the bank. I refused to admit it. 
I knew that the young woman whom they wanted to testify against me had not shown up at court. When I bailed out, I went to her bank and asked, if her, asked her if the police had been there. She said they had, and that they were trying to persuade her that I had shortchanged her. She said she would not testify because she knew it had not happened. I invited her to court to testify on my behalf. She came and explained to the judge that the police had tried to persuade her to testify, but she would not comply. My argument was that the police had invented the shortchange rap against me. I pointed out that clerks who were shortchanged would have missed the money either when I was in the store or at the end of the day. None of these people had notified the police. The police had sought them out, and by suggesting that they had been shortchanged, were really offering the clerks a chance to make five or ten extra dollars, a sort of payoff for testifying. Most people, I said, are not as honest as the young girl bank teller. Another argument I put forth in my defense was that if someone else had gotten change after I had been in the store before inventory of the register, it was quite possible, even probable, that the money had been lost at some other time. I got a dismissal on the grounds of insufficient evidence. In the second major case, I was accused of having stolen some books from a store near the school and of having burglarized the car of another student and taken his books. He reported to the bookstore that his books had been stolen. They were on the lookout for books with the marking he had described. I had not stolen the books, even though they were in my possession. I was doing a lot of gambling at the time and some students who owed me money gave me the books instead. We used books for money, because if a book was required in a course, we could sell it to the bookstore. Even though I did not know where the books came from, I suspected that they were stolen. I figured there was about $60 worth of books in the stack. When I needed money, I sent my cousin to the bookstore to cash them in. The bookstore took them away from her, claiming that they were stolen. They would not give her any money, nor would they return the books. I went down to the store and told them they could not confiscate my books without due process of the law. They knew I was a student at the college and that they could call the police on me any time they wanted. I told them that either they returned the books right then, or I would take as many books as I thought would equal the amount they had stolen from me. They gave me the books, and I went on to class. Apparently, the bookstore notified the dean of students, who called the police. While I was in class, the Oakland police came and escorted me with the books to the campus police, who took me to the dean's office. No one could arrest me because there was no warrant. The bookstore wanted to wait until the man who had reported the books stolen returned from the army to identify them. So they took me to the dean's office, and the dean said he would give me a receipt, keeping the books until the owner came back. I told him that he would not give me a receipt because they were my books, and he could not confiscate my property without due process of law. To do so would be a violation of my constitutional rights. I added, Furthermore, if you try to confiscate my property, I will ask the police over there to have you arrested. The police stood looking stupid, not knowing what to do. The dean said the man would not be back for about a week, but he wanted the books. I took the books off his desk and said, I'm enrolled here and when you want to talk to me, I'll be around. Then I walked out of the office. They did not know how to deal with a poor, oppressed black man who knew their law and had dignity.
When I was charged and brought to trial, I defended myself again. The case revolved around identifying the books. The man knew that his books had been stolen. The bookstore knew that they had lost some books. Identification had not been made, but I was charged with a theft. I had stashed the books away so that nobody could locate them, and when I came to court, I left them behind. They brought me to trial without any factual evidence against me, and I beat the case with the defense I conducted, particularly my cross-examination. The woman who owned the bookstore took the stand. The previous year, on Christmas Eve, she had invited me to her home, and I had seen her off and on after that. When I was unwilling to continue a relationship with her, she became angry. I wanted to bring this out, but when I began this line of questioning, the judge was outraged and stopped it. By this time, however, she had broken down in tears on the stand, and it was apparent to the jury by the questions I asked and her reaction to them that she had personal reasons for testifying against me. When the dean testified, I really went to work. Although no books were entered into evidence, he said that I had in my possession some books identical to those on the list the day the police brought me into his office. I asked him, Well, if the police were right there, why didn't you put me under arrest? He said, I wasn't sure of my rights. This was the opening I needed. I said, you mean to say that I attend your school and you're teaching me my rights without even knowing your own? You're giving me knowledge and you don't know your basic civil rights? Then I turned to the jury and argued that this was strange indeed. The judge was furious and almost cited me for contempt of court. I was in contempt, all right, and not only of the court. I was contemptuous of the whole system of exploitation, which I was coming to understand better and better. I knew what the jury was thinking, and when the dean said that he did not know his rights, I used his ignorance to my advantage. People automatically think, you mean you're a college professor and you don't know something that simple and basic? Once I planted this idea in the minds of the jurors, it completely negated the dean's testimony. I told the jury that I collected books, which I did, traded and sold them, and that I had some volumes similar to those named in the indictment, same names, authors, and so forth. When they wanted to view the books, I asked the judge if I could go home and get them. The judge said that he could not stop a trial in the middle, it was a misdemeanor case, to let me go home. My strategy worked. However, I ended up with a hung jury. Then came the second trial. This time I had the books in court, but nobody could identify them. I had acquired some different books, same authors and same names, and put some similar markings in them. The man who claimed his car had been burglarized, the dean, and the owner of the bookstore could not positively identify them. They kept saying that the books were either similar or the same, but they were not sure. I emphasized this uncertainty saying that all I knew was that I had purchased the books from another person. I told the jury that I had not, in fact, stolen the books, and that by bringing them to court, I was trying to find out if they belonged to those who had brought the charges. I got another hung jury. They tried me a third time, and with the same result. When they brought the case up a fourth time, the judge dismissed it dismissed it. Off and on, with continuances and mistrials, the case dragged over a period of nine months. 
It was simple harassment, as far as I was concerned, because I had not stolen the books. They might also have been trying to test new prosecutors. I had a different one every time. Every chump in Alameda County. And still they got nowhere. I looked them straight in the eye and advanced. The third case came out of a party I attended with Melvin at the home of a probation officer who had gone to San Jose State College with him. Melvin had known some of the people at the party quite a while, and most of them were related to each other in some way, either by blood or by marriage. Melvin and I were outsiders. As usual, I started a discussion. A party was good or bad for me, depending on whether I could start a rap session. I taught that way for the Afro-American Association and recruited a lot of lumpen. Some of these sessions ended in fights. It, it was almost like the dozens again, although here, ideas, not mothers, were at, were at issue. The guy who could ask the most penetrating questions and give the smartest answers capped or topped all the others. Sometimes, after a guy was defeated or shot down, if he wanted to fight, I would accommodate him. It was all the same. If I could get into a good rap and a good fight, too, the night was complete. At the party, while we were talking, someone called Odell Lee came up and entered the conversation. I did not know him, but had only seen him dancing earlier in the evening, but I had gone to school with his wife, Margot, who was there. Odell Lee walked up and said, you must be an Afro-American. I replied, I don't know what you mean. Are you asking me if I'm of African descent? Or are you asking me if I'm a member of Donald Warden's Afro-American Association? If the latter, then I am not. But if you're asking me if I'm of African ancestry, ancestry then I am an Afro-American, just as you are. He said some words in Chinese, and I came back in Swahili. Then he asked me, well, how do you know that I'm an Afro-American? I replied, well, I have 20-20 vision, and I can see your hair is just as kinky as mine, and your face just as black, so I conclude that you must be exactly what I am, an Afro-American. Saying that, I turned back and began to cut my steak. I was the only one in the room with a steak knife. All the others had plastic utensils, but since the steak was kind of tough, I had gone into the kitchen for a regular steak knife. Having made my point, my move, so to speak, I turned my back on Lee in a kind of put-down. To him, it was a provocative act. Odell had a scar on his face from just about the ear to just below his chin. This was a very significant point, because on the block you run into plenty of guys with scars like that, which usually means that the person has seen a lot of action with knives. This is not always the case, but when you are trying to survive on the block, you learn to be hip to the cues. So I turned my back and began cutting steak with the knife I had in my right hand. He grabbed my left arm with his right and turned me around abruptly. When he did, my knife was pointed right at him in ready position. Lee said, don't turn your back on me when I'm talking to you. I pushed his hand off my arm. Don't you ever put your hands on me again, I said, and turned around once more to my stake. Ordinarily, I would not have turned my back a second time because he had all the signs of a tush hog. But somehow the conditions did not add up. Most people there were professionals, or training to become professionals, and this man with the scar did not seem to fit. We were not on the block, 
so I thought perhaps the scar meant nothing. All of a sudden, however, he was acting like a bully, and now he wanted everyone to know he was not finished with me. When I turned my back on him a second time, this would have ended the whole argument for the black bourgeoisie, but the tush hog responded in his way. He turned me around again, and the tempo picked up. You must not know who you're talking to, he said, moving his left hand to his hip pocket. I figured I had better hurry up. Since the best defense is a good offense, my steak knife was ready again in a ready position, instinctively. I said to him, don't draw a knife on me, and I thrust my knife forward, stabbing him several times before he could come up with his left hand. He held on to me with his right hand and tried to advance, but I pushed him away. I still do not know what he was doing with his left, but I was expecting to be hurt at any time and determined to beat him to the punch. Melvin grabbed Lee's right arm and pushed him into a corner, where he fell, bleeding heavily. He got up and charged me again, and I continued to hold my knife ready. Then Melvin jumped between us, and Lee fainted in his arms. As Melvin took the knife from me, we turned to the rest of the people, and somebody asked, Why did you cut him? Melvin said he cut him because he should have cut him, and we backed out of the room. Melvin wanted me to press charges against the man, but I would never go to the police. About two weeks later, Odell Lee swore out charges against me. I don't know why he delayed so long, perhaps because he was in the hospital for a few days. Maybe he was hesitant. He had been talking about getting me, I know but I also heard that his wife had urged him to press charges instead. To me, he was not the kind of character who would go to the police. I saw him as a guy who would rather look for me himself and deal right there. When he sent word that he was after me, I started packing a gun. Instead, I was arrested at my house on a warrant and indicted for assault with a deadly weapon. After I pleaded not guilty, it went to a jury trial. I defended myself again. I was found guilty as charged, but only because I lacked a jury of my peers. My defense was based on the grounds that I was not guilty, either by white law or by the culture of the black community. I did not deny that I stabbed Odell Lee. I admitted it. But the law says that when one sees or feels he is in imminent danger of great bodily harm or death, he may use whatever force necessary to defend himself. If he kills his assailant, the homicide is justified. This section of the California Penal Code is almost impossible for a man to defend himself under, unless he is part of the oppressor class. The oppressed have no chance where people who sit on juries always think you could have picked another means of defense. They cannot see or understand the danger. A jury of my peers would have understood the situation and exonerated me. But the jurors in Alameda County come out of the big houses in the hills to pass judgment on the people who may feel threatened their, quote, peace. When these people see a scar on the face of a man on the block, they have no understanding of its symbolism. Odell Lee got on the stand and said that his scar resulted from an automobile accident. It may well have. But taking everything in context, his behavior at the party, the move toward his left hip, and his scar, my peers would have never convicted me.
Bobby Seale explain, explains it brilliantly in Seize the Time. You may go to a party and step on someone's shoes and apologize. And if the person accepts the apology, then nothing happens. If you hear something like, an apology won't shine my shoes, then you know he's really saying, I'm going to fight you. So you defend yourself. And in that case, striking first would be a defensive act, not an offensive one. You are trying to get an advantage over an opponent who has already declared war. It is all a matter of lifestyles that spills over into the problem of getting a jury of one's peers. If a truck driver is the defendant, should there be only truck drivers on the jury or all white races on the jury if a white race is still on trial? I say no. There is, nevertheless, an internal contradiction in a jury system that totally divides the accused and his jury. Different cultures and lifestyles in America use the same words with different shades of meaning. All belong to one society, yet live in different worlds. I was found guilty of a felony, assault with a deadly weapon, and faced a long jail sentence for the first time. Before and during the trial, I had been out on bail for several months. I came to the court each time I was supposed to, but when I was convicted, the judge decided to revoke my bail immediately and place me in the custody of the bailiff while he considered what sentence to impose. Wanting none of this, I demanded to be sentenced right then. The judge said that if he sentenced me then, I would be sent to the state penitentiary. I told him to send me there immediately so that I could start serving my time. He refused, asking me, do you realize what you're saying? I said, I know what I'm saying, that you found me guilty, but I am not guilty, and now I don't want to wait around a month serving dead time while you think about it. No time was dead to me. It was all living time, life. I felt that if a judge wanted to think about it for 30 days, he should let me stay out on he should let me stay out on bail while he did so. But he would not. He had confined me to the Alameda County Jail, a place I would get to know very well. While I was waiting, my family hired a lawyer to represent me at the sentencing. The judge was a man named Leonard Deaton, who did not give lawyers, much less defendants, any respect. He has sent so many people to the penitentiary that a section of San Quentin is called Deedon's Row. I was against my family hiring a lawyer because I felt it was useless. Nevertheless, they did, and he charged them $1,500 to go to court one time. When I arrived for sentencing, he was there and he worked his, quote, white magic. The judge sentenced me to six months in the county jail. Even though I had been convicted of a felony, the time they gave me was for a misdemeanor. This was to become a critical issue in my later capital trial, because the law says you can reduce a felony to a misdemeanor by serving less time. The penalty for a felony is no less than a year in the state penitentiary, and no more than a life sentence or death. For a misdemeanor, the maximum is one year in the county jail. End of chapter 12 Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 13 Quote All women, even the very phenomenal, want at least a promise of brighter days, brighter tomorrows. I have no tomorrows at all. George Jackson, Soledad Brother. Section Loving. 
My relationships with women could be described as complex or strange, depending on how you look at them. Varying influences help to form my attitude, the influence of my parents, of Christianity, of my older brothers, and later, my reading and the theories of Richard Thorne. Because these influences were often contradictory, they led to certain conflicts in my feelings and involvements with women. Conflicts that were not to be resolved until the communal life of the Black Panther Party displaced problematic individual relationships. When I was very young, I accepted the institution of marriage. As I grew older and saw my father struggling to take care of a wife and seven children, having to work three jobs at once, I began to see that the bourgeois family can be an imprisoning, enslaving, and suffocating experience. Even though my mother and father loved each other deeply and were happy together, I felt that I could not survive this kind of binding commitment with all its worries and material insecurity. Among the poor, social conditions and economic hardship frequently change marriage into a troubled and fragile relationship. A strong love between husband and wife can survive outside pressures, but that is rare. Marriage usually becomes one more imprisoning experience within the general prison of society. My doubts about marriage were reinforced when I met Richard Thorne. His theory of non-possessiveness in the love relationship was appealing to me. The idea that one person possesses the other as in bourgeois marriage, where she's my woman and he's my van, was unacceptable. It was too restrictive, too binding, and ultimately destructive to the union itself. Often it absorbed all of a man's energies and did not leave him free to develop potential talents, to be creative, or make a contribution in other areas of life. This argument that a family is a burden to a man, is developed in Bertrand Russell's Critique of Marriage and the Family. His observations impressed me and strengthened my convictions about the drawbacks of conventional marriage. As a result of thinking and reading, I decided to remain unmarried. This is a decision I do not regret although it has caused me pain and conflict from time to time and brought unhappiness to me and some of the women who, whom I have loved. After I moved out of Poor Boys Hall and had my own apartment, I was involved with several beautiful young women who loved me very much. I loved them just as much. For a while, I accepted money and favors from them, but only after I had explained that our relationship probably would not work because I was unprepared to follow the old road. If they wanted to be with me, I told them they would have to do certain things. I never forced or persuaded them. As a matter of fact, I said that in their place, I would not do it at all. I also explained my principle of non-possessiveness. I believed that if I was free, so were they, free to be involved with other men. I told them they could have any kind of relationship they wanted with someone else, but that we had a special relationship that could not be duplicated with another person, no matter how many people we might be involved with at the same time. This meant freedom for me, because I could have three or four relationships at the same time without having to keep one secret from the other. I was living alone, and we would all be together at my house at the same time. Richard would bring his friends over, too. Together, we became almost a cult. We spread our ideas around Oakland City College in Berkeley, before group living and communalism became popular. I might even say that this was the origin of the Sexual Freedom League, since Thorne went on from this to start that organization. 
The girls found our experiments unusual and romantic and thought we were very exciting. The main foundation of our relationship was mutual honesty and the elimination of jealousy. Within a given period, Richard and I would sleep with more than one woman to see if they could deal with this without regressing to their old values, which we, in our wisdom, considered outdated and bourgeois, as well as mentally unhealthy. Although much of this involved a new philosophy about the family, another part of it was exploitative. I was serious about our attempt to question matters through practice, but I also felt that we were taking advantage of the women for practical reasons. Women paid my rent, cooked my food, and did other things for me, while any money I came by was mine to keep. Around this time, I was pulling small-time armed robberies with some of my crime partners. We hid in the parking lots of expensive white clubs. When people came out, we took their fur wraps, wallets, rings, and watches. I never wanted to do these things on a large scale. What I wanted was leisure time to read and make love. My idea was to be involved with a number of women, and I was. I look back on this time as a kind of God experience when I was free to do anything I wanted. There was conflict, however, because while I was exploiting women, I was also fighting some internal values that would not let me alone. Perhaps these arose from the Christian principles that had been instilled in me from birth, perhaps from traditional mores. Still more likely, the conflict arose out of my desire not to treat another human being as an object. The fact that I found it necessary to explain to women that they were at a disadvantage in their relationship with me indicated that I needed some kind of defense mechanism against the guilt I felt. Still, women made my freedom possible by sacrificing their traditional ideas of husband and family. While I loved many women, only twice did I feel an impulse to marry. Even then, after serious consideration, I could not go through with it. Every time I fell close to a woman, I knew it was time for the relationship to end. No matter how deeply I felt, I could not share her goals if they led to a compromise with society. For a time, I tried the pimping life, but this caused altogether too much inner turmoil. Whenever I pimped a black sister, my mind would be filled with flashes of the slave experience, the racist dogs raping black women. I began to feel that if my conscience would not allow me to pimp black women, perhaps I should pimp white women, the enemy. But when I, quote, turned out a white woman and found there was still a crisis of conscience, I realized that I could never pimp for a living. With black women, the feeling was shame, because I was selling my sister's body. With white women, the feeling was not shame, but guilt, because I was now in the role of the oppressor. I had a, quote, weakness for women. Therefore, I could never be harsh with them. I always identified with them and fell in love. I flirted with pimping for only about nine months. It was during this period that I met Dolores. She and I were together for five years until I went to jail after the Odell Lee case. Slowly, imperceptibly, I fell more deeply in love with her than I had ever had before. She's had certain qualities that set her apart from all the others. She was special, unique. Dolores was a beautiful Afro-Filipino, free spirit, child woman who lived with a passionate intensity. Life with her was spontaneous, unpredictable, and filled with surprises. 
for she had this the unselfconsciousness of an impulsive and mischievous child. Sometimes, if I was reading or absorbed, she would steal up behind me and jump on my back. She loved fighting games and played aggressively. Often, Melvin and I had to retreat from a barrage of small stones that came flying at us, accompanied by triumphant laughter and taunts. Yet, there was a deeper, more complex side to her nature, for she was a creature of great contrasts. Dolores had an unusual gift for language and a sensitivity to the nuances and subtleties of words. She composed small poems that to me seemed remarkable. They revealed an awareness of the tenuousness of all human involvements and the sense of despair that hovers constantly at the lover's threshold of consciousness. Here is one she wrote for me. Quote, the two of us are multitude. Without you, I am dead. I'd rather not be than to be deceived by the one who keeps me alive. End poem. In our relationship, there was an intense contradiction. I could live with her, but not in the context of conventional family life. During our five years together, we broke up from time to time, but never for more than three months. Some intense need always drove us back to each other. In spite of her childlike qualities, Dolores was mature in many ways. She was a hard worker and willing to support us. She really understood and accepted my problem. I was in conflict, wanting to do the things that are expected of a man in our society, even trying a couple times without success. I worked on a construction job once and at a cannery for a couple of seasons, but I could not deal with work on a permanent basis. Often I considered marrying Dolores, but to do so meant accepting the conditions necessary to marriage in an oppressive situation. If two people are together as a unit, rather than in some haphazard way, a certain amount of security must exist. In the event of children, they must sacrifice their time to have that security. I was afraid of that. Many of my contemporaries were getting married in the hope of securing a good job and raising a family. But their marriages soon broke up because it cost so much to live, and their jobs were so treacherously menial that all their time was spent grubbing for basic necessities. Their dreams were crushed by the realities of their lives. When I saw myself heading in that direction, I balked. By rejecting marriage and a family, I held on to my freedom. But I lost the intimacy and companionship of a woman an experience that is probably as great as, perhaps greater than, the freedom I wanted. My inability to make a total commitment led Dolores to disaster. Our years together and our closeness had created a deep dependence in her, although I tried to maintain my own freedom in various ways. One of these was to see other women. One night, I brought another woman to my parents' home. While we were there, Dolores unexpectedly came over. The other woman and I went out, leaving Dolores there. Finally, about two in the morning, I left my companion and returned to our apartment. Dolores was gone. After some frantic calls, I made, to, I made one to my cousin, who lived nearby. She told me Dolores had taken 40 sleeping pills. I rushed over and found Dolores unconscious. An ambulance came and took her to the hospital. No one knew if help had arrived in time. 
I rushed to the hospital. She was alive. I should have seen the danger. Some of her poems had foreshadowed the self-destructive impulse. One of them, in particular, had a somber, despairing quality. Beginning of poem. The pigeons of my conscience make shadows on the wall. The cannibal that lives within my mind leaves no room for the imagination. I regret just this. End poem. My experience with Dolores reinforced, in the end, my conviction that the demands two people make upon each other can be crippling and destructive. No matter how much they love each other, the values of our society conspire to add intolerable pressures to a binding relationship. The contradictions inherent in marriage make it all but impossible to survive. These contradictions have been solved by the values of the Black Panther Party and by the party's communal life. The closeness of the group and the shared sense of purpose transform us into a harmonious, functioning body, working for the destruction of those conditions that make people suffer. Our unity has transformed us to the point where we have not compromised with the system. We have the closeness and love of family life the will to live in spite of cru cruel conditions. Consciousness is the first step towards control of a situation. We feel free as a group. We know what troubles us, and we act. Bourgeois values define the family situation in America, give it certain goals. Oppressed and poor people who try to reach these goals fail because of the very conditions that the bourgeoisie has established. There is the dilemma. We need a family because every man and woman deserves the kind of spiritual support and unity a family provides. Black people try to reach the goals set by the dominant culture and fail without knowing why. How do you solve the situation? By staying outside the system, living alone? I found that to be an outsider is to be alienated and unhappy. In the party, we have formed a family, a fighting family that is a vital unit in itself. We have no romantic and fictional notions about getting married and living happily ever after behind a white picket fence. We choose to live together for a common purpose, and together we fight for our existence and our goals. Today we have the closeness, the harmony, and freedom that we sought so long. End of chapter 13. End of, end of part 1. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Part 3. We believe that black people will not be free until we are able to determine our destiny. Chapter 14. Quote. Locked in a jail, within a jail, my mind is still free. What if a person was so oriented that the loss of no material thing could cause him mental disorganization? This is the free agent. George Jackson, Soledad Brother. Section, Freedom. Jail is an odd place to find freedom, but that was the place I first found mine, in the Alameda County Jail in Oakland in 1964. This jail is located on the 10th floor of the Alameda County Courthouse the huge, white building we call Moby Dick. When I was falsely convicted of the assault against Odell Lee, Judge Deedon sent me there to await sentencing. 
Shortly after I arrived, I was made a trustee, which gave me an opportunity to move about freely. Conditions were not good. In fact, the place blew up a few weeks later, when the inmates refused to go on eating starches and split pea soup at almost every meal, and we went on a food strike. I joined them. When we were brought our split pea soup, we hurled it back through the bars, all over the walls, and refused to lock up in our cells. I was the only trustee who took part in the strike, and because I could move freely between cell blocks, they charged me with organizing it. True, I had carried a few messages back and forth, but I was not an organizer then. Not that it mattered to the jail administration. Trustees were supposed to go along with the establishment in everything. And since I could not do that, I was slapped with the organizing label and put in the, quote, hole, what black prisoners call the soul breaker. I was 22 years old, and I had been in jail before on various beefs mostly burglary and petty larceny. My parents were pretty sick of me in my late teens and the following years, so I had to depend upon Sunny Man to come up from Los Angeles, or wherever he was, to bail me out. Since I had been given to him, he came whenever he could. But sometimes I could not find him. At any rate, I was no stranger to jail by 1964, although I had never been in extreme solitary confinement. Within jail, there are four levels of confinement. The main line, segregation, isolation, and solitary, the soul breaker. You can be in jail in jail, but the soul breaker is your quote, last end of the world. In 1964, there were two of these deprivation cells at Alameda County Courthouse. Each was four and a half feet wide by six feet long and by ten feet high. The floor was dark red rubber tile and the walls were black. If the guards wanted to, they could turn on a light in the ceiling. But I was always kept in the dark and nude. That is part of the deprivation, why the soul breaker is called a strip cell. Sometimes the prisoners in the other cell would get a blanket, but they never gave me one. He sometimes got toilet paper, too. The limit was two squares, and when he begged for more, he was told no. That is part of the punishment. There was no bunk, no wash basin, no toilet, nothing but bare floors, bare walls, a solid steel door, and a round hole four inches in six diameter and six inches deep in the middle of the floor. The prisoner was supposed to urinate, urinate and defecate in this hole. A half-gallon milk carton filled with water was my liquid for the week. Twice a day and always at night, the guards brought a little cup of cold split pea soup right out of the can. Sometimes during the day they brought fruit loaf, a patty of cooked vegetables mashed together to a little ball. When I first went in there I wanted to eat and stay healthy, but soon I realized that there was another trick, because when I ate I had to defecate. <clears throat> At night no light came in under the door. I could not even find the hole if I had wanted to. If I was desperate, I had to search with my hand. When I found it, the hole was always slimy with the filth that had gone in before. I was just like a mole looking for the sun. I hated finding it when I did. After a few days, the hole filled up and overflowed, so that I could not lie down without wallowing in my own waste. Once every week or two, the guards ran a hose into the cell and washed out the urine and defecation. This cleared the air for a while and made it all right to take a deep breath. I had been told I would break before the 15 days were up. 
most men did. After two or three days, they would begin to scream and beg for someone to come and take them out. And the captain would pay a visit and say, We don't want to treat you this way. Just come now and abide by the rules and don't be so arrogant. We'll treat you fairly. The doors here are large. To tell the truth, after two or three days, I was in bad shape. Why I did not break, I do not know. Stubbornness, probably. I did not want to beg. Certainly, my resistance was not connected to any kind of ideology or program. That came later. Anyway, I did not scream and beg. I learned the secrets of survival. One secret was the same that Mahatma Gandhi learned, to take little sips of nourishment, just enough to keep up one's strength, but never enough to have to defecate until the 15 days were up. That way, I kept the air somewhat clean and did not have the overflow. I did the same with water, taking little sips every few hours. My body absorbed all of it, and I did not have to urinate. There was another more important secret, one that took longer to learn. During the day, a little light showed in the two-inch crack at the bottom of the steel door. At night, as the sun went down and the lights clicked off one by one, I heard all the cells closing and all the locks. I held my hands up in front of my face, and soon I could not see them. For me, that was the testing time. The time when I had to save myself or break. Outside jail, the brain is always being bombarded by external stimuli. These ordinary sights and sounds of life help keep our mental processes in order and rational. In deprivation, you have to somehow replace the stimuli, provide an interior environment for yourself. Ever since I was a little boy, I have been able to overcome stress by calling up pleasant thoughts. So very soon, I began to reflect on the most soothing parts of my past. Not to keep out any evil thoughts, but to reinforce in myself in some kind of rewarding experience. Here I learned something. This was different. When I had a pleasant memory, what was I to do with it? Should I throw it out and get another? Or try to keep it to entertain myself as long as possible? If you are not disciplined, a strange thing happens. The pleasant thought comes, and then another, and another, like quick cuts flashing vividly across a movie screen. At first they are organized. Then they start to pick up speed pushing in on top of one another, going faster, faster, faster. The pleasant thoughts are not so pleasant now. They are horrible and grotesque caricatures, whirling around in your head. Stop, I heard myself say. Stop, stop, stop. I did not scream. I was able to stop them. Now what do I do? I started to exercise, especially when I heard the jangle of keys as the guards came with the split pea soup and fruit loaf. I would not scream. I would not apologize, even though they came every day saying they would let me out if I gave in. When they were coming, I would get up and start my calisthenics, and when they went away, I would start the pleasant thoughts again. If I was too tired to stand, I would lie down and find myself on my back. Later, I learned that my position, with my back arched and only my shoulders and tight buttocks touching the floor, was a Zen Buddhist posture. I did not know it then, of course. I just found myself on my back. When the thoughts started coming again to entertain me, and when the same thing happened with the speed up, 
faster, faster, I would say stop and start again. Over a span of time, I do not know how long it took, I mastered my thoughts. I could start them and stop them. I could slow them down and speed them up. It was a very conscious exercise. For a while, I feared I would lose control. I could not think. I could not stop thinking. Only later did I learn through practice to go at the speed I wanted. I call them film clips, but they are really thought patterns. The most vivid pictures of my family, girls, good times. Soon I could lie with my back arched for hours on end, and I placed no importance on the passage of time. Control. I learned to control my food, my body, and my mind through a deliberate act of will. After 15 days, the guards pulled me out and sent me back to a regular cell for 24 hours where I took a shower and saw a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. They were worried that prisoners would become mentally disorganized in such deprivation. Then, because I had not repented, they sent me back to the hole. By then, it had held no fears for me. I had won my freedom. Soul breakers exist because the authorities know that such conditions would drive them to the breaking point. But when I resolved that they would not conquer my will, I became stronger than they were. I understood them better than they understood me. No longer dependent on the things of the world, I felt really free for the first time in my life. In the past, I had been like my jailers. I had pursued the goals of capitalistic America. Now I had a higher freedom. Most people who know me do not realize that I have been in and out of jail for the past 12 years. They know only of my 11 months in solitary in 1967, waiting for the murder trial to begin, and the 22 months at the penal colony after that. But 1967 would not have been possible without 1964. I could not have handled the penal colony solitary without the soul breaker behind me. Therefore, I cannot tell inexperienced young comrades to go into jail and go into solitary. That is the way to defy authorities and exercise their freedom. I know what solitary can do to a man. The strip cell has been outlawed throughout the United States. Prisoners I talk to in California tell me that it is no longer in use on the West Coast. That was the work of Charles Gary, the lawyer who defended me in 1968 when he fought the case of Warren Wells, a Black Panther accused of shooting a policeman. The Superior Court of California said it was an outrage to human decency to put any man through such extreme deprivation. Of course, prisons have their ways, and out there right now, somewhere, prisoners without lawyers are probably lying in their own filth in the soul breaker. I was in the hole for a month. My sentence, when it came, was for six months on the county farm at Santa Rita about 50 miles south of Oakland. This is an honor camp with no walls, and the inmates are not locked up. There is a barbed wire fence, but anyone can easily walk off during the daytime. The inmates work at tending livestock, harvesting crops, and doing other farm work. I was not in the honor camp long. A few days after I arrived, I had a fight with a fat black inmate named Bojack, who served in the mess hall. 
Bojack was a diligent enforcer of small helpings, and I was a, quote, dipper. Whenever Bojack turned away, I would dip for more with my spoon. One day he tried, tried to prevent me from dipping, and I called him for protecting the oppressor's interests and smashed him with a steel tray. When they pulled me off him, I was hustled next door to Greystone, the maximum security prison at Santa Rita. Here, prisoners are locked up all day inside a stone building. Not only that, I was put in solitary confinement for the remaining months of my sentence. Because of my experience in the hold, I could survive. Still, I did not submit willingly. The food was as bad in Greystone as it had been in Alameda, and I constantly protested about that and the lack of heat in my cell. Half the time, we had no heat at all. Wherever you go in prison, there are disturbed inmates. One on my block at Santa Rita screamed night and day as loudly as he could. His vocal cords seemed made of iron. From time to time, the guards came into his cell and threw buckets of cold water on him. Gradually, as the inmate wore down, the scream became a croak, and then a squeak, and then a whisper. Long after he gave out, the sound lingered in my head. The Santa Rita administration finally got disgusted with my continual complaints and protests, and shipped me back to the jail in Oakland, where I spent the rest of my time in solitary. By then, I was used to the cold. Even now, I do not like any heat at all wherever I stay, no matter what the outside temperature. Even so, the way I was treated told me a lot about those who devised such punishment. I know them well. End of chapter. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 15, Introductory Quote SEAL is the heir to the early organizing efforts of young blacks and whites in the rural South. He inherits the demands of the early 60s students that fundamental constitutional guarantees and promises, so long violated by illegitimate white power, be immediately honored while reserving the right to attack the system itself. Julian Bond, A Time to Speak, A Time to Act. Section, Bobby Seale. Out of jail and back on the street in 1965, I again took up with Bobby Seale. We had a lot to talk about. I had not seen him in more than a year. Bobby and I had not always agreed. In fact, we disagreed the first time we met, during the Cuban Missile Crisis several years before. That was the time President Kennedy was about to blow humanity off the face of the earth because Russian ships were on their way to liberate a territory with arms for the people of Cuba. The Progressive Labor Party was holding a rally outside Oakland, a rally outside Oakland City College to encourage support for Fidel Castro. And I was there because I agreed with their views. There were a number of speakers, and one of them, Donald Warden, launched into a lengthy praise of Fidel. He did this in his usual opportunistic way, tooting his own horn. Warden was about halfway through his routine, criticizing civil rights organizations and asking why we put our money into that kind of thing. When Bobby challenged him, expressing opposition to Warden and strong support for the position of the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, he felt that the NAACP was the hope of black people, and because of this, he supported the government and its moves against Cuba. I explained to him afterward that he was wrong to support the government and the civil rights organizations. 
Too much money had already been put into legal actions. There were enough laws on the books to permit black people to deal with all their problems, but the laws were not enforced. Therefore, trying to get more laws was only a meaningless diversion from the real issues. This was an argument I had heard in the Afro-American Association, and in Oakland by Malcolm X, who made the point over and over again. Bobby began to think about this, and later came over to my point of view. Whatever our early disagreements, Bobby and I were close by 1965. Later, I recruited him into the Afro-American Association, but when I left it, he continued to stick with Warden. At that time, I was still going through my identity crisis, looking for some understanding of myself in relation to society. While I took a back seat in the association and refused to make a stand on any position, Bobby threw all his energy into it, even after I left. Still, we did not establish close contact until I got out of the hole in 1965. At that point, Bobby was planning to get married, and he needed a bed for his new apartment. I was breaking up with my girlfriend and had a bed I no longer wanted. I sold it to him, and we hauled it to his home. That afternoon, we began to talk. He told me that he had also left the Afro-American Association to hook up with Ken Freeman and his group, the Revolutionary Action Movement, RAM. Most of the brothers in this group attended Oakland City College, but the organization was a sort of underground, off-campus operation. They also had a front group called Seoul Students Advisory Council, which was, recognized, which was a recognized campus organization. The RAM group was more intellectual than active. They did a lot of talking about the revolution, and also some writing. Writing was almost a requirement for membership. In fact, but Bobby was no writer. At the time I got out of jail, Bobby had been involved in an argument with the members and had been suspended for a time. Still angry about this, he told me he intended to break with them. Like me, like thousands of us, Bobby was looking for something and not finding it. Bobby and I entered into a period of intense exploration, trying to solve some of the ideological problems of the black movement. Partly, we needed to explain to our own satisfaction why no black political organization had succeeded. The only one we thought had promised long-term success was the organization of Afro-American unity started by Malcolm X, but Malcolm had died too soon to pull his program together. Malcolm's slogan had been, freedom by any means necessary, but nothing we saw was taking us there. We still had only a vague conception of what freedom ought to mean to black people, except in abstract terms borrowed from politicians, and that did not help the people on the block at all. Those lofty words were meant for intellectuals and the bourgeoisie, who were already fairly comfortable. Much of our conversation revolved around groups in the San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley areas. Knowing the people who belonged to them, we could evaluate both positive and negative aspects of their characters and natures of their organizations. While we respected many of the moves these brothers had made, we felt that the negative aspects of their movement overshadowed the positive ones. We started throwing around ideas. None of the groups were able to recruit and involve the very people they professed to represent, the poor people in the community who never went to college, probably were not even able to finish high school. Yet these were our people. They were the vast majority of the black population in my area. 
any group talking about blacks was in fact talking about those low on the ladder in terms of well-being, self-respect, and the amount of concern the government had for them. All of us were talking, and nobody was reaching them. Bobby had a talent that could help us. He was beginning to make a name for himself in local productions as an actor and comedian. I had seen him act in several plays written by the brothers, and he was terrific. I had never liked comedians, and would, I would not go out of my way to hear one. If a person presents his material in a serious way and uses humor to get his point across, he will have me laughing with all the rest. But stand-up, wisecracking comedians leave me cold. Still, I recognized Bobby's talent and thought he could use it to relate to people and persuade them in an incisive way. Often, when we were rapping about our frustrations with particular group people or groups, Bobby would act out their madness. He could do expert imitations of President Kennedy, Martin Luther King, James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, and Chester of Gunsmoke. He could also imitate down to the last detail some of the brothers around us. I would crack my sides laughing, not only because his imitations were so good, but because he could convey certain attitudes and characteristics so sharply. He caught all their shortcomings, the way their ideas failed to meet the needs of the people. We planned to work through the Seoul Students Advisory Council. Although SSAC was just a front for RAM, it had one large advantage. It was not an intellectual organization, and for that reason it would appeal to many lower-class brothers on the city, at City College. If these brothers belonged to a group that gave them feelings of strength and respect, they could become effective participants. It was important to give them something relevant to do, something not degrading. Soul Students was normally an ineffective and transitory group without a real program. Only if something big was happening did their meetings attract a lot of people. In the quiet times, only two or three people would show up. Just then, however, Seoul students had a hot issue. The establishment of a program of Afro-American history and culture in the college's regular curriculum. Although it was a relevant program, the authorities were resisting it tooth and nail. Every time we proposed a new course, they countered with reasons why it could not be. At the same time, ironically, they encouraged us to be quote, concerned. This was simple trickery. They were dragging their feet. Bobby and I saw this as an opportunity to move Stoll students to, to a step further by adopting a program of armed self-defense. We approached them, proposing a rally in front of the college in support of the Afro-American history program. We pointed out that this would be a different kind of rally. The Seoul students' members would strap on guns and march on the sidewalk in front of the school. Partly, the rally would express our opposition to police brutality, but it would also intimidate the authorities at City College who were resisting our program. We were looking for a way to emphasize both college and community to draw them together. The police and the school authorities needed a strong jolt from blacks, and we knew this kind of action would make them realize that the brothers meant business. Carrying guns for self-defense was perfectly legal at the time. We explained all this to Seoul students and showed them that we did not intend to break any laws, 
but were concerned that the organization start dealing with reality rather than sit around intellectualizing and writing essays about the white man. We wanted them to dedicate themselves to armed self-defense, with the full understanding that this was defense for the survival of black people in general, and in particular for the cultural program we were trying to establish. As we saw it, blacks were getting ripped off everywhere. The police had given us no choice but to defend ourselves against their brutality. On the campus, we were being miseducated. We had no courses dealing with our real needs and problems, courses that taught us how to survive. Our program was designed to lead the brothers into self-defense before we were completely wiped out physically and mentally. The weapons were a recruiting device. I felt we could recruit Oakland City College students from the grassroots, people who did not relate to campus organizations that were all too intellectual and offered no effective program of action. Street people would relate to soul students if they followed our plan. If the black community has learned to respect anything, it has learned to respect the gun. We underestimated the difficulty of bringing the brothers around. Soul students completely rejected our program. Those brothers had been so intimidated by police firepower, they would not give any serious consideration to strapping on a gun, legal or not. After that setback, we went to the Revolutionary Action Movement. They did not have many members, just a few guys from the college campus who talked a lot. We explained that by wearing and displaying weapons, the Street Brothers would uh, relate to Ram's example of leadership. We also talked about a new idea, patrolling the police, since the police were the main perpetrators of violence against the community. We went no further than those two tactics, armed self-defense and police patrol. A more complete program was sure to get bogged down on minor points. I just wanted them to adopt a program of self-defense, and after that was worked out, we could then develop it more fully. We were not aiming then at party organization. There were too many organizations already. Our job was to make one of them relevant. That would be con contribution enough. However, we were having a lot of trouble breaking through. Ram rejected the plan too. They thought it was suicidal. That we could not survive a single day patrolling the police. This left us where we had been all along. Nowhere. End of chapter. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 16 Introductory Quote As a sapling bent low stores energy for a violent backswing, blacks bent double by oppression have stored energy which will be released in the form of rage, black rage, apocalyptic and final. William Greer and Price Cobbs, Black Rage Section the founding of the Black Panther Party. All during this time, Bobby and I had no thought of the Black Panther Party, no plan to head up any organization, and the 10-point program was still in the future. We had seen Watts rise up the previous year. We had seen how the police attacked the Watts community after causing the trouble in the first place. We had seen Martin Luther King come to Watts in an effort to calm the people and we had seen his philosophy of nonviolence rejected. Black people had been taught nonviolence. It was deep in us. What good, however, was nonviolence when the police were determined to rule by force? We had seen the Oakland police and the California Highway Patrol begin to carry their shotguns in full view as another way of striking fear into the community. We had seen all this, and we recognized that the rising consciousness of black people was almost at the point of explosion. 
one must relate to the history of one's community and to its future. Everything we had seen convinced us that our time had come. Out of this need sprang the Black Panther Party. Bobby and I finally had no choice but to form an organization that would involve the lower class brothers. We worked it out in conversations and discussions. Most of the talk was casual. Bobby lived near the campus, and his living room became a kind of headquarters. Although the, we were still involved with soul students, we attended few meetings, and when we did go, our presence was mostly disruptive. We raised questions that upset people. Our conversations with each other became the important thing. Brothers who had a free hour between classes and others who just hung around the campus drifted in and out of Bobby's house. We drank beer and wine and chewed over the political situation, our social problems, and the merits and shortcomings of the other groups. We also discussed the black achievements of the past, particularly as they helped us to understand current events. In a sense, these sessions at Bobby's house were our political education classes, and the party sort of grew out of them. Even after we formally organized, we continued the discussions in our office. By then, we had moved on to include not only problems, but possible solutions. We also read, The literature of oppressed people and their struggles for liberation in other countries is very large, and we pored over these books to see how their experiences might help us to understand our plight. We read the work of Frantz Fanon, particularly The Wretched of the Earth, the four volumes of Chairman Mao Zedong, and Che Guevara's Guerrilla Warfare. Che and Mao were veterans of people's wars, and they had worked out successful strategies for liberating their people. We read these men's works because we saw them as kinsmen. The oppressor who had controlled them was controlling us, both directly and indirectly. We believed it was necessary to know how they gained their freedom in order to go about getting ours. However, we did not want merely to import strategies and ideas. We had to transform what we learned into principles and methods acceptable to the brothers on the block. Mao and Fanon and Guevara all saw clearly <clears throat> that the people had been stripped of their birthright and their dignity, not by any philosophy or mere words, but at gunpoint. They had suffered a holdup by gangsters, and rape. For them, the only way to win freedom was to meet force with force. At bottom, this is a form of self-defense. Although that defense might, at times, take on characteristics of aggression, in the final analysis, the people do not initiate. They simply respond to what has been inflicted upon them. People respect the expression of strength and dignity displayed by men who refuse to bow to the weapons of oppression. Though it may mean death, these men will fight because death with dignity is preferable to ignominy. Then too, there is always the chance that the, the oppressor will be overwhelmed. Fanon made a statement during the Algerian War that impressed me. He said it was the, quote, year of the boomerang, which is the third phase of violence. At that point, the violence of the aggressor turns on him and strikes a killing blow. Yet the oppressor does not understand the process. He knows no more than he did in the first phase when he launched the violence. The oppressed are always defensive. The oppressor is always aggressive and surprised when the people turn back on him, the force he has used against them. Negroes with Guns by Robert Williams had a great influence on the kind of party we developed. Williams had been active in Monroe, North Carolina, with a program of armed self-defense that had enlisted many in the community. However, I did not like the way he had called on the federal government for assistance. We viewed the government as an enemy, the agency of a ruling clique that controls the country. 
We also had some literature about deacons for defense and justice in Louisiana, the state where I was born. One of their leaders had come through the Bay Area on a speaking and fundraising tour, and we liked what he said. The deacons had done a good job of defending civil rights marchers in their area, but they also had a hobbit habit of calling upon the federal government to carry out this defense, or at least assist them in defending the people who were upholding the law. The deacons even went so far as to enlist local sheriffs and police to defend the marchers, with the threat that if law enforcement agencies would not defend them, the deacons would. We also viewed the local police, the National Guard, and the regular military as one huge armed group that opposed the will of the people. In a boundary situation, people have no real defense except what they provide them for themselves. We read also the works of the freedom fighters who had done so much for black communities in the United States. Bobby had collected all Malcolm X's speeches and ideas from papers like The Militant and Muhammad Speaks. These we studied carefully. Although Malcolm's program for the organization of Afro-American unity was never put into operation, he has made it clear that blacks ought to arm. Malcolm's influence was ever-present. We continue to believe that the Black Panther Party exists in the spirit of Malcolm. Often, it is difficult to say exactly how an action or a program has been determined or influenced in a spiritual way. Such intangibles are hard to describe, although they can be more significant than any precise influence. Therefore, the words on this page cannot convey the effect that Malcolm has had on the Black Panther Party. Although, as far as I am concerned, the party is a living testament to his life work. I do not claim that the party has done what Malcolm would have done. Many others say that their programs are Malcolm's programs. We do not say this, but Malcolm's spirit is in us. From all of these things, the books, Malcolm's writings, and spirit, our analysis of the local situation, the idea of an organization was forming. One day, quite suddenly, almost by chance, we found a name. I had read a pamphlet about voter registration in Mississippi, how the people in Lowndes County had armed themselves against establishment violence. Their political group, called the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, had a black panther for its symbol. A few days later, while Bobby and I were rapping, I suggested that we use the panther as our symbol and call our political vehicle the Black Panther Party. The panther is a fierce animal, but he will not attack until he is backed into a corner. Then he will strike out. The image seemed appropriate, and Bobby agreed without discussion. At this point, we knew it was time to stop talking and begin organizing. Although we had always wanted to get away from the intellectualizing and rhetoric characteristic of other groups, at times we were as inactive as they were. The time had come for action. End of chapter 16. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Chapter 17. The only way to police a ghetto is to be oppressive. None of the police commissioner's men, even with the best will in the world, have any way of understanding the lives led by the people they swagger about in twos and threes controlling. Their very presence is an insult, and it would be even if they spent their entire day feeding gumdrops to children. They represent the force of the white world, and that world's real intentions are simply for that world's criminal profit and ease, to keep the black man corralled up here in his place. James Baldwin, Fifth Avenue, Uptown. Nobody knows my name. Section. Patrolling. It was the spring of 1966. Still without a definite program, we were at the stage of testing ideas that would capture the imagination of the community. We began, as always, by checking around with the Street Brothers. 
we asked them if they would be interested in forming the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which would be based upon defending the community against the aggression of the power structure, including the military and the armed might of the police. We informed the brothers of their right to possess weapons. Most of them were interested. Then we talked about how the people are constantly intimidated by arrogant, belligerent police officers, and exactly what we could do about it. We went to pool halls and bars, all the places where brothers congregate and talk. I was prepared to give them legal advice. From my law courses at Oakland City College and San Francisco Law School, I was familiar with the California Penal Code and well-versed in the laws related to weapons. I also had something very important at my disposal, the law library of the North, North Oakland Service Center, a community center poverty program where Bobby was working. The center gave legal advice, and there were many law books on the shelves. Unfortunately, most of them dealt with civil law, since the anti-poverty program was not supposed to advise poor people about criminal law. However, I made good use of the books they had to run down the full legal situation to brothers on the street. We were doing what the poverty program claimed to be doing, but never had, giving help and counsel to poor people about the things that crucially affected their lives. All that summer, we circulated in the black communities of Richmond, Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco. Wherever brothers gathered, we talked with them about their right to arm. In general, they were interested but skeptical about the weapons idea. They could not see anyone walking around with a gun in full view. To recruit any sizable number of street brothers, we would obviously have to do more than talk. We needed to give practical applications of our theory, show them that we were not afraid of weapons and not afraid of death. The way we finally won the brothers over was by patrolling the police with arms. Before we began the patrols, however, Bobby and I set down in writing a practical course of action. We could go no further without a program, and we resolved to drop everything else, even though it might take a while to come up with something viable. One day, we went to the North Oakland Service Center to work it out. The center was an ideal place because of the books and the fact that we could work undisturbed. First, we pulled together all the books we had been reading and dozens we had only heard about. We had discussed Mao's program, Cuba's program, and all the others, but concluded that we could not follow any of them. Our unique situation required a unique program. Although the relationship between the oppressor and the oppressed is universal, forms of oppression vary. The ideas that mobilized the people of Cuba and China sprang from their own history and political structures. The practical parts of those programs could be carried out only under a certain kind of oppression. Our program had to deal with America. I started wrapping off the essential points for the survival of black and oppressed people in the United States. Bobby wrote them down, and then we separated those ideas into two sections, what we want and what we believe. We split them up because the ideas fell naturally into two distinct categories. It was necessary to explain why we wanted certain things. At the same time, our goals were based on beliefs, and we set those out too. In the section on beliefs, we made it clear that all the objective conditions necessary for attaining our goals were already in existence, but that a number of societal factors stood in our way. This was to help the people understand what was working against them. All in all, our 10-point program took about 20 minutes to write. Thinking it would take days, we were prepared for a long session, but we never got to the small amount of books piled up around us. We had come to an important realization. Books could only point in a general direction, 
The rest was up to us. This is the party program we wrote down. Beginning of program. October 1966, Black Panther Party, platform and program. What do we want? What we believe. One, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our black community. We believe that black people will not be free until we are able to determine our destiny. Two, we want full employment for our people. We believe that the federal government is responsible and obligated to give every man employment or a guaranteed income. We believe that if the white American businessmen will not give full employment, then the means of production should be taken from the businessmen and placed in the community so that the people of the community can organize and employ all of its people and give a high standard of living. Three, we want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. We believe that this racist government has robbed us, and now we are demanding the overdue debt of 40 acres and two mules. 40 acres and two mules were promised 100 years ago as restitution for slave labor and mass murder of black people. We will accept the payment in currency, which will be distributed to our many communities. The Germans are now aiding the Jews in Israel for the genocide of the Jewish people. The Germans murdered 6 million Jews. The American racist has taken part in the slaughter of over 50 million black people. Therefore, we feel that this is a modest demand that we make. 4. We want decent housing, fit for shelter of human beings. We believe that if the white landlords will not give decent housing to our black community, then the housing and the land should be made into cooperatives so that our community, with government aid, can build and make decent housing for its people. Five, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. We believe in an educational system that will give to our people a knowledge of self. If a man does not have knowledge of himself and his position in society and the world, then he has little chance to relate to anything else. 6. We want all black men to be exempt from military service. We believe that black people should not be forced to fight in the military service to defend a racist government that does not protect us. We will not fight and kill other people of color in the world who, like black people, are being victimized by the white racist government of America. We will protect ourselves from the force and violence of the racist police and the racist military by whatever means necessary. Seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. We believe we can end police brutality in our black community by organizing black self-defense groups that are dedicated to defending our black community from racist police oppression and brutality. The Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States gives a right to bear arms. We therefore believe that all black people should arm themselves for self-defense. Eight, we want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. We believe that all black people should be released from the many jails and prisons because they have not received a fair and impartial trial. 9. We want all black people, when brought to a trial, to be tried in a court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities, as defined by the Constitution of the United States. We believe that the courts should follow the United States Constitution so that black people will, will receive fair trials. The 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution gives a man a right to be tried by his peer group. A peer is a person from a similar economic, social, religious, geographical, environmental, historical, and racial background. To do this, the court will be forced to select a jury from which the black community 
from the black community from which the black defendant came. We have been and are being tried by all white juries that have no understanding of the average reasoning man of the black community. 10. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. And as our major, major political objective, the United Nations supervised plebiscite to be held throughout the black colony in which only black colonial subjects will be allowed to participate for the purpose of determining the will of black people as to their, relation, as to their national destiny. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the, opi to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its powers in such form, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their happiness and safety. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. End of the document. With the program on paper, we set up the structure of our organization. Bobby became chairman, and I chose the position of miniature Minister of Defense. I was very happy with this arrangement. I do not like to lead formally, and the chairman has to conduct meetings and be involved in administration. We also discussed having an advisory cabinet as an information arm of the party. We wanted this cabinet to do research on each of the ten points and their relation to the community, and to advise the people on how to best implement them. It seemed best to, the weight, to weight the political wing of the party with Street Brothers, and the advisory cabinet with middle-class blacks, who had the necessary knowledge and skills. We were also seeking a functional unity between middle-class blacks and Street Brothers. I asked my brother Melvin to approach a few friends about serving on the advisory cabinet. But when our plan became clear, they all refused, and the cabinet was deferred. The first member of the Black Panther Party, after Bobby and myself, was Little Bobby Hutton. Little Bobby had met Bobby Seal at the North Oakland Service Center, where both were working and he immediately became enthusiastic about the nascent organization. Even though he was only about 15 years old then, he was a responsible and mature person, determined to help the cause of black people. He became the party's first treasurer. Little Bobby was the youngest of seven children. His family had come to Oakland from Arkansas when he was three years old. His parents were good, hard-working people, but Bobby had endured the same hardships and humiliations to which so many young blacks in poor communities are subjected. Like many of the brothers, he had been kicked out of school. Then he had gotten a part-time job at the service center. 
After work, he used to come around to Bobby Seal's house to talk and learn and to read. At the time of his murder, he was reading Black Reconstruction in America by W.E.B. Du Bois. Footnote. On the night of April 6th, 1968, two days after the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King, Black Panthers riding in three cars supporting, transporting food and supplies for a barbecue picnic to be held in the Black community the next day were ambushed by police. In the shootout that followed, little Bobby Hutton and another Black Panther Party member, Eldridge Cleaver, were trapped by the police in the basement of a house on 28th Street in Oakland. The police fired upon the house with rifles, pistols, shotguns, tear gas, and firebombs for 90 minutes, after which little Bobby came out with his hands in the air. In cold blood, the police shot him dead in the street. He was 17 years old. End of footnote. Bobby was a serious revolutionary, but there was nothing grim about him. He had an infectious smile and a disarming quality that made people love him. He died courageously, the first Black Panther to make the supreme sacrifice for the people. We all attempt to carry on the work he began. We started now to implement our 10-point program. Interested primarily in educating, educating and revolutionizing the community, we needed to get their attention and give them something to identify with. This is why the seventh point, police action, was the first program we emphasized. Point seven stated, we want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people. This is a major issue in every black community. The police have never been our protectors. Instead, they act as the military arm of our oppressors and continually brutalize us. Many communities have tried and failed to get civilian review boards to supervise the behavior of police. In some places, organized citizen patrols had followed the police and observed them in their community dealings. They take pictures and make tape recordings of the encounters and report misbehavior to the authorities. However, the authorities responsible for overseeing the police are policemen themselves and usually side against the citizens. We recognized that it was ridiculous to report the police to the police, but we hoped that by raising encounters to a higher level, by patrolling the police with arms, we would see a change in their behavior. Further, the community would notice this and become interested in the party. Thus, our armed patrols were also a means of recruiting. At first, the patrols were a total success. Frightened and confused, the police did not know how to respond because they had never encountered patrols like this before. They were familiar with the community alert programs in other cities, but never before had guns been an integral part of any patrol program. With weapons in our hands, we were no longer their subjects, but their equals. Out on patrol, we stopped whenever we saw the police questioning a brother or sister. We would walk over with our weapons and observe them from a, quote, safe distance so that the police could not say we were interfering with the performance of their duty. We would ask the community members if they were being abused. Most of the time, when a policeman saw us coming, he slipped his book back, back into his pocket, got into his car, and left in a hurry. The citizens who had been stopped were as amazed as the, poli as the police at our sudden disappearance. I always carried law books in my car. Sometimes when a policeman was harassing a citizen, I would stand off a little and read the relevant portions of the penal code in a loud voice to all within hearing distance. In doing this, 
we were helping to educate those who gathered to observe these incidents. If the policeman arrested the citizen and took him to the station, we would follow and immediately post bail. Many community people could not believe at first that we had only their interest at heart. Nobody had ever given them any support or assistance when the police harassed them. But here we were, proud black men, armed with guns and a knowledge of the law. Many citizens came right out of jail and into the party, and the statistics of murder and brutality by policemen in our communities fell sharply. Each day we went out on our watch. Sometimes we got on a policeman's tail and followed him with our weapons in full view. If he darted around the block or made a U-turn trying to follow us, we let him do that until he got tired of it. Then we would follow him again. Either way, we took up a good bit of police time that otherwise would have been spent in harassment. As our forces built up, we doubled the patrols, then tripled them. We began to patrol everywhere, Oakland, Richmond, Berkeley, and San Francisco. Most patrols were a part of our normal movement around the community. We kept them random, however, so that the police could not set a network to anticipate us. They never knew when or where we were going to show up. It might be late at night or early in the morning. Some brothers would go on patrol the same time every day, but never in a specific pattern or in the same geographical area. The chief purpose of the patrols was to teach the community security against the police, and we did not need a regular schedule for that. We knew that no particular area could be totally defended. Only the community could effectively defend and eventually liberate itself. Our aim was simply to teach them how to go about it. We passed out our literature and 10-point program to the citizens who gathered, discussed community defense, and educated them about their rights concerning weapons. All along, the number of members grew. The Black Panthers were, and are, always required to keep their activities within legal bounds. This was emphasized repeatedly in our political education classes, and also when we taught weapons care. If we overstepped legal bounds, the police would easily gain the upper hand and be able to continue their intimidation. We also knew the community was somewhat fearful of the gun and of the policemen who had it. So we studied the law about weapons and kept within our rights. To be arrested for having weapons would be a setback to our program of teaching the people their constitutional right to bear arms. As long as we kept everything legal, the police could do nothing, and the people would see that armed defense was a legitimate constitutional right. In this way, they would lose their doubts and fears and be able to move against the oppressor. It was not all observation and penal code reading on those patrols. The police, invariably shocked to meet a cadre of disciplined and armed black men coming to the support of the community, reacted in strange and unpredictable ways. In their fright, some of them became children, cursing and insulting us. We responded in kind, calling them swine and pigs, but never cursing. This could be cause for arrest, and we took care not to be arrested with our weapons. But we demonstrated their cowardice to the community with our, quote, shakabuku. Footnote. Shakabuku is a term we made up. In the black community, shakabuku is a tactic of keeping the enemy off balance through sudden and unexpected maneuvers that push him towards his opponent's position. End of footnote. It was sometimes hilarious to see their reaction. 
They had always been cocky and sure of themselves, as long as they had their weapons to intimidate the unarmed community. When we equalized the situation, their real cowardice was exposed. Soon they began to retaliate. We expected this. They had to get back at us in some way, and we were prepared. The fact that we had conquered our fear of death made it possible to face them under any circumstances. The police began to keep a record of Black Panther vehicles. Whenever they spotted one, they would be stopped and investigated for possible violations. This was a childish ploy, but it was the police way. We always made sure our vehicles were clean, without violations, and the police were usually hard-pressed to find any justification for stopping us. Since we were within, within the law, they soon resorted to illegal tactics. I was stopped and questioned 40 or 50 times by police without being arrested or even getting a ticket in most instances. The few times I did end up on the blotter, it merely proved how far they were willing to go. A policeman once stopped me and examined my license and the car for any violation of the motor vehicle code. He spent about half an hour going over the vehicle, checking lights, horn, tires, everything. Finally, he shook the rear license plate and a bolt dropped off, so he wrote out a ticket for a faulty license plate. Some encounters with the police were more dramatic. At times, they drew their guns and we drew ours, until we reached a sort of standoff. This happened frequently to me. I often felt that someday one of the police would go crazy and pull the trigger. Some of them were so nervous that they looked as if they might shake a bullet out of their pistol. I would rather have a brave man pull a gun on me, since he is less likely to panic but we were prepared for anything. Sometimes they threatened to shoot, thinking I would lose courage. But I remembered the lessons of solitary confinement and assigned every silly action its proper significance. They were afraid of us. It was as simple as that. Each day we went forth fully aware that we might not come home or see each other ever again. There is no closeness equal to that. In front of our first Black Panther office, on 58th Street in Oakland, a policeman once drew his gun and pointed it at me while I sat in our car. When people gathered to observe, the police told them to clear the area. I ignored the gun, got out of the car, and asked people to go into the party office. They had a right to observe the police. Then I called the policeman an ignorant Georgia cracker who had come west to get away from sharecropping. After that, I walked around the car and spoke to the citizens about the police and about every man's right to be armed. I took a chance there, but I figured the policeman would not shoot me with all those eyes on him. He was willing to shoot me without cause, I am sure, but not before so many witnesses. Another policeman admitted as much during an incident in Richmond. I had stopped to watch a motorcycle cop question a citizen. He was clearly edgy at my presence, but I stood off quietly at a reasonable distance with my shotgun in hand. After writing up the citizen, he rode his motorcycle over to me and asked if I wanted to press charges for police brutality. About a dozen people were standing around watching us. Quote, are you paranoid? I replied. Do you think you're important? Do you think I would waste my time going down to the police station to make a report on you? No, you're just a coward anyway. With that, I got into my car. When he tried to hold my door open, I slammed it shut and told him to get his hands off. By now, people were laughing at the cop. And rather than suffer further humiliation, he drove off, steaming mad. 
About halfway down the street, he turned around and came back. He wanted to do something, and he was about fifty shades of red. Pulling up beside me, he stuck his head close and said, If it was night, you wouldn't do this. You're right, I replied. I sure wouldn't, but you're threatening me now, aren't you? He got a little redder and kicked his machine into gear and took off. The police wanted me badly, but they needed to do their dirty work out of the view out of the view of the community. When a citizen was unarmed, they brutalized him any time, almost casually. But when he was prepared to defend himself, the police became little more than criminals, working at night. On another occasion, I stopped by the Black Panther office after paying some bills for my father. Since I was taking care of family business, I had not carried my shotgun with me. It was at home. But I did have a dagger, fully sheathed in my belt. In the office were two comrades. Warren Tucker, a captain in the party, and another member. As we talked, an 11-year-old boy burst into the office and said, The police are at my friend's house. They're tearing up the place. This house was only about three blocks away, so the two Panthers and I hurried to the scene. <clears throat> Warren Tucker had a forty-five pistol strapped to his hip in full view, but the other two of us had no weapons. We never kept weapons in the office, since we were there only periodically. When we arrived, we found three policemen in the house, turning over couches and chairs, searching and pushing a little boy around and shooting, shouting, Where's the shotgun? The boy kept saying, I don't have a shotgun. But the police went right on looking. I asked the policeman who seemed to be in charge if he had a search warrant and he answered that he did not need one because he was in a, quote, hot pursuit. Then he told me to leave the house. The little boy asked me to stay, so I continued to question the police, telling them they had no right to be there. The policeman finally turned on me. You're going to get out of here, he said. No, I said, you'll leave if you don't have a search warrant. In the middle of this argument, the boy's father arrived and also asked the police for a search warrant. When the police admitted they did not have one, he ordered them out. As they started to, le to leave, one of the policemen stopped in the doorway and said to the father, Why are you telling us to get out? Why don't you get rid of these panthers? They're the troublemakers. The father replied, Before this, I didn't like the panthers. I had heard bad things about them. But in the last few minutes, I've changed my mind, because they helped my son when you pushed him around. The police became even more outraged at this. All their hostility now turned towards us. As the whole group went down the steps and carried and out into the yard, more policemen arrived on the scene. The house was directly across the street from Oakland City College and the dozen or so police cars had attracted a crowd that was milling about. The policemen who had been ordered out of the house took new courage at the sight of reinforcements. Walking over to me in the yard, he came close, saying, You are always making trouble for us. Coming closer still, he growled at me in a low voice that could not be overheard, You motherfucker. This was regular police routine, a transparent strategy. He wanted me to curse him before witnesses, then he could arrest me. But I had learned to be cautious. After he called me a motherfucker, he stood waiting for the explosion, but it did not come in a way he expected. Instead, I called him a swine, a pig, a slimy snake, everything I could think of without using profanity. By now, he was almost apoplectic. Quote, You're talking to me like that and you have a weapon? You're displaying a weapon in a rude and threatening fashion? Then he turned to Warren Tucker. 
Warren's gun was still in its holster, and said, And so are you. As if on signal, the fifteen policemen who had been standing around uncertainly stormed the three of us and threw on handcuffs. They did not say they were placing us under arrest. If they had, we would gladly have taken the arrest under the circumstances without any resistance. From the way we went hurtling off in the paddy wagon, with its siren wailing and police cars ahead and behind, you might have thought they had bagged a mafia capo. After we were booked, they searched us and found a pen knife in Warren Tucker's pocket, the kind Boy Scouts used. So they dropped the charge of, quote, displaying a weapon in a rude and threatening manner, and charged him simply with carrying a concealed weapon. Even that charge was eventually dropped. This was the kind of harassment we went through over and over again, simply because we chose to exercise our constitutional rights to self-defense and stand up for the community. In spite of the fact that we followed the law to the letter, we were arrested and convicted of all sorts of minor trumped-up charges. They sought to frighten us and turn the community against us, but what they did had the opposite effect. For instance, after this encounter, we gained a number of new members from City College students who had watched the incident and had seen how things really were. They had been skeptical about us earlier because of the bad treatment we had received in the press, but seeing is believing. The policeman who started this particular incident testified against me in 1968 in my trial for killing a policeman. When my attorney, Charles Gary, questioned him under cross-examination, he admitted his fear of the Black Panthers. He is six feet tall and weighed 250 pounds. I am five feet ten and a half inches and weigh 150, yet he said that I, quote, surrounded him. Straying further from the facts, he testified that he had not said anything to me, that, on the contrary, he was too frightened to open his mouth. The Black Panthers allegedly frightened him by shaking high-powered rifles on his, in his face, calling him a pig and threatening to kill him. He was fearful, he said, that I would kill him with the dagger, though it was sheathed. He stated that I had come right up to him, that I was, quote, in his face, and, as he put it, he was all around me. So much for police testimony. In addition to our patrols and confrontations with the police, I did a lot of recruiting in pool halls and bars, sometimes working 12 to 16 hours a day. I passed out leaflets with our 10-point program, explaining each point to all who would listen. Going deep into the community like this, I invariably became involved in whatever was happening. This day-to-day -day contact became an important part of our organizing effort. There is a bar restaurant in North Oakland known as the Bosun's Locker. I used to call it my office because I would sometimes sit in there for 20 hours straight, talking with the people who came in. Most of the time, I had my shotgun with me, if the owners of the establishment did not object. If they did, I left it in my car. At other times, I would go to City College or to the Oakland Skills Center anywhere people gathered. It was hard work, but not in the sense of working at an ordinary job, with its deadly routine and sense of futility in performing empty labor. It was work that had profound significance for me. The very meaning of my life was in it, and it brought me closer to the people. This recruiting had an interesting ramification in that I tried to transform many of the so-called criminal activities going on in the street into something political, although this had to be done gradually. Instead of trying to eliminate these activities, numbers, hot goods, drugs, I attempted to channel them into significant community actions. 
black consciousness had generally reached a point where a man felt guilty about exploiting the black community. However, if his daily activities for survival could be integrated with actions that undermined the established order, he felt good about it. It gave him a feeling of justification and strengthened his own sense of personal worth. Many of the brothers who were burglarizing and participating in similar pursuits began to contribute weapons and material to community defense. In order to survive, they still had to sell their hot goods, but at the same time, they would pass some of the cash onto us. That way, ripping off became more than just an individual thing. Gradually, the Black Panthers came to be accepted in the Bay Area community. We had provided a needed example of strength and dignity by showing people how to defend themselves. More important, we lived among them. They could see every day that with us, the people came first. End of chapter 17. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 18 Introductory Quote Those who assert this kind of, quote, independence are usually wedded to the doctrine of me first and are generally wrong on the question of the relationship between the individual and the party. Although in words they profess respect for the party, in practice they put themselves first and the party second. What are these people after? They are after fame and position, and want to be in the limelight. It is their dishonesty that causes them to come to grief. Chairman Mao, The Little Red Book Section, Eldritch Cleaver One evening in early 1967, Bobby Seal called and asked me to go with him to a radio station in downtown Oakland. He arrived with Marvin Jackman, a black playwright who was in the process of becoming a Muslim. We had tried to recruit Jackman into the party, but his Muslim beliefs forbade him to have anything to do with weapons. He and another Muslim brother arrived with Bobby, driving the car of Beverly Axelrod, a lawyer active in civil rights cases in California. The purpose of the trip was to meet Eldridge Cleaver, an ex-convict. Footnote. Cleaver was released on parole from Soledad Prison to San Francisco on December 12, 1966, after serving nine years of a one to 14 year sentence for rape. End of section, end of footnote. Of growing reputation, he would be interviewed that night. I had heard of Eldritch's speeches in the Bay Area since his release from prison in December, but we had never talked, and I had not yet read Soul on Ice, which was receiving great critical acclaim, or any of his other writings. I knew only that he was an ex-convict with plenty of time behind him. Because of Eldritch's past experience and his deep involvement in the movement, I was particularly eager to meet him. No ex-convict could be all bad. While we drove to the radio station, we listened to Eldritch's discussion with the interviewer. I liked what he said about his early life and his work in the movement since his release. He was articulate, his insights were good, and he seemed to understand the needs of the community of, and what black people had to do to liberate themselves. When we pulled up to the radio station, Eldritch was still on the air. Immediately after the discussion, Eldritch and I fell into a long discussion. It was not much of a dialogue, actually. Eldritch hardly said a word. I tried to persuade him to join the party then and there by running down our ten-point program and convincing him that we had developed Malcolm's ideas and were carrying them out. I explained that Malcolm's program had been rather vague, since he had not had the opportunity to lay it out clearly before he was cut down. A lot of groups were springing up, claiming to bear his standard, 
but we were the only ones who had armed ourselves and were teaching self-defense to the community. This was Malcolm's program, and we were serious about establishing it. Eldritch only listened. Every once in a while he would nod his head in agreement and say, I know. But he did not ask any questions or comment one way or other about the program. When I finished, he told me that he was obligated to Malcolm's widow, Sister Betty Shabazz, and that he had promised to work with her to carry out Malcolm's dream and make it a reality. Then he left. I was puzzled by this first meeting. Perhaps he had not understood anything I was saying, even though he seemed to by nods and phrases of agreement. I figured that if he really understood, he would have asked some questions or made a criticism or two. When a man is interested, he wants to know more. Eldritch had been as silent as a sphinx. After reading the chapter in Soul on Ice that deals with police administration, from the local to the international level. I realized that Eldritch did not argue any of the points with me that night, because he understood all too well and agreed totally. A few weeks later, we were together at a meeting in the office of the Paper Panthers in San Francisco. This was a group of cultural nationalists in San Francisco who called themselves the Black Panther Party of Cal Northern California. They had a similar group in Los Angeles. I do not know when they started or what their goals were, but David Hillard labeled them the Paper Panthers because their activity was confined to a steady production of printed matter. Unlike Bobby and me, they had not grown up on the block. They were more privileged. Their office was close to the office of an organization called the Black House that Eldritch and Marvin Jackman had started in San Francisco. This was just a large house in the Fillmore area where people lived upstairs and used the first floor, which had been converted into a meeting room, for political and social activities. Leroy Jones, now Imamu Amiri Baraka, was teaching for a semester at San Francisco State and he sometimes gave readings on Friday nights. Other poets also read, and there was plenty of discussion and intellectualizing. It was Oakland and Berkeley all over again. As far as I could see, Black House was exploiting Eldridge, who paid the rent and the huge telephone bills. No one else was doing very much, just lying around, quote, becoming black. Early in February 1967, all these groups banded together to sponsor a program in San Francisco honoring Malcolm on the anniversary of his assassination. The guest of honor was to be Malcolm's widow, Sister Betty Shabazz. They wanted to arrange some security for her, since there was fear that she too might be assassinated. Bobby and I attended a meeting to organize an escort and although we had a good deal of contempt for the Paper Panthers, we agreed to join them in providing security. Eldridge was at the meeting, too, silent as usual. When details for the escort were worked out and the day arrived, we joined the others in San Francisco and headed for the airport to meet Sister Betty. Before leaving Oakland, I had told the comrades that we were not going to take any arrests on this trip. If anything happened, I said, we would fight right down to the last man, but we would definitely not give ourselves up to the police. We were going out there specifically to provide a bodyguard for Sister Betty, and unless they were willing to give up their lives, they ought not to come. We made this decision for two reasons. First, she was the widow of Brother Malcolm, our greatest leader and martyr, and the mother of his beautiful children. We would not allow anything to happen to her after the way the establishment had so treacherously assassinated her husband. Second, 
her cousin, Hakeem Jamal, had told me that when she visited Los Angeles, the police had run off Ron Karanga's group, which was providing an escort for her. They had left her standing alone in the middle of the street. My specific orders were that nobody was to be arrested, because to be arrested was to leave her, and a violation of our main purpose. We proceeded to the airport. When her plane arrived, we formed a circle around her, and led her to the waiting cars. People were standing around staring and wondering what was going on. The airport police were edgy and unhappy about our activity, but we knew what we were doing, and we knew the law. We were taking care of Malcolm's widow. From the airport, we took her to the office of Ramparts Magazine in downtown San Francisco for a meeting with Eldridge, Kenny Freeman, Isaac Moore, and some others. While they talked, we remained in an outer office, keeping out the police, who were lurking everywhere. When the group broke up, Sister Betty told us that she did not want any pictures taken by reporters. Therefore, as we left the building, we held up copies of ramparts around her. Dozens of reporters were waiting outside, and about 30 policemen. We were ready. A reporter named Chuck Banks from Channel 7 grabbed for my magazine, but I held onto it and told him to let my property go. I had a shotgun cradled in my right arm and the magazine in my left hand. When he could not wrench the magazine away, he pushed it against my chest. I dropped the magazine and hit him with a left hook. He went down. Just before I hit Banks, I had told four brothers to get Sister Betty out of there because I was sure, from the number of police in the building, that something was cooking outside. We were determined not to pull a Karenga. Finally, she made it to the car and drove off. Then I turned my attention to the situation at hand, telling the police to arrest Banks for hitting me in the chest and also for destroying my property. The police had a predictable reply. If we arrest anybody, it will be you. That is when I told my men to spread out and hit the street, surrounding the police. At this moment, one of the paper panthers, Roy Ballard, came running into the street without his weapon and hollered something like, Don't point that gun! I looked the head policeman in the eye and said, If you start drawing, this will be a bloodbath. My shotgun was in a ready position, safety off, and a shell in the chamber. The police had no shotguns, only revolvers. Had they started something, we would have wiped them out. This was the extent of the conversation with the police. Otherwise, the air was as quiet as death. I made my statement to the policeman. He saw my weapon and froze. When some of my comrades turned their backs to walk off, I told them not to give police a chance for justable homicide. Like others of its kind, this scene is chiseled in my memory. I can still see every detail of this tense, brief confrontation. And then we backed away to our cars, guns still held ready, and drove off. We had kept our promise to Sister Betty. We found out later about the Paper Panthers. Seeing how bad it might be, Roy Ballard had fled inside. He gave his gun to a woman in the office and told her to put it in her briefcase. Then he hid, trembling. He did not even leave with us. The Paper Panthers were simply another front for Ram, good for nothing but running a mimeograph machine and fat-mouthing. If Sister Betty had depended on them for security, she would have been stranded. A short time later, when the Malcolm Memorial Rally was over and Sister Betty had left town, 
we learned that the Paper Panthers had not carried loaded weapons that day, either at the airport or in front of ramparts. <clears throat> We'd stood down the police alone. Those fellows did not even own any bullets. When I asked Ballard about this later, he admitted it. Parentheses. A few weeks after this, we went to San Francisco, where the Paper Panthers were having a fish fry, and issued an ultimatum. They could merge with us or change their name or be annihilated. When they said they would do none of these things, we waited in. I took on one of them and hooked him in the jaw. It was a short battle, ending a few moments later when somebody fired a shot in the air, and people scattered. After that, the Paper Panthers changed their name. End of parentheses. After the Ramparts confrontation, we returned to Black House and relaxed until it was time for the memorial rally that night at Hunters Point Community Center in the middle of San Francisco's low-income black community. <clears throat> we did not see Sister Betty until again until then, although she wanted to meet us. The Paper Panthers had stolen her away. They told her that we were all in the same party, and that night they escorted her to the rally while we provided security. We were supposed to speak during the program, but Kenny Freeman of RAM, the Master of Ceremonies, froze us out. On the way from Black House to the Memorial Rally, Eldritch rode in the car with me, and while we drove he asked to join the Black Panther Party. This surprised me. I had given up all hope that he would join <clears throat> because he had expressed no interest, and I never try to recruit by keeping after people. Once they have heard the program, it is up to them. But Eldridge was a man who kept his peace. He had apparently made up his mind to join much earlier when we went to the Paper Panther's office to talk about escorting Betty Shabazz. My surprise quickly turned to pleasure. Eldridge had skills that Bobby and I lacked, skills that were needed for our program. He was an eloquent writer, and his past experiences would make him a strong comrade for the difficult days ahead. I had no reservations about him, although even then something struck me about our conversation that only recently had begun to make sense. He kept calling me Bobby and talking about how that Newton really blew. A short time before, I had been invited to speak on the mall at Provo Park in Berkeley, but had sent Alex Papillon in my place. Somehow, the newsman had mistaken Papillon for me when the announcer used my name in telling people that I had sent him. To complicate matters further, Eldridge had mistaken Alex Papillon for Bab Bobby Seal. Alex had a gun strapped to his side, and every time he made a strong point, he would pat his pistol. He became known as the Pistol Padding Panther. I do not know how Eldridge was aware of this event. Perhaps he was there. But as far as he was concerned, the Pistol Packer was Newton. And so in the car, he kept saying Newton sure did blow, talking about the fantastic speech. I was so amused by this, I let him go on, waiting to see how long it would take Eldridge to get us straight. I think his desire to belong was a cumulative thing, built slowly at the meeting about Betty Shabazz at Provo Park, in front of Ramparts. I see now that Eldridge was not dedicated to helping black people, but was in search of a strong manhood symbol. This was a common misconception at the time, that the party was searching for badges of masculinity. In fact, the reverse is true. The party acted as it did because we were men. Many failed to perceive the difference. As for Eldridge, at that stage of his life, he was probing for his own manhood. The party's uniforms, the guns, the street action, all added up to an image of strength. 
and so he left the Organization for Afro-American Unity and the Paper Panthers to join us in the late spring of 1967. It must be said, in all honesty, that Eldridge at the beginning made great contributions to the party. He is a fine writer, an effective speaker, and an intelligent and talented human being. We felt then that his contribution would be to write for, and edit, the Black Panther paper, which we began publishing in April 1967. Bobby Seale had thought up the paper, which immediately became an important vehicle for communicating the truth about the party and the community. But only three of us were working on it, which is a next to impossible task for a publication running at least 12 pages an issue, and sometimes up to 20. Publishing first as a monthly, our goal was to have it on the street every two weeks and, if possible, once a week. Eldridge took a good part of the workload. I soon noticed, however, that Eldridge was not around when the deadlines came. We used to have to shakabuku him into writing and editing. Because he was a writer, I found his reluctance difficult to understand. He seemed to work with enthusiasm only after something sensational had taken place. A shooting, perhaps, or when he was either out of town or in jail. <clears throat> After Bobby Hutton was killed in April 1968, and Eldridge was sentenced to Vacaville, the paper appeared regularly, every week. But once out of prison, he fell back into his old, uncooperative ways. He was always somewhat withdrawn, and worked best by himself, doing his own thing in one way or another. And the newspaper suffered. This kind of independence hurt the party. It was essential that everyone work together and pitch in, especially when we had a project going. For instance, I wanted Eldridge to talk to party members, particularly the newer and younger ones, about some of the topics he discussed with the Yippies, the Peace and Freedom Party, radical white youth political organizations, and on campuses. I had great respect for the insight and knowledge he had acquired through study and reading. But when I tried to teach him, persuade him to teach a class to the troops, he refused. He never taught one class or attempted to organize any programs. He was always off talking on radio and television and before all sorts of groups that seemed more glamorous and exciting to him. Eldridge misunderstood the white radical movement. He exploited their alienation and encouraged young whites to think of themselves as, quote, bad blacks, thus driving them ever further away from their own community. At the same time, he seduced young blacks into picturing themselves as bohemian expatriates from middle-class, quote, Babylon, as he poetically, but mistakenly, ana analogized super-industrial America. So we became temporarily alien to the black community, while the white radicals were plunged deeper into their peculiar identity crisis. Cleaver's genius for political and cultural schizophrenia infected us all, black and white, and the opportunity was missed for youth of both races to express and make concrete their authentic un and underlying solidarity and love. This still remains to be done. Relating as Bobby and I did to the lumpen proletariat of the black community, we were down on bo bohemians and white radicals. But when Eldridge joined, he soon took us to meet the diggers in San Francisco at their store in Haight-Ashbury. And once there, we had no idea of why, why we had come. Eldridge had not explained anything. The store was incredibly disorganized. After fighting our way through piles of garbage, 
we managed to have a discussion with some of the diggers. It turned out they wanted us to develop a peace force for them, a kind of protective guard, because they were being harassed by some of the lowriders in the area. When this point came up, I tuned out. What right had these people to ask us for protection? I told them to form their own peace force. Eldridge hung out a lot in Haight-Ashbury, and on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. And although we avoided further involvement with the diggers, before long we were attracting hippies and yippies to the party. A lot of them were deep into drugs. Because Bobby and I had started out as black nationalists and were influenced by the Muslims and Malcolm X, we steered clear of the drug scene. Unlike Eldridge, neither of us identified with Haight-Ashbury or Telegraph Avenue, and especially not with drugs. I had sought out Eldridge because he was an ex-convict, thinking he could not be all bad if he had pulled time. But my trust and belief in him were mistaken. He dealt several serious blows to the party, not only by welcoming hippies, but also by failing to use his voice to push Black Panther programs, or improve our paper, or be involved with the poor of the community, or create a political vehicle. He talked only empty rhetoric about, quote, dealing blows and triggering sensational actions. All in all, Eldridge lived in a fantasy world. As time passed, he drifted away from us and from the ideology and aims of the Black Panther Party. Colossal events were to take place, events that would threaten our very existence. And after each of these setbacks, Eldridge's real position became clearer and clearer, although for a long time I was reluctant to admit or even recognize the truth. Brothers are bound together by the revolutionary love we have for each other, a love forged through loyalty and trust. It is an element of the Black Panther Party that can never be destroyed. Yet eventually Eldritch betrayed this love and commitment in ways I never believed possible. End of chapter 18 Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 19 Introductory Quote It is not often that one encounters in any black ghetto in this country a family that has not experienced some immediate contact with the corrupt judicial system and a repressive prison apparatus. It is not only impossible for a black revolutionary to get justice in the courts, but black people in general have been the victims rather than the recipients of bourgeois justice. Angela Davis, If They Come in the Morning. Section. Denzel Dowell. North Richmond is an all-black community of about 9,000 inhabitants on the northwest side of the city of Richmond. It came into being during World War II when this area was used to provide limited and temporary housing for blacks, like my father who came from the south to work in the shipyards. Kaiser Industries, the main employers at the time, were responsible for the establishment of the community. They expected the people to go back south after they were no longer needed. But the south had little to offer, and the people had other ideas. When they stayed, the establishment found ways to punish them. Most of North Richmond is gerrymandered out of the city proper and cut off from any assistance from public agencies, except the Contra Costa County agencies. Many of these are run by racists who do not want blacks there. As a consequence, many people live in poverty and hardship. On one side of the community is a large garbage dump filled with rats. On another, standard oil refineries pour out their wastes and fumes on the community. Some days it is hard to draw breath without choking and coughing. 
The industrial needs of the area are obviously more important than the human needs of the people. No more than two or three streets lead into North Richmond, and each of these has a number of railroad tracks crossing it. This makes it difficult for the people to get out when emergency situations arise. They have to sit in their cars waiting for the freight trains to pass by. This limited access to the community makes it possible for the police to seal off the area any time they want, and they have used that power often. About half the population is under 19 years of age, a fact that presents special problems in terms of education and youth programs, since there is a great need for these functions. Many youths graduate from high school just as illiterate as I was, headed for the social trash heap. Recently, in 1971, one of the new playgrounds built by the people, built by the people could not be used by children because the rats that came from the dump and the creek terrorized them. Reports in the San Francisco Chronicle indicated clearly that city officials believed the people wanted the rats, and that is why they were there. North Richmond is no different from countless black communities in California and the rest of the United States. Cut off, ignored, and forgotten, the people are kept in a state of subjugation, especially by the police, who treat the communities like colonies. The family of Denzel Dowell lives in North Richmond, and it was there, on April 1st, 1967, that their son and brother was killed by officers of the Sheriff's Department of Contra Costa County. He was 22 years old. They said he was running away from a stolen car that had been flagged down by the police. Because he was allegedly in the act of committing a felony, his death was ruled, quote, justifiable homicide. We were introduced to the Dowell family after Denzel's death by Mark Comfort, a bright, strong man with a long history of organizing blacks in the Oakland area. The Dowells had asked us to come to their home because of dissatisfaction with the official treatment of Denzel's death. Like most black families, they recognized the treachery of the police, but they knew how little could be done about Denzel's death through the established institutions. The whole Dowell family considered themselves Black Panthers. Visiting them one Sunday afternoon, we were touched to see the deep sorrow and sense of helplessness so common among Blacks under these circumstances. I had seen it many times in my work, and we were to see it again and again as we became more deeply involved in the life of the people. Mrs. Dowell, a beautiful and noble black woman, told us about her son's life. She had spent much of her time and energy trying to survive in North Richmond, supporting her family and raising the children right. She had done her best with what she had, and she had done a good job. Yet nothing could be done about the schools and other institutions that blocked her children from reaching the goals they had been taught to aim for. She was terribly upset about Denzel's death, and over the indifferent and contemptuous way the authorities treated it. She knew that her son had been murdered in cold blood. We began our investigation at the same time the police were carrying out theirs. While they tried to establish a cover for their treachery, we searched for the truth. Policemen were constantly coming to Mrs. Dowell's house and treating her like dirt. They would knock on the door, walk in, and search the premises any time they wanted. I happened to be at the house one day when they came, and when Mrs. Dowell answered the knock, a policeman pushed his way in, asking questions. I grabbed my shotgun and stepped in front of her, telling him to either produce a search warrant or leave. He stood for a minute, shocked 
then ran out to his car and drove off. When we read the police report of the incident, we rejected it and continued our own investigation, always carrying our weapons in full view. Together with the Dowells, we visited the spot where the murder allegedly took place and checked every possible, every possible detail. From my study of police methods in college, I came up with a number of inconsistencies in the official report. For example, the police claimed that Denzel had jumped one fence and was about to jump another when he was shot. But Denzel had had a hip injury from an automobile accident and could hardly have run, let alone jump fences. The lot he supposedly ran across was an automobile junkyard full of garbage and oil, yet no oil was found on his shoes. The police said that he bled to death after being shot, but no pool of blood was noted at the site or anywhere else. We also learned that Denzel's brother and friends had found him lying all alone. After shooting him, the police had made no effort to summon medical aid or to save his life. All this was particularly significant and disturbing in light of the fact that Denzel was known to the police, and they had threatened him to get him on a number of occasions. In the dark, far from witnesses, they carried out their murderous treachery. The same thing happened to little Bobby Hutton, to Fred Hampton, and to Mark Clark in Chicago, to the students of Orangeburg and Jackson State Massacres in the South. It has happened to many thousands of unknown blacks throughout the history of this country, poor and powerless victims whose families were too terrorized or weak to cry out against their oppressors. The police murder us outright and call it justifiable homicide. They always cook up a story, but simple investigation will expose their lies. That is why we must disarm and control the police in our communities if we want to survive. When our investigation disproved the official story, we indicted the police for the murder of Denzel Dowell and called a community meeting to discuss our findings. We held a rally on the corner of 3rd Street and Chesley in North Richmond on a Saturday afternoon. Our troops with weapons at the ready were stationed on all four corners of the intersection. The community was a little timid, but proud to see black men take a stance in their interests. And when we arrived, everybody was very receptive. They asked a number of questions about the guns, if they were loaded, and if carrying them was legal. We explained our weapons policy and told them about their right to carry arms. Then a remarkable thing happened. One by one, many of the community members went home and got their guns and came to join us. Even one old sister of 70 years or so was out there with her shotgun. When they learned of the meeting, the police were again afraid and uncertain. One policeman was sitting in his car on the corner when we arrived. They do that frequently in North, North Richmond. Just drive up to the corner of 3rd and Chesley and sit there, intimidating the people. But when we arrived and took positions with our guns, followed by a crowd, he took off like a shot. Bobby spoke first, and I followed. We ran down everything known about the case and exposed the errors in the police version. The people were impressed that some of their own had come forward to confront the police with factual evidence. We called on the community to arm and defend themselves against the racist dogs, stressing that it was their right and we were there to teach them, not only in theory, but also through practice. While we were talking, another policeman drove down to Chelsea Street. When he saw the people gathered, he kept coming, 
but at the first sight of our guns he turned around in the middle of the street and sped away. The people cheered. Soon after, we had another meeting with the community to discuss the case and what could be done about it. Now that we had presented our findings, we wanted to move their consciousness to a higher level. This meeting was held indoors to permit close discussion. At least two attorneys were there, a white one from the poverty program and a black lawyer interested in the case. Neither of them took a strong stand. The poverty program lawyer agreed that Denzel's death was a case of murder, but said there was little he could do. Denzel Dowell was dead. He could not stick his neck out too far, since he was hired with public funds to assist the community. They advised the family to go to Martinez, the county seat, and talk to Sheriff Younger, who was in charge of the police patrolling the community. This seemed like a good idea, and after the meeting we took our arms and escorted the family to the sheriff's office. When we arrived, the police had surrounded the building and blocked all the elevators. They told us we could not enter with weapons, but we knew we were not in violation of the law. We asked them to produce the law that forbade us to enter the building with weapons. They could not do it. Although they admitted there was no statute, they still would not give us permission to enter. So we went inside anyway and insisted on seeing Younger. Police and sheriff's office personnel crowded into the elevators and blocked the doors to the stairs. When we demanded they arrest us or stand aside, they refused, saying they would not arrest us because there was no violation, but also they were not going to permit, permit us to go any farther with our weapons. This goes again that when the oppressor cannot get his will through legal devices, he will act illegally. We were thoroughly outnumbered, and the family, already upset, still wanted to talk to Younger. The Dowells asked us to leave our weapons in the car and come in anyway, mistakenly thinking they would get somewhere by talking. Out of respect for the family, we left the weapons behind and escorted the family to the sheriff's office. Younger refused to suspend the policeman who had killed Denzel, nor would he discuss the department policy about shooting suspects. If we want a change in our communities, he said, we ought to go to Sacramento and petition the legislature to change the law. He said that according to the law, even if Denzel Dowell was not armed, and he was not, no weapon was ever found, quote, reasonable cause existed to believe that he was in the act of committing a felony. Therefore, the officer had a right to kill him. <clears throat> Despite the evidence we had found, the sheriff said this was the law, and if we did not like it, only the legislature could help us. After this interview, the family saw even more clearly that no established institution would deal justice in the death of their loved one. Denzel had been executed by a policeman, and the law said this was legal if any, quote, reasonable policeman believed that a suspect was in the act of committing a felony. This is a very bitter reality. The policemen assigned to control us are not reasonable men. They are inhuman madmen who see the black community as a place of aberrant behavior and who therefore feel, quote, justified in killing us in the dark of night. No official investigation into the death of Denzel Dowell was ever held, despite a promise from the district attorney's office in Martinez. In the public records, Denzel is just another dead suspect, branded as guilty by a corrupt, uncaring police department and an indifferent legal system.
The fact that his family mourned his loss, or that his name was never cleared, does not move them. It was the same old story. The Black Panther Party had done as much as it could in dealing with the authorities. But another avenue was open to us. We could go beyond Martinez and take our investigation of Denzel's case to the people. Bobby suggested that we put out a leaflet describing the rally and what the Black Panther Party was trying to do for the Dowell family. The boldly headlined leaflet dealt with all aspects of the murder. This was our first newspaper, and when we held it in our hands, it seemed we had taken down another barrier between the Black Panthers and the community. We had never even thought of putting out a newspaper before. Words on paper had always seemed futile. But the Dowell case prompted us to find a way to inform the community about the facts and mobilize them to action. Lacking access to radio, television, or any of the other mass media, we needed an alternative means of communication. No one would do it for us. The party had only five or six full-time regulars, but we relied on the community to help us out. Many people knew Denzel Dowell personally and willingly pitched in. Most of the labor for the first paper was contributed by a hippie underground mimeographing outfit in San Francisco. This was the time when underground newspapers were just beginning. If you took material to them, they would print it out for you on an electric stenciling machine. We bought supplies, paper, ink, and staples, and put the leaflet together. Then we took it into the community. We tried to pay paperboys to insert our paper into the Richmond Independent, the Oakland Tribune, and the San Francisco Chronicle before they delivered them. But when they saw what our sheet was about, they did it for nothing. After delivering their own papers, they went around and passed ours out. We circulated about 3,000 the first time, asking for a donation of 10 cents. This went into a fund for the funeral expenses of the Dowell family, and also for the costs of printing the paper. If anyone did not have ten cents, we gave him a paper anyway and asked him to read it. But most people gave. Besides North Richmond, we distributed the paper in Parchester Village, a small black settlement about a mile north and also in some of the black sections of South Richmond. We walked everywhere, passing out newspapers, taking them from a borrowed van that went alongside us mile after mile. We were an unusual sight in Richmond, or any other place, dressed in our black leather jackets, wearing black berets and gloves, and carrying our shotguns over our shoulders. Bobby always strapped a forty-five pistol to his side. People would stop us and call to us, asking us what we were distributing. This was a good example of our form of armed propaganda. I say our form because it was not exactly the way it happened in Cuba. The Cuban people, impressed by the successes of Castro's guerrillas, left their home to follow him. Thus, for Castro, guerrilla warfare was a good form of propaganda. Walking armed through Richmond was our propaganda. People showed respect for the party, not only by wanting to read about Denzel Dowell, but also by wanting to learn more about us. This had always been our aim, to arouse interest in the case and in the party. Then we could go on to explain the necessity for armed self-defense, an idea that was not hard to put across since the people knew the problems and had been looking for solutions. The Denzel Dowell case was critical to the development of the Black Panther Party. 
It led to our first national exposure. And it also helped us launch our paper, which was a way of interpreting events to the community from a black perspective. Our intercommunal news service and weekly paper, the Black Panther, have become central in the Black Panther survival programs. So, in one sense, Denzel Dowell's death was not in vain. Every issue continues the struggle we began in his cause. In a way, the Black Panther newspaper is a living memorial to him. End of section. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton Chapter 20 Section Sacramento and the, quote, Panther Bill Bobby and I look back on the early days of the Black Panthers with nostalgia. It was a time of discovery and enthusiasm. We had hit on something unique. By standing up to the police as equals, even holding them off, and yet remaining within the law, we had demonstrated black pride to the community in a concrete way. Everywhere we went, we caused traffic jams. People constantly stopped us to say how much they respected our courage. The idea of armed self-defense as a community policy was still new and a little intimidating to them, but it also made them think. More important, it created a feeling of solidarity. We saw how black citizens reacted to our movement. We were greatly encouraged. Despite the ever-present danger of retaliation, the risks were more than worth it. At that time, however, our activities were confined to a small area, and we wanted black people throughout the country to know the Oakland story. In April 1967, we were invited to appear on a radio talk show in Oakland, the kind where people phone in questions and make comments. Early in the program, we explained our 10-point program, why we were focusing on point seven, and why it was necessary for black men to arm themselves. We also made it clear that we were within our constitutional rights. Hundreds of calls poured in. The lines were jammed. Some people agreed with us. Others disputed our points. We welcomed the discussion because criticism helped us to find weaknesses in our program and to sharpen our position. One of the callers was Donald Mulford, a conservative Republican state assemblyman from Piedmont, one of the wealthy white sections of Oakland. Mulford was so close to Oakland's power structure that his call could only mean he saw political profit in attacking the Black Panthers. He told us that he planned to introduce a bill into the state legislature to make it illegal for us to patrol with our weapons. It was a bill, he said, that would, quote, get the Black Panthers. Mulford's call was a logical response of the system. We knew how the system operated. If we used the laws in our own interests and against theirs, then the power structure would simply change the laws. Mulford was more than willing to be the agent of change. A few days later, the paper carried a story about Mulford's, quote, Panther Bill. In its particulars was what we had, ex had expected, a bill intended to suppress the people's constitutional right to bear arms. Until then, white men had owned and carried weapons with impunity. Groups like the Minutemen and the Rangers in Richmond were known to have arsenals, but nobody introduced bills against them. Mulford had been asked by the Oakland police to introduce this bill because some, quote, young black toughs, as they called us, were walking around with guns. The bill was further evidence of this country's vicious double standard against blacks. The usual pattern of white racism was gradually being put into effect. They would escalate the killing of blacks, 
but this time the police would do the job that the Ku Klux Klan had done in the past. The Black Panthers have never viewed such paramilitary groups as the Ku Klux Klan or the Minutemen as particularly dangerous. The real danger comes from highly organized establishment forces, the local police, National Guard, and the United States military. They were the ones who devastated Watts and killed innocent people. In comparison to them, the paramilitary groups are insignificant. In fact, these groups are hardly organized at all. It is the uniformed men who are dangerous and who come into our communities every day to commit violence against us, knowing that the laws will protect them. Bobby Seale and I discussed the Mulford Bill against his background. Sheriff Younger had suggested facetiously that the Dowell family attempt to get their case heard at the state capitol. The Dowell family only wanted some good to come out of all the grief inflicted on them. We knew that the Dowells would get no better consideration in Sacramento than they had received from Younger. The legislators would probably tell them to go to the governor and the governor would point them to Washington. Institutions work this way. A son is murdered by the police, and nothing is done. The institutions send the victim's family on a merry-go-round, going from one agency to another, until they wear out and give up. This is a very effective way to beat down poor and oppressed people who do not have the time to prosecute their cases. Time is money to poor people. To go to Sacramento means loss of a day's pay, often loss of a job. If this is a democracy, obviously it is a bourgeois democracy, limited to the middle and upper classes. Only they can afford to participate in it. Knowing all this, we nonetheless made plans to go to Sacramento. That we would not change any laws was irrelevant, and all of us, Black Panthers and Dowels, realized that from the start. Since we were resigned to a runaround in Sacramento, we decided to raise the encounter to a higher level in the hope of warning people about the dangers in the Mulford Bill and the ideas behind it. A national outcry would help the Dowell family by showing them that some good had come from their tragedy. Also, it might mobilize our community even more. Dozens of reporters and photographers haunt the Capitol, waiting for a, a story. This made it the perfect forum for our proclamation. If the legislators got the message, too, well and good. But our primary purpose was to deliver it to the people. Actually, several groups went. Four or five members of the Dowell family, a group of brothers from East Oakland recruited by Mark Comfort, and the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers and Comfort's cadre were armed. The party agreed that I ought not to make the trip for two reasons. First, I was on probation from the old Odell Lee case, and they did not want to jeopardize my freedom. Second, if any arrests were made in Sacramento, someone should be able to raise bail money and do whatever else was necessary. Before they left, I prepared executive mandate number one, which was to be our message to the black communities. It read, quote, The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general, and black people in particular, to take careful note of the racist California legislature now considering legislation aimed at keeping black people disarmed and powerless, while racist police agencies throughout the country intensify the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. At the same time that the American government is waging a racist war of genocide in Vietnam, 
the concentration camps in which Japanese Americans were interned during World War II are being renovated and expanded. Since America has historically reserved its most barbaric treatment for non-white people, we are forced to conclude that these concentration camps are being prepared for the black people, who are determined to gain their freedom by any means necessary. The enslavement of black people at the very founding of this country, the genocide practice on the American Ind Indians, and the confinement of the survivors on reservations, the savage lynching of thousands of black men and women, the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and now the cowardly massacre in Vietnam, all testify to the fact that towards people of color, the racist power structure of America has but one policy. Repression, genocide, terror, and the big stick. Black people have begged, prayed, petitioned, and demonstrated, among other things, to get the racist power structure of America to right the wrongs which have historically been perpetrated against black people. All of these efforts have been answered by more repression, deceit, and hypocrisy. As the aggression of the racist American government escalates in Vietnam, the police agencies of America escalate the repression of black people throughout the ghettos of America. Vicious police dogs, cattle prods, and increased patrols have become familiar sights in black communities. City Hall turns a deaf ear to the pleas of black people for relief from this increasing terror. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense believes that the time has come for black people to arm themselves against this terror before it is too late. The pending Mulford Act brings the hour of doom one step nearer. A people who have suffered so much for so long at the hands of a racist society must draw the line somewhere. We believe that the black communities of America must rise up as one man to halt the progression of a trend that leads inevitably to their total destruction. End of statement. When I gave Bobby his instructions, I impressed upon him that our main purpose was to deliver the message to the people. If he was fired upon, he should return the fire. If a gun was drawn on him, and it was his interpretation that the gun was drawn in anger, he was to use whatever means necessary to defend himself. His instructions were not to fire or take the offensive unless in imminent danger. If they attempted to arrest him, he was to take the arrest as long as he had delivered the message. The main thing was to deliver the message. In stressing these points, I told him that if he was invited in or allowed inside the legislature, he was to read the message inside, but if it was against the rules to enter the legislature, or if measures were taken to block him, then he was not to enter, but to read the message from the Capitol steps. The Black Panther troops rolled out for Sacramento early on the morning of May 2nd. As soon as they left, I went to my mother's house. I had promised to mow her lawn that day. But I took a portable radio along and put it on the front step to listen for news. In the house, I turned the television set on and asked my mother to keep an eye on it. Then I started mow mowing. About noon, a bulletin interrupted the radio program. It told of brothers at the Capitol with weapons. My mother called out to me that all channels were showing the event. I ran into the house, and there was Bobby reading the mandate. The message was definitely going out. Bobby read it twice, but the press and the people assembled were so amazed at the Black Panther's presence, and particularly the weapons, that few appeared to hear the important thing. They were concentrating on the weapons. We had hoped that after the weapons gained their attention, they would listen to the message. 
Later, another bulletin came on, saying that the brothers had been arrested, Bobby for carrying a concealed weapon, although he was only wearing his gun openly on his hip. Some of the other brothers were charged with failing to remove the rounds from the chambers of their guns when they put the weapons back in the car. I got on the phone and finally made contact with one of the Black Panther women who had gone along. She told me what had happened, and I began to initiate the next phase of our plan, raising bail money. That night, I went to a local radio station, where a talk show was on. People calling in to discuss the incident had been told that I was in jail, and I decided the best way to deal with that was by confrontation. So I went in there, as Malcolm would have done, and asked for equal airtime. One of the startled program directors looked at me and said, Well, you're sort of in jail. I said, Yes, I am in jail, but let me have equal time anyway. On the air, I explained the Sacramento ploy. My explanation was not very effective, I felt, because people who call these shows are always more interested in themselves than in the issues, and you have to fight through that first. But I was able to make an appeal for money. We were faced with $50,000 bail in Sacramento, and within 24 hours I had raised the 5000 needed to get the troops back on the streets. Our plans had worked exactly as we hoped. Looking back, I think our tactic at Sacramento was correct at that time. But it was also a mistake in a way. It was the first time in our brief existence that an armed group of Black Panthers had been arrested, and it was a turning point in police perceptions. We took the arrests because we had a higher purpose. But it was not until then that the police started attempting to, to disarm the party. They leveled shotguns on the brothers, handcuffed them, and generally pushed them around. I had given orders not to fire unless fired upon. Maybe the order should have been to fire on everybody in there. Then they would have realized we were serious. But our purpose was not to kill, it was to inform to let the nation know where the party stood. The police, however, took it to mean that the party was only a front with weapons, and that we would not defend ourselves. This attitude caused a number of problems for us, and it took some time to restore caution to the police after Sacramento. Now everything is as, is as it used to be, because they know they will have a fight on their hands if they try to attack us. Sacramento was certainly a success, however, in attracting international attention. Even those who did not hear the complete message saw the arms, and this conveyed enough to black people. The Bay Area became more aware of the party, and soon we had more members than we could handle. From all across the country, calls came to us about establishing chapters and branches. We could hardly keep track of the requests. In a matter of months, we went from a small Bay Area group to a national organization, and we began moving to implement our 10-point program. End of chapter 20. Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Chapter 21. Introductory quote. I have made up my mind. Wherever I go, I shall go as a man and not as a slave. I shall always be courteous and mild in deportment towards all with whom I come into contact, at the same time firmly and constantly endeavoring to assert my equal right as a man and as a brother. Frederick Douglass, My Bondage and My Freedom Section Growing Pains The Mulford Bill passed the California Legislature in July 1967 by a huge majority. As soon as the law was changed, making it illegal to carry loaded weapons, 
we stopped the armed patrols. The police understood this to mean that we were ready to submit, and they stepped up their campaign of harassment. Only a, few, only a month after the Sacramento trip, we were subjected to another stupid and childish incident. One night in June, a bail fund party was held in Richmond. <clears throat> as soon as we arrived, the police miraculously appeared, but remained outside in their parked cars. This was an ominous sign. We decided to ignore them, however, and we remained inside all evening having a fine party. When the party began breaking up about 2 a.m., we decided to stay a while longer to avoid trouble, since we thought the police might leave when the place emptied out a little. But it turned out they wanted us, the Black Panthers. It became a waiting game. The police cut their motors and lights and sat in the darkness. We stayed inside and went right on enjoying ourselves. Finally, all of us had to leave. About 5 a.m. We came out and we got into our cars. One of the Black Panther members, John Sloan, made a U-turn in the middle of the block and drove off, away from the police. To my knowledge, such a turn in a residential area is perfectly legal, but the police pursued him, stopped him about a block away from the house, and began writing out a ticket. We stopped our cars a reasonable distance from this exchange and got out to watch. Sloan refused to sign for the ticket. He had been drinking at the party, and this may have affected his behavior, but at any rate, he would not sign where he was supposed to. When an argument broke out, I walked over to his car and said, Sign the ticket. If there's any problem, we'll take it up in court, but sign the ticket. Sloan went right on arguing, and soon seven or eight more policemen arrived. Among them was a young recruit, no more than 22 or 23, who went up to all of us, standing on the sidewalk, and began stepping heavily on one foot after another. When he got to me, I pulled my foot back. It was no time for a fight. After he passed, I ignored him and tried to get John Sloan to calm down and sign the ticket. Sloan finally came around and was about to sign when the recruit stepped on the feet of a brother, who promptly held him off in a vigorous fashion. That was all the police needed. They charged the brother and began to beat him with their clubs. I ran up to them, saying, This isn't necessary. It's not necessary. None of us were armed, or the situation would have been different. But, cowardly as ever, they were unrestrainedly attacking an unarmed man, overpowering him. When I saw how brutally they were beating the brother, I went over to one of the policemen and put my hand on his arm to restrain him. This man was big and powerfully built. He spun around and charged me, holding me back against the car in a chokehold so tight I could not move. The other brothers ran to my assistance. The policeman had reached for his gun because he was afraid the people would storm him, but I told them not to do anything, and I took the arrest, along with John Sloan and the brother who had shoved the policeman off his foot. All the way to the station, Sloan and the other brother angrily cursed the policeman. I tried to calm them down. We were handcuffed and there was no point in further struggle. But they kept right on protesting and cursing, and when we got to the station, the police began working them over. Their arms were still restrained. Since I said nothing, I got off lightly. The police provoked me, but I refused to respond. I just kept telling the other guys to shut up, but they would not, and so they got a real beating. The big guy who had charged me was right in the middle of it, giving as many blows as he could, really enjoying his work. After the brothers were subdued, he mopped his brow, straightened out his clothes, and told the others, I have to go home now because I promised to take my wife and the kids to church at nine.
when we began to receive requests for assistance in starting new branches of the party, we realized our need for more than courageous troops. We lacked an administrative body that could handle these requests and supervise a large-scale organization. The brothers on the block had none of the bourgeois skills needed for this. Yet these skills were necessary, even though we did not want bourgeois values. So we looked for ways to solve our administrative problems while continuing our work with the Street Brothers. I had to respect the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, for having some of the most disciplined organizers in the country. When we had first talked of forming a party, Bobby and I read about their work in the South, registering people to vote and organizing cooperatives and the like. We felt they could do a good job of administering the party because they were all committed people and highly skilled. Their leadership came from college campuses. Our original plan was to draft Stokely Carmichael of SNCC into the party and make him prime minister, then to add all the SNCC leadership to the party's administrative positions, including H. Rapp Brown and James Foreman. By doing this, we hoped to create a merger, not a coalition, since it seemed to us that only by merging could we produce the strong leadership we needed. The movement was cresting around the country. Brothers on the block in many northern cities were moving angrily in response to the problems that overwhelmed them. New York and other eastern cities had exploded in 1964. Watts went up in 1965. Cleveland in 1966. And in 1967, another long hot summer was approaching. But the brothers needed direction for their energies. The party wanted no more spontaneous riots because the outcome was always the same. The people might liberate their territories for a few short days or hours, but eventually the military force of the oppressor would wipe out their gains. Having neither the strength nor the organization, the people were powerless. In the final analysis, riots caused only more repression and the loss of brave men. Blacks bled and died in the riots, and went to jail on petty or false charges. If the brothers could be organized into disciplined cadres, working in broadly based community programs, then the energy expended in riots could be directed towards permanent and positive changes. The matter was urgent. Police were being strengthened nature nationwide and given more power. In order to deal with this, we had to organize our resources and develop an administrative body. On the other hand, although SNCC had skills, we felt they were headed for a decline, because the thrust of the movement was diminishing in the South and moving inward to the cities of the North and West. At this point in time, it seemed that SNCC and the Black Panther Party needed each other, and Black people needed us both. By making Stokely prime minister, head of the party, we were in effect voting to give leadership of the party to SNCC. We even considered moving our headquarters to Atlanta, where would be, we would be under SNCC in their buildings, with access to their duplicating equipment and other sorely needed materials. Our long range plan was to organize the communities of the North, especially the brothers on the block, using SNCC's administrative talent coordinate the activities. Combining their work in the South and ours in the North would give the forces of Black liberation a powerful striking force. We drew up our plans, drafting Stokely Carmichael as Prime Minister, H. Rapp Brown as Minister of Justice, and James Foreman as Minister of Foreign Affairs. Our own position was clear we would accept whatever places in the administration they had for us. We were not hung up on status. Eldridge, Bobby, and I were in full agreement about this. 
A party as such did not interest me. I was more concerned about the revolution and the freedom of the black, of the black people and getting the best personnel in positions of authority to bring these goals about. From the beginning, Black Panther leadership had been a casual thing, designed only to give our ideas a form and a structure. Eldridge got in touch with Stokely about the merger. They had met early in 1967, when Eldridge traveled with Stokely on an assignment for Ramparts. We had met other SNCC people then, too, so Eldridge handled communications. We also got in touch with Rap Brown and James Foreman, who both seemed to go along with the plan. They, in turn, were supposed to inform the rest of the governing body of SNCC, and we thought this had been done when Brown and Foreman indicated that SNCC approved of the merger. But the scheme never worked as, w as we had hoped. We later found out that it had all been empty talk on their part. According to others on the governing body of SNCC, the matter was never brought up formally, despite assurances to us by Brown and Foreman. Nor was the entire membership notified of any plans for a merger. So when we announced the merger, that we were delivering the Black Panthers to them, some of the SNCC people reacted in a paranoid way. They thought we were trying to co-opt them. As a result, some SNCC members, Julius Lester and others, wrote articles criticizing us, saying that we had not approached the right people in attempting to accomplish the merger. We took offense at this. We had gone through the people we knew and those who spoke publicly for SNCC since we thought the organization was behind them. But apparently it was not. I think the main problem was a basic lack of trust. If we supported each other and were honest, I felt sure that a certain level of trust would be reached. This is very crucial in any good relationship, more crucial perhaps in this case, since the merger was susceptible to misrepresentation and misunderstanding. But there was no real trust, because SNCC's people believed we wanted to take over their organization. Whereas the reverse was true, we intended to give them complete control. They just did not see it that way. Later, when I was in jail, I was told that they had totally rejected any plans for a merger because I never answered a letter they wrote me. I was in solitary confinement all this time and did not receive a letter from SNCC. But they held me responsible nonetheless. It worked out for the best in the end, however, because when SNCC took their turn in the wrong direction, we were not dragged along. They had talked socialism for a while, but when they backtracked and started to advocate a separate nation and to ignore the world-class problem, any relationship with Stokely would have been problematical. We realized this when we first got in touch with African guerrilla groups and other freedom fighters. They said they had had confidence in Stokely at first, believing him to be a revolutionary. But when he aligned himself with reactionary African governments, he lost his credibility. He had come into their countries barely acknowledging them, talking about the new alliance he was forming with Nkrumah, and making himself a spokesman for African freedom fighters. Then the revolutionaries found out that Nkrumah did not really support Stokely's position on race. I first met Stokely in May 1967, when he came to speak in the Bay Area. We met once at Eldridge's house, and another time at Beverly Axelrod's. Several times we drove to San Mateo together to meet with small community groups. Stokely wrote in a recent book that when he visited the Bay Area, Bobby and I had asked his permission to start an organization and call it the Black Panther Party. This is untrue. Bobby and I together had chosen the party's name, 
taking it from the symbol of the Black Panther used by the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which Stokely had helped found in Mississippi. We never asked Stokely's advice about starting the party. We were organized before we met him. Anyway, we broke with Snick, not really wanting to, but realizing we could accomplish little with their, without their trust. Later, I was glad of the break, because Stokely's views are so inconsistent, you never know where he is coming from. When a man is consistent, you at least know what is happening and what to expect. Stokely says one thing one day and another thing the next. He accuses us of misleading people by our coalitions with whites. But I say he confuses people when he goes to Washington and tries to prevent a black policeman from being kicked off the force. A policeman who takes orders to kill his own people and who protects the establishment. Stokely told me he would support anyone, he did not care who, if the person was black. We consider this viewpoint both racist and suicidal. If you support a black man with a gun who belongs to the military arm of your oppressor, then you are assisting in your own destruction. Our plans for a merger with SNCC probably would not have come in time to prevent the summer riots of 1967. In July and August, when the black communities of Newark and Detroit erupted in rage and frustration, our worst expectations came true. In each instance, trouble had begun when the police had brutalized a brother or sister. In a larger sense, the younger blacks particularly were expressing their frustration. The consequences of these bitter uprisings would surely be more right-wing political reaction and a move to conservative politics throughout the nation. The eruption in Watts had come in 1965, and Ronald Reagan was elected governor in 1966. Now, with the cities rocked by riots again in 1967, the ruling circles would undoubtedly respond with more repressive controls. The California story would be repeated in other states and then on a national level. All that summer, we sought to prevent this chain of events. We organized, recruited, and worked hard at putting out our paper. We tried especially to be aware always of what was happening on the streets of the inner cities so that we could ride the crest of the movement by directing the people's energies in constructive ways. We particularly wanted people to understand their constitutional rights, rights that were constantly violated by police and authorities. With only an elementary knowledge of these rights, many of their problems could be avoided in tense situations. To impart that knowledge, we began a series of pieces in the earliest issues of our newspapers called Pocket Lawyer of Legal First Aid. Using law books and various legal pamphlets, I put together in, a sim in simple form a number of rules for people to follow. beginning of Pocket Lawyer of Legal First Aid. This pocket lawyer is provided as a means of keeping black people up to date on their rights. We are always the first to be arrested and the racist police forces are constantly trying to pretend that rights are extended equally to all people. Cut this out, brothers and sisters, and carry it with you. Until we arm ourselves to righteously take care of our own, the pocket lawyer is what's happening. 1. If you are stopped and or arrested by the police, you may remain silent. You do not have to answer any questions about alleged crimes. You should provide your name and address only if requested, although it is not absolutely clear that you must do so. But then do so, and at all times remember the Fifth Amendment. 2. If a police officer is not in uniform, ask him to show his identification. He has no authority over you unless he properly identifies himself. 
Beware of persons posing as police officers. Always get his badge number and his name. Three. Police have no right to search your car or your home unless they have a search warrant, probable cause, or your consent. They may conduct no exploratory search, that is, one for evidence of crime generally or for evidence of a crime unconnected with the one you are being questioned about. Thus, a stop for an auto violation does not give the right to search the auto. You are not required to consent to a search. Therefore, you should not consent and should state clearly and unequivocally that you do not consent in front of witnesses if possible. If you do not consent, the police will have the burden in court of showing probable cause. Arrest may be correlated later. 4. You may not resist forcibly or by going limp, even if you are innocent. To do so is a separate crime of which you can be convicted, even if you are acquitted of the original charge. Do not resist arrest under any circumstances. 5. If you are stopped and